Chapter Thirteen of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Three. June Sixteen. I have a few lines more to add to this day's entry before I go to bed tonight. About two hours after Sir Percival rose from the luncheon-table to receive his solicitor, Mr. Merriman, in the library, I left my room alone to take a walk in the plantations. Just as I was at the end of the landing, the library door opened, and the two gentlemen came out. Thinking it best not to disturb them by appearing on the stairs, I resolved to defer going down till they had crossed the hall. Although they spoke to each other in guarded tones, their words were pronounced with sufficient distinctness of utterance to reach my ears. "'Make your mind easy, Sir Percival,' I heard the lawyer say. "'It all rests with Lady Glyde.' I had turned to go back to my own room for a minute or two, but the sound of Laura's name on the lips of a stranger, stopped me instantly. I dare say it was very wrong and very discreditable to listen, but where is the woman in the whole range of our sex who can regulate her actions by the abstract principles of honour when those principles point one way and when her affections and the interests which grow out of them point the other? I listened, and under similar circumstances I would listen again, yes, with my ear at the keyhole, if I could not possibly manage it in any other way. You quite understand, Sir Percival, the lawyer went on. Lady Glyde is to sign her name in the presence of a witness, or of two witnesses, if you wish to be particularly careful and is then to put her finger on the seal and say, I deliver this as my act and deed. If that is done in a week's time, the arrangement will be perfectly successful, and the anxiety will be all over. If not, what do you mean by if not? asked Sir Percival angrily. If the thing must be done, it shall be done. I promise you that, Merriman. Uh, just so, Sir Percival, just so. But there are two alternatives in all transactions, and we lawyers like to look both of them in the face boldly. If, through any extraordinary circumstance, the arrangement should not be made, I think I may be able to get the parties to accept bills at three months. But how the money is to be raised when the bills fall due? Damn the bills! The money is only to be got in one way, and in that way, I tell you again, it shall be got. Take a glass of wine, Merriman, before you go. Much obliged, Sir Percival. I have not a moment to lose if I am to catch the up-train. You will let me know as soon as the arrangement is complete, and you will not forget the caution I recommended. Of course I won't. There's the dog-cart at the door for you. My groom will get you to the station in no time. Benjamin, drive like mad. Jump in. If Mr. Merriman misses the train, you lose your place. Hold fast, Merriman, and if you are upset, Trust to the devil to save his own. With that parting benediction, the baronet turned away and walked back to the library. I had not heard much, but the little that had reached my ears was enough to make me feel uneasy. The something that had happened was but too plainly a serious money embarrassment and Sir Percival's relief from it depended upon Laura. The prospect of seeing her involved in her husband's secret difficulties filled me with dismay, exaggerated, no doubt, 
by my ignorance of business and my subtle distrust of Sir Percival. Instead of going out, as I proposed, I went back immediately to Laura's room, to tell her what I had heard. She received my bad news so composedly as to surprise me. She evidently knows more of her husband's character and her husband's embarrassments than I have suspected up to this time. I feared as much, she said, when I heard of that strange gentleman who called and declined to leave his name. Who do you think the gentleman was, then? I asked. Some person who has heavy claims on Sir Percival, she answered, and who has been the cause of Mr. Merriman's visit here to-day. Do you know anything about those claims? No, I know no particulars. You will sign nothing, Laura, without first looking at it. Certainly not, Marion. Whatever I can harmlessly and honestly do to help him, I will do, for the sake of making your life and mine, love, as easy and as happy as possible. But I will do nothing ignorantly, which we might one day have reason to feel ashamed of. Let us say no more about it now. You have got your hat on. Suppose we go and dream away the afternoon in the grounds. On leaving the house, we directed our steps to the nearest shade. As we passed an open space among the trees in front of the house, there was Count Fosco, slowly walking backwards and forwards on the grass, sunning himself in the full blaze of the hot June afternoon. He had a broad straw hat on, with a violet-coloured ribbon round it, a blue blouse, with profuse white fancy-work over the bosom, covered his prodigious body, and was girt about the place where his waist might once have been, with a broad scarlet leather belt. Nankeen trousers, displaying more white fancy-work over the ankles, and purple Morocco slippers, adorned his lower extremities. He was singing Figaro's famous song in the Bob of Seville, with that crisply fluent vocalization which is never heard from any other than an Italian throat, accompanying himself on the concertina, which he played with ecstatic throwings up of his arms and graceful twistings and turnings of his head, like a fat Saint Cecilia masquerading in male attire. Figaro qua, Figaro la, Figaro so, Figaro ju, sang the count, jauntily tossing up the concertina at arm's length, and bowing to us on one side of the instrument, with the airy grace and elegance of Figaro himself, at twenty years of age. Take my word for it, Laura, that man knows something of Sir Percival's embarrassments, I said, as we returned the Count's salutation from a safe distance. What makes you think that? she asked. How should he have known otherwise that Mr. Merriman was Sir Percival's solicitor, I rejoined. Besides, when I followed you out of the luncheon-room, he told me, without a single word of inquiry on my part, that something had happened. Depend upon it, he knows more than we do. Don't ask him any questions if he does. Don't take him into our confidence. You seem to dislike him, Laura, in a very determined manner. What has he said or done to justify you? Nothing, Marian. On the contrary, he was all kindness and attention on our journey home, and he several times checked Sir Percival's outbreaks of temper in the most considerate manner towards me. Perhaps I dislike him because he has so much more power over my husband than I have. Perhaps it hurts my pride to be under any obligations to his interference. All I know is that I do dislike him. 
The rest of the day and evening passed quietly enough. The Count and I played at chess. For the first two games he politely allowed me to conquer him, and then, when he saw that I had found him out, begged my pardon, and at the third game checkmated me in ten minutes. Sir Percival never once referred all through the evening to the lawyer's visit, but either that event or something else had produced a singular alteration for the better in him. He was as polite and agreeable to all of us as he used to be in the days of his probation at Limeridge, and he was so amazingly attentive and kind to his wife that even icy Madame Fosco was roused into looking at him with a grave surprise. What does this mean? I think I can guess. I am afraid Laura can guess, and I am sure Count Fosco knows. I caught Sir Percival looking at him for approval more than once in the course of the evening. June 17th. A day of events. I most fervently hope I may not have to add a day of disasters as well. Sir Percival was as silent at breakfast as he had been the evening before on the subject of the mysterious arrangement, as the lawyer calls it, which is hanging over our heads. An hour afterwards, however, he suddenly entered the morning room where his wife and I were waiting with our hats on for Madame Fosco to join us, and inquired for the Count. "'We expect to see him here directly,' I said. "'The fact is,' Sir Percival went on, walking nervously about the room, "'I want Fosco and his wife in the library for a mere business formality, and I want you there, Laura, for a minute, too.' He stopped, and appeared to notice for the first time that we were in our walking costume. "'Have you just come in?' he asked. "'Or were you just going out?' "'We were all thinking of going to the lake this morning,' said Laura. "'But if you have any other arrangement to propose—' "'No, no,' he answered hastily. "'My arrangement can wait. "'After lunch will do as well for it as after breakfast. "'Or going to the lake, eh?' A good idea. Let's have an idle morning. I'll be one of the party. There was no mistaking his manner, even if it had been possible to mistake the uncharacteristic readiness which his words expressed to submit his own plans and projects to the convenience of others. He was evidently relieved at finding any excuse for delaying the business formality in the library to which his own words had referred. My heart sank within me as I drew the inevitable inference. The Count and his wife joined us at that moment. The lady had her husband's embroidered tobacco pouch and a store of paper in her hand for the manufacture of the eternal cigarettes. The gentleman dressed as usual in his blouse and straw hat, it carried the gay little pagoda cage with his darling white mice in it, and smiled on them and on us with a bland amiability which it was impossible to resist. Oh, with your kind permission, said the Count, I will take my small family here my poor little harmless pretty mousies, out for an airing along with us. There are dogs about the house, and shall I leave my forlorn white children at the mercies of the dogs? Ah, never! He chirruped paternally at his small white children through the bars of the pagoda, and we all left the house for the lake. In the plantation, a Sir Percival strayed away from us, it seems to be part of his restless disposition always to separate himself from his companions on these occasions, and always to occupy himself when he is alone 
in cutting new walking-sticks for his own use. The mere act of cutting and lopping at hazard appears to please him. He has filled the house with walking-sticks of his own making, not one of which he ever takes up for a second time. When they have been once used, his interest in them is all exhausted, and he thinks of nothing but going on and making more. At the old boat-house he joined us again. I will put down the conversation that ensued, when we were all settled in our places, exactly as it passed. It is an important conversation, so far as I am concerned, for it has seriously disposed me to distrust the influence which Count Fosco has exercised over my thoughts and feelings, and to resist it for the future as resolutely as I can. The boat-house was large enough to hold us all, but Sir Percival remained outside, trimming the last new stick with his pocket-axe. We three women found plenty of room on the large seat. Laura took her work, and Madame Fosco began her cigarette. I, as usual, had nothing to do. My hands always were, and always will be, as awkward as a man's. The Count good-humouredly took a stool many sizes too small for him, and balanced himself on it with his back against the side of the shed, which creaked and groaned under his weight. He put the pagoda cage on his lap, and let out the mice to crawl over him as usual. They are pretty, innocent-looking little creatures, but the sight of them creeping about a man's body is for some reason not pleasant to me. It excites a strange responsive creeping in my own nerves, and suggests hideous ideas of men dying in prison with the crawling creatures of the dungeon preying on them undisturbed. The morning was windy and cloudy, and the rapid alternations of shadow and sunlight over the waste of the lake made the view look doubly wild, weird, and gloomy. "'Some people call that picturesque,' said Sir Percival, pointing over the wide prospect with his half-finished walking-stick. I call it a blot on a gentleman's property. In my great-grandfather's time the lake flowed to this place. Look at it now. It is not four feet deep anywhere, and it is all puddles and pools. I wish I could afford to drain it and plant it all over. My bailiff, a superstitious idiot, says he is quite sure the lake has a curse on it, like the Dead Sea. <laughs> What do you think, Fosco? It looks just the place for a murder, doesn't it? My good Percival, remonstrated the Count, what is your solid English sense thinking of? The water is too shallow to hide the body, and there is sand everywhere to print off the murderer's footsteps. It is, upon the whole, the very worst place for a murder that I ever set my eyes on. Humbug, said Sir Percival, cutting away fiercely at his stick. You know what I mean. The dreary scenery, the lonely situation. If you choose to understand me, you can. If you don't choose, I'm not going to trouble myself to explain my meaning. And why not? asked the Count when your meaning can be explained by anybody in two words. If a fool was going to commit a murder, your lake is the first place he would choose for it. If a wise man was going to commit a murder, your lake is the last place he would choose for it. Is that your meaning? If it is, there is your explanation for you ready-made. Take it, Percival, with your good Fosco's blessing. 
Laura looked at the Count, with her dislike for him, appearing a little too plainly in her face. He was so busy with his mice that he did not notice her. "'I am sorry to hear the lake view connected with anything so horrible as the idea of murder,' she said. "'And if Count Fosco must divide murderers into classes, I think he has been very unfortunate in his choice of expressions. To describe them as fools only seems like treating them with an indulgence to which they have no claim. And to describe them as wise men sounds to me like a downright contradiction in terms. I have always heard that truly wise men are truly good men, and have a horror of crime. My dear lady, said the Count, these are admirable sentiments and I have seen them stated at the tops of copy-books. He lifted one of the white mice in the palm of his hand, and spoke to it in his whimsical way. My pretty little smooth white rascal, he said, here is a moral lesson for you. A truly wise mouse is a truly good mouse. Mention that, if you please, to your companions, and never gnaw at the bars of your cage again, as long as you live. It is easy to turn everything into ridicule, said Laura resolutely, but you will not find it quite so easy, Count Fosco, to give me an instance of a wise man who has been a great criminal. The Count shrugged his huge shoulders, and smiled on Laura in the friendliest manner. Most true, he said. The fool's crime is the crime that is found out, and the wise man's crime is the crime that is not found out. If I could give you an instance, it would not be the instance of a wise man. Dear Lady Clyde, your sound English common sense has been too much for me. It is checkmate for me this time, Miss Harkham, ha? Huh? Stand to your guns, Laura, sneered Sir Percival, who had been listening in his place at the door. Tell him next that crimes cause their own detection. There's another bit of copy-book morality for you, Fosco. Crimes cause their own detection. What infernal humbug! I believe it to be true, said Laura quietly. Sir Percival burst out laughing, so violently, so outrageously, that he quite startled us all. The Count more than any of us. I believe it too. I said, coming to Laura's rescue. Sir Percival, who had been unaccountably amused at his wife's remark, was just as unaccountably irritated by mine. He struck the new stick savagely on the sand, and walked away from us. Poor dear Percival, cried Count Fosco, looking after him gaily. He is the victim of English spleen. But, my dear Miss Harkham, my dear Lady Clyde, do you really believe that crimes cause their own detection? And you, my angel, he continued, turning to his wife, who had not uttered a word yet, do you think so too? I wait to be instructed, replied the Countess, in tones of freezing reproof, intended for Laura and me before I venture on giving my opinion in the presence of well-informed men. "'Do you indeed?' I said. "'I remember the time, Countess, when you advocated the rights of women, and freedom of female opinion was one of them.' "'What is your view of the subject, Count?' asked Madame Fosco, calmly proceeding with her cigarettes, and not taking the least notice of me. 
the count stroked one of his white mice reflectively with his chubby little finger before he answered it is truly wonderful he said how easily society can console itself for the worst of its shortcomings with a little bit of claptrap the machinery it has set up for the detection of crime is miserably ineffective and yet only invent a moral epigram saying that it works well and you blind everybody to its blunders from that moment crimes cause their own detection do they and murder will out another moral epigram will it ask coroners who sit at inquests in large towns if that is true lady glyde ask secretaries of life assurance companies if that is true miss halcombe read your own public journals in the few cases that get into the newspapers are there not instances of slain bodies found and no murderers ever discovered multiply the cases that are reported by the cases that are not reported and the bodies that are found by the bodies that are not found and what conclusion do you come to this that there are foolish criminals who are discovered and wise criminals who escape the hiding of a crime or the detection of a crime what is it a trial of skill between the police on one side and the individual on the other when the criminal is a brutal ignorant fool the police in nine cases out of ten win when the criminal is a resolute educated highly intelligent man the police in nine cases out of ten lose if the police win you generally hear all about it if the police lose you generally hear nothing and on this tottering foundation you build up your comfortable moral maxim that crime causes its own detection yes all the crime you know of and what of the rest devilish true and very well put cried a voice at the entrance of the boathouse sir percival had recovered his equanimity and had come back while we were listening to the count some of it may be true i said and all of it may be very well put but i don't see why count fosco should celebrate the victory of the criminal over society with so much exultation or why you sir percival should applaud him so loudly for doing it do you hear that fosco asked sir percival take my advice and make your peace with your audience tell them virtue's a fine thing they like that i can promise you the count laughed inwardly and silently and two of the white mice in his waistcoat alarmed by the internal convulsion going on beneath them darted out in a violent hurry and scrambled into their cage again the ladies my good percival shall tell me about virtue he said they are better authorities than i am for they know what virtue is and i don't you hear him said sir percival isn't it awful it is true said the count quietly i am a citizen of the world and i have met in my time with so many different sorts of virtue that i am puzzled in my old age to say which is the right sort and which is the wrong here in england there is one virtue and there in china there is another virtue and john englishman says my virtue is the genuine virtue and john chinaman says my virtue is the genuine virtue and i say yes to one or no to the other 
and am just as much bewildered about it in the case of John with the top boots as I am in the case of John with the pigtail. <laughs> oh, nice little mousy, come kiss me. What is your own private notion of a virtuous man, my pretty, pretty, pretty? A man who keeps you warm and gives you plenty to eat and a good notion too for it is intelligible at the least stay a minute count i interposed accepting your illustration surely we have one unquestionable virtue in england which is wanting in china the chinese authorities kill thousands of innocent people on the most frivolous pretexts we in england are free from all guilt of that kind. We commit no such dreadful crime. We abhor reckless bloodshed with all our hearts. Quite right, Marian, said Laura. Well thought of, and well expressed. Pray, allow the Count to proceed, said Madame Fosco with stern civility. You will find, young ladies, that he never speaks, without having excellent reasons for all that he says. "'Thank you, my angel,' replied the Count. "'Have a bonbon.' He took out of his pocket a pretty little inlaid box and placed it open on the table. "'Chocolat à la vanille,' cried the impenetrable man, cheerfully rattling the sweetmeats in the box and bowing all round, offered by Fosco as an act of homage to the charming society. Be good enough to go on, Count, said his wife, with a spiteful reference to myself. Oblige me by answering Miss Halcombe. Miss Halcombe is unanswerable, replied the polite Italian. That is to say, so far as she goes, yes i agree with her john bull does abhor the crimes of john chinaman he is the quickest old gentleman at finding out faults that are his neighbours and the slowest old gentleman at finding out the faults that are his own who exists on the face of creation is he so very much better in this way than the people whom he condemns in their way uh, english society miss harcum is as often the accomplice as it is the enemy of crime yes yes crime is in this country what crime is in other countries a good friend to a man and to those about him as often as it is an enemy. A great rascal provides for his wife and family. The worse he is, the more he makes them the objects for your sympathy. He often provides also for himself. A profligate spendthrift, who is always borrowing money, will get more from his friends than the rigidly honest man, who only borrows of them once under pressure of the direst one. In the one case, the friends will not be at all surprised, and they will give. In the other case, they will be very much surprised, and they will hesitate. Is the prison that Mr. Scoundrel lives in at the end of his career a more uncomfortable place than the workhouse that Mr. Honesty lives in? at the end of his career when john howard philanthropist wants to relieve misery he goes to find it in prisons where crime is wretched not in huts and hovels where virtue is wretched too who is the english poet who has won the most universal sympathy who makes the easiest of all subjects for pathetic writing and pathetic painting, 
that nice young person who began life with a forgery and ended it by a suicide your dear romantic interesting chatterton which gets on best do you think of two poor starving dressmakers the woman who resists temptation and is honest or the woman who falls under temptation and steals you all know that the stealing is the making of that second woman's fortune it advertises her from length to breadth of good-humoured charitable england and she is relieved as the breaker of a commandment when she would have been left to starve as the keeper of it come here my jolly little mouse hey parasto pass i transform you for the time being into a respectable lady stop there in the palm of my great big hand my dear and listen you marry the poor man whom you love mouse and one half your friends pity and the other half blame you and now on the contrary you sell yourself for gold to a man you don't care for and all your friends rejoice over you and a minister of public worship sanctions the base horror of the vilest of all human bargains and smiles and smirks afterwards at your table if you are polite enough to ask him to breakfast hey presto pass be a mouse again and squeak if you continue to be a lady much longer i shall have you telling me that society abhors crime and then mouse i shall doubt if your own eyes and ears are really of any use to you ah i am a bad man lady glyde am i not i say what other people only think and when all the rest of the world is in a conspiracy to accept the mask for the true face mine is the rash hand that tears off the plump pasteboard and shows the bare bones beneath i will get up on my big elephant's legs before i do myself any more harm in your amiable estimations i will get up and take a little airy walk of my own dear ladies as your excellent sheridan said i go and leave my character behind me he got up put the cage on the table and paused for a moment to count the mice in it one two three four ah he cried with a look of horror where in the name of heaven is the fifth the youngest the whitest the most amiable of all my benjamin of mice neither laura nor i were in any favourable disposition to be amused the count's glib cynicism had revealed a new aspect of his nature from which we both recoiled but it was impossible to resist the comical distress of so very large a man at the loss of so very small a mouse we laughed in spite of ourselves and when madame fosca rose to set the example of leaving the boat-house empty so that her husband might search it to its remotest corners we rose also to follow her out before we had taken three steps the count's quick eye discovered the lost mouse under the seat that we had been occupying he pulled aside the bench took the little animal up in his hand and then suddenly stopped on his knees looking intently at a particular place on the ground just beneath him when he rose to his feet again, his hand shook so that he could hardly put the mouse back in the cage, and his face was of a faint, livid yellow hue all over. Percival, he said in a whisper, Percival, come here. Sir Percival had paid no attention to any of us for the last ten minutes. He had been entirely absorbed in writing figures on the sand, and then rubbing them out again with the point of his stick. 
"'What's the matter now?' he asked, lounging carelessly into the boathouse. "'Do you see nothing there?' said the Count, catching him nervously by the collar with one hand, and pointing with the other to the place near which he had found the mouse. "'I see plenty of dry sand,' answered Sir Percival, "'and a spot of dirt in the middle of it.' "'Not to dirt,' whispered the Count, fastening the other hand suddenly on Sir Percival's collar, and shaking it in his agitation. Blood! Laura was near enough to hear the last word, softly as he whispered it. She turned to me with a look of terror. Nonsense, my dear, I said. There is no need to be alarmed. It is only the blood of a poor little stray dog. Everybody was astonished and everybody's eyes were fixed on me inquiringly. "'How do you know that?' asked Sir Percival, speaking first. "'I found the dog here dying, on the day when you all returned from abroad,' I replied. "'The poor creature had strayed into the plantation, and had been shot by your keeper.' "'Whose dog was it?' inquired Sir Percival. "'Not one of mine.' "'Did you try to save the poor thing?' asked Laura earnestly. Surely you tried to save it, Marion? Yes, I said. The housekeeper and I both did our best, but the dog was mortally wounded, and he died under our hands. Whose dog was it? persisted Sir Percival, repeating his question a little irritably. One of mine? No, not one of yours. Whose, then? Did the housekeeper know? The housekeeper's report of Mrs. Catherick's desire to conceal her visit to Blackwater Park from Sir Percival's knowledge recurred to my memory the moment he put that last question, and I half doubted the discretion of answering it. But in my anxiety to quiet the general alarm, I had thoughtlessly advanced too far to draw back, except at the risk of exciting suspicion, which might only make matters worse. There was nothing for it but to answer at once, without reference to results. Yes, I said, the housekeeper knew. She told me it was Mrs. Catherick's dog. Sir Percival had hitherto remained at the inner end of the boathouse with Count Fosco, while I spoke to him from the door. But the instant Mrs. Catherick's name passed my lips, he pushed by the count roughly, and placed himself face to face with me, under the open daylight. "'How came the housekeeper to know it was Mrs. Catherick's dog?' he asked, fixing his eyes on mine, with a frowning interest and attention, which half angered, half startled me. "'She knew it,' I said quietly, "'because Mrs. Catherick brought the dog with her. "'Brought it with her? Where did she bring it with her? To the house. What the devil did Mrs. Catherick want at this house?' The manner in which he put the question was even more offensive than the language in which he expressed it. I marked my sense of his want of common politeness by silently turning away from him. Just as I moved, the Count's persuasive hand was laid on his shoulder, and the Count's mellifluous voice interposed to quiet him. My dear Percival, gently, gently. Sir Percival looked round in his angriest manner. The Count only smiled, and repeated the soothing application. Gently, my good friend, gently. Sir Percival hesitated, followed me a few steps, and, to my great surprise, offered me an apology. I beg your pardon, Miss Halcombe, he said. I have been out of order lately, and I am afraid I am a little irritable. But I should like to know what Mrs. Catherick could possibly want here. When did she come? Was the housekeeper the only person who saw her? The only person, I answered, so far as I know. 
the Count interposed again. "'In that case why not question the housekeeper?' he said. "'Why not go, Percival, to the fountainhead of information at once?' "'Quite right,' said Sir Percival. "'Of course the housekeeper is the first person to question. "'Excessively stupid of me not to see it myself.' "'With those words he instantly left us to return to the house.' The motive of the Count's interference, which had puzzled me at first, betrayed itself when Sir Percival's back was turned. He had a host of questions to put to me about Mrs. Catherick, and the cause of her visit to Blackwater Park, which he could scarcely have asked in his friend's presence. I made my answers as short as I civilly could for I had already determined to check the least approach to any exchanging of confidences between Count Fosco and myself. Laura, however, unconsciously helped him to extract all my information by making inquiries herself, which left me no alternative but to reply to her, or to appear in the very unenviable and very false character of a depository of Sir Percival's secrets. The end of it was that, in about ten minutes' time, the Count knew as much as I know of Mrs. Catherick, and of the events which have so strangely connected us with her daughter Anne, from the time when Hartwright met with her to this day. The effect of my information on him was, in one respect, curious enough intimately as he knows Sir Percival, and closely as he appears to be associated with Sir Percival's private affairs in general, he is certainly as far as I am from knowing anything of the true story of Anne Catherick. The unsolved mystery in connection with this unhappy woman is now rendered doubly suspicious in my eyes by the absolute conviction which I feel that the clue to it has been hidden by Sir Percival from the most intimate friend he has in the world. It was impossible to mistake the eager curiosity of the Count's look and manner while he drank in greedily every word that fell from my lips. There are many kinds of curiosity, I know, but there is no misinterpreting the curiosity of blank surprise. If I ever saw it in my life, I saw it in the Count's face. While the questions and answers were going on, we had all been strolling quietly back through the plantation. As soon as we reached the house, the first object that we saw in front of it was Sir Percival's dog-cart, with the horse put to, and the groom waiting by it in his stable jacket. If these unexpected appearances were to be trusted, the examination of the housekeeper had produced important results already. "'A fine horse, my friend,' said the Count, addressing the groom with the most engaging familiarity of manner. "'You are going to drive out.' "'I am not going, sir,' replied the man, looking at his stable jacket, and evidently wondering whether the foreign gentleman took it for his livery. My master drives himself. Aha! Uh -huh, said the Count. Does he indeed? I wonder he gives himself the trouble when he has got you to drive for him. Is he going to fatigue that nice, shining, pretty horse by taking him very far to-day? I don't know, sir, answered the man. The horse is a mare, if you please, sir. She's the highest courage thing we've got in the stables. Her name's Brown Molly, sir, and she'll go till she drops. Sir Percival usually takes Isaac of York for the short distances. And your shining courage as Brown Molly for the long. Logical inference, Miss Halcombe, continued the Count, wheeling round briskly and addressing me. Sir Percival is going a long distance to-day. I made no reply. I had my own inferences to draw from what I knew through the housekeeper, 
and from what I saw before me, and I did not choose to share them with Count Fosco. When Sir Percival was in Cumberland, I thought to myself, he walked away a long distance on Anne's account, to question the family at Todd's Corner. Now he is in Hampshire, is he going to drive away a long distance on Anne's account again, to question Mrs. Catherick at Wilmingham? We all entered the house, as we crossed the hall, Sir Percival came out from the library to meet us. He looked hurried and pale and anxious, but for all that he was in his most polite mood when he spoke to us. "'I am sorry to say I am obliged to leave you,' he began, a long drive, a matter that I can't very well put off. I shall be back in good time to-morrow, but before I go I should like that little business formality which I spoke of this morning to be settled.' "'Laura, will you come into the library? "'It won't take a minute, a mere formality. A "'Countess, may I trouble you also? "'I want you and the Countess, Fosco, "'to be witnesses to a signature, nothing more. "'Come in at once and get it over.' "'He held the library door open until they had passed in, "'followed them, and shut it softly. "'I remained for a moment afterward, "'standing alone in the hall, with my heart beating fast, and my mind misgiving me sadly. Then I went on to the staircase, and ascended slowly to my own room. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 4. June 17th. Just as my hand was on the door of my room, I heard Sir Percival's voice calling to me from below. "'I must beg you to come downstairs again,' he said. "'It is Fosco's fault, Miss Harkham, not mine. "'He has started some nonsensical objection "'to his wife being one of the witnesses, "'and has obliged me to ask you to join us in the library.' "'I entered the room immediately with Sir Percival. "'Laura was waiting by the writing-table, "'twisting and turning,' her garden hat uneasily in her hands. Madame Fosco sat near her in an armchair, imperturbably admiring her husband, who stood by himself at the other end of the library, picking off the dead leaves from the flowers in the window. The moment I appeared, the Count advanced to meet me and to offer his explanations. A thousand pardons, Miss Harkham, he said. You know the character which is given to my countrymen by the English. We Italians are all wily and suspicious by nature in the estimation of the good John Bull. Set me down, if you please, as being no better than the rest of my race. I am a wily Italian, and a suspicious Italian. You have thought so yourself, dear lady, have you not? Well, it is part of my wiliness, and part of my suspicion, to object to Madame Fosco being a witness to Lady Glyde's signature, when I am also a witness myself. There is not the shadow of a reason for his objection, interposed Sir Percival. I have explained to him that the law of England allows Madame Fosco to witness a signature as well as her husband. I admit it, resumed the Count. The law of England says yes. But the conscience of Fosco says no. He spread out his fat fingers on the bosom of his blouse and bowed solemnly, 
as if he wished to introduce his conscience to us all in the character of an illustrious addition to the society. What this document which Lady Glyde is about to sign may be, he continued, I neither know nor desire to know. I only say this. Circumstances may happen in the future which may oblige Percival or his representatives to appeal to the two witnesses, in which case it is certainly desirable that those witnesses should represent two opinions which are perfectly independent the one of the other. This cannot be, if my wife signs as well as myself, because we have but one opinion between us, and that opinion is mine. I will not have it cast in my teeth at some future day that Madame Fosco acted under my coercion and was, in plain fact, no witness at all. I speak in Percival's interest when I propose that my name shall appear as the nearest friend of the husband and your name, Miss Halcombe as the nearest friend of the wife. I am a Jesuit, if you please to think so, a splitter of straws, a man of trifles and crotchets and scruples. But you will humour me, I hope, in merciful consideration for my suspicious Italian character and my uneasy Italian conscience. He bowed again, stepped back a few paces, and withdrew his conscience from our society as politely as he had introduced it. The Count's scruples might have been honourable and reasonable enough, but there was something in his manner of expressing them which increased my unwillingness to be concerned in the business of the signature. No consideration of less importance than my consideration for Laura, would have induced me to consent to be a witness at all. One look, however, at her anxious face decided me to risk anything rather than desert her. I will readily remain in the room, I said, and if I find no reason for starting any small scruples on my side, you may rely on me as a witness. Sir Percival looked at me sharply, as if he was about to say something. But at the same moment, Madame Fosco attracted his attention by rising from her chair. She had caught her husband's eye, and had evidently received her orders to leave the room. "'You needn't go,' said Sir Percival. Madame Fosco looked for her orders again, got them again said she would prefer leaving us to our business, and resolutely walked out. The Count lit a cigarette, went back to the flowers in the window, and puffed little jets of smoke at the leaves, in a state of the deepest anxiety about killing the insects. Meanwhile, Sir Percival unlocked a cupboard beneath one of the bookcases, and produced from it a piece of parchment folded longwise many times over. He placed it on the table, opened the last fold only, and kept his hand on the rest. The last fold displayed a strip of blank parchment with little wafer stuck on it at certain places. Every line of the writing was hidden in the part which he still held folded up under his hand. Laura and I looked at each other. Her face was pale, but it showed no indecision and no fear. Sir Percival dipped a pen in ink and handed it to his wife. "'Sign your name there,' he said, pointing to the place. You and Fosco are to sign afterwards, Miss Halcombe, opposite those two wafers. Come here, Fosco. 
witnessing a signature is not to be done by mooning out of window and smoking into the flowers. The Count threw away his cigarette and joined us at the table with his hands carelessly thrust into the scarlet belt of his blouse and his eyes steadily fixed on Sir Percival's face. Laura, who was on the other side of her husband with the pen in her hand, looked at him too. He stood between them, holding the folded parchment down firmly on the table and glancing across at me as I sat opposite to him, with such a sinister mixture of suspicion and embarrassment on his face that he looked more like a prisoner at the bar than a gentleman in his own house. Sign there, he repeated, turning suddenly on Laura and pointing once more to the place on the parchment. What is it I am to sign? she asked quietly. I have no time to explain, he answered. The dog-cart is at the door, and I must go directly. Besides, if I had time, you wouldn't understand. It is a purely formal document, full of legal technicalities and all that sort of thing. Oh, come, come, sign your name, and let us have done as soon as possible. I ought surely to know what I am signing, Sir Percival, before I write my name. Nonsense! What have women to do with business? I tell you again, you can't understand it. At any rate, let me try to understand it. Whenever Mr. Gilmore had any business for me to do, he always explained it first, and I always understood him. I dare say he did. He was your servant, and was obliged to explain. I am your husband, and am not obliged. How much longer do you mean to keep me here? I tell you again, there is no time for reading anything. The dog-cart is waiting at the door. Once for all, will you sign or will you not? She still had the pen in her hand, but she made no approach to signing her name with it. If my signature pledges me to anything, she said, surely I have some claim to know what that pledge is. He lifted up the parchment and struck it angrily on the table. Speak up, he said. You are always famous for telling the truth. Never mind, Miss Halcombe, never mind, Bosco. Say, in plain terms, you distrust me. The Count took one of his hands out of his belt and laid it on Sir Percival's shoulder. Sir Percival shook it off irritably. The Count put it on again, with unruffled composure. "'Control your unfortunate temper, Percival,' he said. "'Lady Glyde is right.' "'Right!' cried Sir Percival. "'A wife right in distrusting her husband!' "'It is unjust and cruel to accuse me of distrusting you,' said Laura. Ask Marion if I am not just by in wanting to know what this writing requires of me before I sign it. I won't have any appeals made to Miss Halcombe, retorted Sir Percival. Miss Halcombe has nothing to do with the matter. I had not spoken hitherto, and I would much rather not have spoken now but the expression of distress in Laura's face when she turned it towards me, and the insolent injustice of her husband's conduct, left me no other alternative than to give my opinion for her sake as soon as I was asked for it. "'Excuse me, Sir Percival,' I said, "'but as one of the witnesses to the signature, I venture to think that I have.' something to do with the matter. Laura's objection seems to me a perfectly fair one, and, speaking for myself only, I cannot assume the responsibility of witnessing her signature, unless she first understands what the writing is, 
which you wish her to sign a cruel declaration upon my soul cried sir percival the next time you invite yourself to a man's house miss halcombe i recommend you not to repay his hospitality by taking his wife's side against him in a matter that doesn't concern you i started to my feet as suddenly as if he had struck me if i had been a man i would have knocked him down on the threshold of his own door and have left his house never on any earthly consideration to enter it again but i was only a woman and i loved his wife so dearly thank god that faithful love helped me and i sat down again without saying a word she knew what i had suffered and what i had suppressed she ran round to me with the tears streaming from her eyes oh marion she whispered softly if my mother had been alive she could have done no more for me come back and sign cried sir percival from the other side of the table shall i she asked in my ear i will if you tell me no i answered the right and the truth are with you sign nothing unless you have read it first come back and sign he reiterated in his loudest and angriest tones the count who had watched laura and me with a close and silent attention interposed for the second time percival he said i remember that i am in the presence of ladies be good enough if you please to remember it too sir percival turned on him speechless with passion the count's firm hand slowly tightened its grasp on his shoulder and the count's steady voice quietly repeated be good enough if you please to remember it too they both looked at each other sir percival slowly drew his shoulder from under the count's hand slowly turned his face away from the count's eyes doggedly looked down for a little while at the parchment on the table and then spoke with the sullen submission of a tamed animal rather than the becoming resignation of a convinced man i don't want to offend anybody he said but my wife's obstinacy is enough to try the patience of a saint i have told her this is merely a formal document and what more can she want you may say what you please but it is no part of a woman's duty to set her husband at defiance once more lady glide and for the last time will you sign or will you not laura returned to his side of the table and took up the pen again i will sign with pleasure she said if you will only treat me as a responsible being i care little what sacrifice is required of me if it will affect no one else and lead to no ill result who talked of a sacrifice being required of you he broke in with a half-suppressed return of his former violence i only meant she resumed that i would refuse no concession which i could honourably make if i have a scruple about signing my name to an engagement of which i know nothing why should you visit it on me so severely it is rather hard i think to treat count fosco's scruples so much more indulgently than you have treated mine this unfortunate yet most natural reference to the count's extraordinary power over her husband indirect as it was it sets a possible smouldering temper on fire again in an instant scruples he repeated 
your scruples. Oh, it is rather late in the day for you to be scrupulous. I should have thought you had got over all weakness of that sort when you made a virtue of necessity by marrying me. The instant he spoke those words, Laura threw down the pen, looked at him with an expression in her eyes which, throughout all my experience of her, I had never seen in them before, and turned her back on him in dead silence. This strong expression of the most open and the most bitter contempt was so entirely unlike herself, so utterly out of her character, that it silenced us all. There was something hidden beyond a doubt under the mere surface brutality of the words which her husband had just addressed to her. There was some lurking insult beneath them, of which I was wholly ignorant, but which had left the mark of its profanation so plainly on her face that even a stranger might have seen it. The Count, who was no stranger, saw it as distinctly as I did, when I left my chair to join Laura, I heard him whisper under his breath to Sir Percival, You idiot! Laura walked before me to the door as I advanced, and at the same time her husband spoke to her once more. You positively refuse, then, to give me your signature, he said in the altered tone of a man who was conscious that he had let his own license of language seriously injure him. After what you have just said to me, she replied firmly, I refuse my signature until I have read every line in that parchment from the first word to the last. Come away, Marion. We have remained here long enough. One moment, interposed the Count, before Sir Percival could speak again. One moment, Lady Glyde, I implore you. Laura would have left the room without noticing him, but I stopped her. Don't make an enemy of the Count, I whispered. Whatever you do, don't make an enemy of the Count. She yielded to me. I closed the door again, and we stood near it, waiting. Sir Percival sat down at the table, with his elbow on the folded parchment, and his head resting on his clenched fist. The Count stood between us. Master of the dreadful position in which we were placed, as he was master of everything else. Lady Glyde, he said, with a gentleness which seemed to address itself to our forlorn situation instead of to ourselves. Pray pardon me if I venture to offer one suggestion, and pray believe that I speak out of my profound respect and my friendly regard for the mistress of this house. He turned sharply towards Sir Percival. Is it absolutely necessary, he asked, that this thing here under your elbow should be signed to-day? It is necessary to my plans and wishes, returned the other sulkily, but that consideration, as you may have noticed, has no influence with Lady Glyde. Answer my plain question plainly. Can the business of the signature be put off till tomorrow? Yes or no? Yes, if you will have it so. Then what are you wasting your time for here? Let the signature wait till tomorrow. Let it wait till you come back. Sir Percival looked up with a frown and an oath. You are taking a tone with me. That I don't like, he said. A tone I won't bear from any man. I am advising you for your good, returned the Count, with a smile of quiet contempt. 
give yourself time give lady glide time have you forgotten that your dog cart is waiting at the door oh my tone surprises you ha huh? i dare say it does it is the tone of a man who can keep his temper how many doses of good advice have i given you in my time more than you can count have i ever been wrong i defy you to quote me an instance of it go take your drive the matter of the signature can wait till to-morrow let it wait and renew it when you come back sir percival hesitated and looked at his watch his anxiety about the secret journey which he was to take that day revived by the count's words was now evidently disputing possession of his mind with his anxiety to obtain laura's signature he considered for a little while and then got up from his chair it is easy to argue me down he said when i have no time to answer you i will take your advice bosco not because i want it or believe in it but because i can't stop here any longer he paused and looked round darkly at his wife if you don't give me a signature when i come back to-morrow the rest was lost in the noise of his opening the bookcase cupboard again and locking up the parchment once more he took his hat and gloves off the table and made for the door laura and i drew back to let him pass remember to-morrow he said to his wife and went out we waited to give him time to cross the hall and drive away the count approached us while we were standing near the door you have just seen percival at his worst miss halcombe he said as his old friend i am sorry for him and ashamed of him as his old friend i promise you that he shall not break out to-morrow in the same disgraceful manner in which he has broken out to-day laura had taken my arm while he was speaking and she pressed it significantly when he had done it would have been a hard trial to any woman to stand by and see the office of apologist for her husband's misconduct quietly assumed by his male friend in her own house and it was a trial to her i thanked the count civilly and let her out yes i thanked him for i felt already with a sense of inexpressible helplessness and humiliation that it was either his interest or his caprice to make sure of my continuing to reside at blackwater park and i knew after sir percival's conduct to me that without the support of the count's influence i could not hope to remain there his influence the influence of all others that i dreaded most was actually the one tie which now held me to laura in the hour of her utmost need we heard the wheels of the dog-cart crashing on the gravel of the drive as we came into the hall sir percival had started on his journey where is he going to marion laura whispered every fresh thing he does seems to terrify me about the future have you any suspicions after what she had undergone that morning I was unwilling to tell her my suspicions. How should I know his secrets? I said evasively. I wonder if the housekeeper knows, she persisted. Certainly not, I replied. She must be quite as ignorant as we are. Laura shook her head doubtfully. Did you not hear from the housekeeper? that there was a report of Anne Catherick having been seen in this neighbourhood. Don't you think he may have gone away to look for her? I would rather compose myself, Laura, by not thinking about it at all. And after what has happened, you had better follow my example. Come into my room, 
and rest and quiet yourself a little. We sat down together close to the window, and let the fragrant summer air breathe over our faces. I am ashamed to look at you, Marion, she said, after what you submitted to downstairs for my sake. Oh, my own love, I am almost heartbroken when I think of it, but I will try to make it up to you. I will indeed. Hush, hush, I replied. Don't talk so. What is the trifling mortification of my pride compared to the dreadful sacrifice of your happiness? You heard what he said to me, she went on quickly and vehemently. You heard the words, but you don't know what they meant. You don't know why I threw down the pen and turned my back on him. She rose in sudden agitation and walked about the room. I have kept many things from your knowledge, Marian, for fear of distressing you and making you unhappy at the outset of our new lives. You don't know how he has used me, and yet you ought to know, for you saw how he used me today. You heard him sneer at my presuming to be scrupulous. You heard him say I had made a virtue of necessity in marrying him. She sat down again, her face flushed deeply and her hands twisted and twisted together in her lap. "'I can't tell you about it now,' she said. "'I shall burst out crying if I tell you now. "'Later, Marian, when I am more sure of myself. "'My poor head aches, darling, aches, aches, aches. "'Where is your smelling bottle? "'Let me talk to you about yourself. "'I wish I had given him my signature for your sake. "'Shall I give it to him tomorrow?' I would rather compromise myself than compromise you. After your taking my part against him, he will lay all the blame on you if I refuse again. Oh, what shall we do? Oh, for a friend to help us and advise us, a friend we could really trust. She sighed bitterly. I saw in her face that she was thinking of Hartwright. Saw it the more plainly, because her last word set me thinking of him too. In six months only from her marriage, we wanted the faithful service he had offered to us in his farewell words. How little I once thought that we should ever want it at all. We must do what we can to help ourselves, I said. Let us try to talk it over calmly, Laura. Let us do all in our power to decide for the best. Putting what she knew of her husband's embarrassments and what I had heard of his conversation with the lawyer together, we arrived necessarily at the conclusion that the parchment in the library had been drawn up for the purpose of borrowing money and that Laura's signature was absolutely necessary to fit it for the attainment of Sir Percival's object. The second question, concerning the nature of the legal contract by which the money was to be obtained, and the degree of personal responsibility to which Laura might subject herself if she signed it in the dark, involved considerations which lay far beyond any knowledge and experience that either of us possessed. My own convictions led me to believe that the hidden contents of the parchment concealed a transaction of the meanest and the most fraudulent kind. I had not formed this conclusion in consequence of Sir Percival's refusal to show the writing or to explain it, for that refusal might well have proceeded from his obstinate disposition and his domineering temper alone. My sole motive for distrusting his honesty, sprang from the change which I had observed in his language and his manners at Blackwater Park, a change which convinced me that he had been acting a part throughout the whole period of his probation at Limeridge House. His elaborate delicacy, his ceremonious politeness, which harmonised so agreeably with Mr. Gilmore's old-fashioned notions, his modesty with Laura, his candour with me, 
his moderation with Mr. Fairley. All these were the artifices of a mean, cunning, and brutal man who had dropped his disguise when his practised duplicity had gained its end, and had openly shown himself in the library on that very day. I say nothing of the grief which this discovery caused me on Laura's account, for it is not to be expressed by any words of mine. I only refer to it at all, because it decided me to oppose her signing the parchment, whatever the consequences might be, unless she was first made acquainted with the contents. Under these circumstances, the one chance for us when to-morrow came was to be provided with an objection to giving the signature, which might rest on sufficiently firm commercial or legal grounds to shake Sir Percival's resolution, and to make him suspect that we two women understood the laws and obligations of business as well as himself. After some pondering, I determined to write to the only honest man within reach, whom we could trust to help us discreetly in our forlorn situation. That man was Mr. Gilmore's partner, Mr. Curl, who conducted the business now that our old friend had been obliged to withdraw from it, and to leave London on account of his health. I explained to Laura that I had Mr. Gilmore's own authority for placing implicit confidence in his partner's integrity, discretion, and accurate knowledge of all her affairs, and with her full approval I sat down at once to write the letter. I began by stating our position to Mr. Curl exactly as it was, and then asked for his advice in return, expressed in plain, downright terms which he could comprehend without any danger of misinterpretations and mistakes. My letter was as short as I could possibly make it, and was, I hope, unencumbered by needless apologies and needless details. Just as I was about to put the address on the envelope, an obstacle was discovered by Laura, which, in the effort and preoccupation of writing, had escaped my mind altogether. "'How are we to get the answer in time?' she asked. "'Your letter will not be delivered in London before to-morrow morning, "'and the post will not bring the reply here till the morning after.' "'The only way of overcoming this difficulty "'was to have the answer brought to us from the lawyer's office "'by a special messenger. "'I wrote a postscript to that effect, "'begging that the messenger might be dispatched with the reply.' by the eleven o'clock morning train, which would bring him to our station at twenty minutes past one, and so enable him to reach Blackwater Park by two o'clock at the latest. He was to be directed to ask for me, to answer no questions addressed to him by anyone else, and to deliver his letter into no hands but mine. In case Sir Percival should come back tomorrow before two o'clock, I said to Laura, the wisest plan for you to adopt is to be out in the grounds all the morning with your book or your work, and not to appear at the house till the messenger has had time to arrive with the letter. I will wait here for him all the morning to guard against any misadventures or mistakes. By following this arrangement, I hope and believe we shall avoid being taken by surprise. Let us go down to the drawing-room now. We may excite suspicion if we remain shut up together too long. Suspicion, she repeated. Whose suspicion can we excite, now that Sir Percival has left the house? Do you mean Count Fosco? Perhaps I do, Laura. You are beginning to dislike him as much as I do, Marian. No, not to dislike him. Dislike is always more or less associated with contempt. I can see nothing in the Count to despise. You are not afraid of him, are you? Perhaps I am. A little. 
afraid of him, after his interference in our favour today? Yes, I am more afraid of his interference than I am of Sir Percival's violence. Remember what I said to you in the library. Whatever you do, Laura, don't make an enemy of the Count. We went downstairs. Laura entered the drawing-room while I proceeded across the hall with my letter in my hand to put it into the post-bag which hung against the wall opposite to me. The house-door was open, and as I crossed past it I saw Count Fosco and his wife standing talking together on the steps outside with their faces turned towards me the countess came into the hall rather hastily, and asked if I had leisure enough for five minutes' private conversation. Feeling a little surprised by such an appeal from such a person, I put my letter into the bag, and replied that I was quite at her disposal. She took my arm with unaccustomed friendliness and familiarity, and instead of leading me into an empty room, drew me out with her to the belt of turf which surrounded the large fish-pond. As we passed the Count on the steps, he bowed and smiled, and then went at once into the house, pushing the hall door to after him, but not actually closing it. The Countess walked me gently round the fish-pond, I expected to be made the depository of some extraordinary confidence, and I was astonished to find that Madame Fosco's communication for my private ear was nothing more than a polite assurance of her sympathy for me after what had happened in the library. Her husband had told her of all that had passed, and of the insolent manner in which Sir Percival had spoken to me. This information had so shocked and distressed her, on my account, and on Laura's, that she had made up her mind, if anything of the sort happened again, to mark her sense of Sir Percival's outrageous conduct by leaving the house. The Count had approved of her idea, and she now hoped that I approved of it too. I thought this a very strange proceeding on the part of such a remarkably reserved woman as Madame Fosco, especially after the interchange of sharp speeches which had passed between us during the conversation in the boathouse on that very morning. However, it was my plain duty to meet a polite and friendly advance on the part of one of my elders with a polite and friendly reply. I answered the Countess accordingly in her own tone, and then, thinking we had said all that was necessary on either side, made an attempt to get back to the house. But Madame Fosco seemed resolved not to part with me, and to my unspeakable amazement resolved also to talk, Hitherto, the most silent of women, she now persecuted me with fluent conventionalities on the subject of married life, on the subject of Sir Percival and Laura, on the subject of her own happiness, on the subject of the late Mr. Fairley's conduct to her in the matter of her legacy, and on half a dozen other subjects besides until she had detained me walking round and round the fish-pond for more than half an hour, and had quite wearied me out. Whether she discovered this or not I cannot say, but she stopped as abruptly as she had begun, looked towards the house-door, resumed her icy manner in a moment, and dropped my arm of her own accord, before I could think of an excuse for accomplishing my own release from her. As I pushed open the door and entered the hall, I found myself suddenly face to face with the Count again. He was just putting a letter into the post-bag. 
After he had dropped it in, and had closed the bag, he asked me where I had left Madame Fosco. I told him, and he went out at the hall door immediately to join his wife. His manner when he spoke to me was so unusually quiet and subdued that I turned and looked after him, wondering if he were ill or out of spirits. Why my next proceeding was to go straight up to the post-bag and take out my own letter and look at it again with a vague distrust on me, and why the looking at it for the second time instantly suggested the idea to my mind of sealing the envelope for its greater security. Our mysteries, which are either too deep or too shallow for me to fathom. Women, as everybody knows, constantly act on impulses which they cannot explain even to themselves, and I can only suppose that one of those impulses was the hidden cause of my unaccountable conduct on this occasion. Whatever influence animated me, I found cause to congratulate myself on having obeyed it as soon as I prepared to seal the letter in my own room. I had originally closed the envelope in the usual way by moistening the adhesive point and pressing it on the paper beneath and when I now tried it with my finger, after a lapse of full three-quarters of an hour, the envelope opened on the instant, without sticking or tearing. Perhaps I had fastened it insufficiently. Perhaps there might have been some defect in the adhesive gum. Or perhaps... No, it is quite revolting enough to feel that third conjecture stirring in my mind, I would rather not see it confronting me in plain black and white. I almost dread to-morrow. So much depends on my discretion and self-control. There are two precautions at all events, which I am sure not to forget. I must be careful to keep up friendly appearances with the Count, and I must be well on my guard when the messenger from the office comes here with the answer to my letter. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 5. June 17th. When the dinner hour brought us together again, Count Bosco was in his usual excellent spirits. He exerted himself to interest and amuse us, as if he was determined to efface from our memories all recollection of what had passed in the library that afternoon. Lively descriptions of his adventures in travelling, amusing anecdotes of remarkable people whom he had met with abroad, quaint comparisons between the social customs of various nations, illustrated by examples drawn from men and women indiscriminately all over Europe, humorous confessions of the innocent follies of his own early life, when he ruled the fashions of a second-rate Italian town, and wrote preposterous romances on the French model for a second-rate Italian newspaper. All flowed in succession so easily and so gaily from his lips, and all addressed our various curiosities and various interests so directly and so delicately, that Laura and I listened to him with as much attention and inconsistent as it may seem, with as much admiration also, as Madame Fosco herself. Women can resist a man's love, a man's fame, a man's personal appearance, and a man's money. 
but they cannot resist a man's tongue when he knows how to talk to them. After dinner, while the favourable impression which he had produced on us was still vivid in our minds, the Count modestly withdrew to read in the library. Laura proposed a stroll in the grounds to enjoy the close of the long evening. It was necessary in common politeness to ask Madame Fosco to join us, but this time she had apparently received her orders beforehand, and she begged we would kindly excuse her. The Count will probably want a fresh supply of cigarettes, she remarked by way of apology, and nobody can make them to his satisfaction but myself. Her cold blue eyes almost warmed as she spoke the words. She looked actually proud of being the officiating medium through which her lord and master composed himself with tobacco smoke. Laura and I went out together alone. It was a misty, heavy evening. There was a sense of blight in the air, the flowers were drooping in the garden, and the ground was parched and dewless. The western heaven, as we saw it over the quiet trees, was of a pale yellow hue, and the sun was setting faintly in a haze. Coming rain seemed near. It would fall probably with the fall of night. Which way shall we go? I asked. "'Towards the lake, Marion, if you like,' she answered. "'You seem unaccountably fond, Laura, of that dismal lake.' "'No, not of the lake, but of the scenery about it. "'The sand and heath and the fir-trees "'are the only objects I can discover in all this large place "'to remind me of Limerick. "'But we will walk in some other direction, if you prefer it. I have no favourite walks at Blackwater Park, my love. One is the same as another to me. Let us go to the lake. We may find it cooler in the open space than we find it here. We walked through the shadowy plantation in silence. The heaviness in the evening air oppressed us both, and when we reached the boathouse we were glad to sit down and rest inside. A white fog hung low over the lake. The dense brown line of the trees on the opposite bank appeared above it, like a dwarf forest floating in the sky. The sandy ground shelving downward from where we sat was lost mysteriously in the outward layers of the fog. The silence was horrible. No rustling of the leaves, no bird's note in the wood, no cry of waterfowl from the pools of the hidden lake. Even the croaking of the frogs had ceased to-night. "'It is very desolate and gloomy,' said Laura. "'But we can be more alone here than anywhere else.' She spoke quietly, and looked at the wilderness of sand and mist with steady, thoughtful eyes. I could see that her mind was too much occupied to feel the dreary impressions from without, which had fastened themselves already on mine. I promised, Marian, to tell you the truth about my married life, instead of leaving you any longer to guess it for yourself, she began. That secret is the first I have ever had from you, love, and I am determined it shall be the last. I was silent, as you know, for your sake, and perhaps a little for my own sake as well. It is very hard for a woman to confess that the man to whom she has given her whole life is the man of all others who cares least for the gift. If you are married yourself, Marian, and especially if you are happily married, you would feel for me as no single woman can feel, however kind and true she may be. What answer could I make? I could only take her hand and look at her with my whole heart, as well as my eyes would let me. How often, she went on, 
I have heard you laughing over what you used to call your poverty. How often you have made me mock speeches of congratulation on my wealth. Oh, Marion, never laugh again. Thank God for your poverty. It has made you your own mistress, and has saved you from the lot that has fallen on me. A sad beginning on the lips of a young wife, sad in its quiet, plain-spoken truth. The few days we had all passed together at Blackwater Park had been many enough to show me, to show any one, what her husband had married her for. "'You shall not be distressed,' she said, "'by hearing how soon my disappointments and my trials began, "'or even by knowing what they were. "'It is bad enough to have them on my memory. "'If I tell you how he received the first and last attempt at remonstrance "'that I ever made, "'you will know how he has always treated me, "'as well as if I had described it in so many words.' It was uh, one day at Rome, when we had ridden out together to the tomb of Cecilia Metella. The sky was calm and lovely, and the grand old ruin looked beautiful, and the remembrance that a husband's love had raised it in the old time to a wife's memory made me feel more tenderly and more anxiously towards my husband than I had ever felt yet. "'Would you build such a tomb for me, Percival?' I asked him. "'You said you loved me dearly before we were married, and yet since that time.' I could get no farther, Marion. He was not even looking at me. I pulled down my veil, thinking it best not to let him see that the tears were in my eyes. I fancied he had not paid any attention to me, but he had. He said, Come away, and laughed to himself as he helped me on to my horse. He mounted his own horse, and laughed again as we rode away. If I do build you a tomb, he said, it will be done with your own money. I wonder whether Cecilia Metella had a fortune and paid for hers. I made no reply. How could I, when I was crying behind my veil? Ah! Uh, you light-complexioned women are all sulky, he said. What do you want? Compliments and soft speeches? Well, I'm in a good humour this morning. Consider the compliments paid and the speeches said. Men little know when they say hard things to us how well we remember them and how much harm they do us. It would have been better for me if I'd gone on crying but his contempt dried up my tears and hardened my heart. From that time, Marion, I never checked myself again in thinking of Walter Hartwright. I let the memory of those happy days, when we were so fond of each other in secret, come back and comfort me. What else had I to look to for consolation? If we had been together, you would have helped me to better things. I know it was wrong, darling. "'but tell me if I was wrong without any excuse.' "'I was obliged to turn my face from her. "'Don't ask me,' I said. "'Have I suffered as you have suffered? "'What right have I to decide?' "'I used to think of him,' she pursued, "'dropping her voice and moving closer to me. "'I used to think of him "'when Percival left me alone at night "'to go among the opera people. "'I used to fancy what I might have been if it had pleased God to bless me with poverty, and if I had been his wife. I used to see myself in my neat, cheap gown, sitting at home and waiting for him while he was earning our bread, sitting at home and working for him and loving him all the better, because I had to work for him, seeing him come in tired and taking off his hat and coat for him and marrying, pleasing him, with little dishes at dinner, that I had learnt to make for his sake. Oh, I hope he is never lonely enough and sad enough to think of me and see me as I have thought of him and see him. 
as she said those melancholy words, all the lost tenderness returned to her voice, and all the lost beauty trembled back into her face. Her eyes rested as lovingly on the blighted, solitary, ill-omened view before us, as if they saw the friendly hills of Cumberland in the dim and threatening sky. "'Don't speak of Walter any more,' I said, as soon as I could control myself. "'Oh, Laura, spare us both the wretchedness of talking of him now.' She roused herself and looked at me tenderly. "'I would rather be silent about him for ever,' she answered, "'than cause you a moment's pain.' "'It is in your interests,' I pleaded. "'It is for your sake that I speak. "'If your husband heard you—' "'It would not surprise him if he did hear me.' "'She made that strange reply with a weary calmness and coldness. "'The change in her manner when she gave the answer "'startled me almost as much as the answer itself. "'Not surprise him,' I repeated. "'Laura, remember what you are saying. "'You frighten me.' "'It is true,' she said. "'It is what I wanted to tell you to-day, "'when we were talking in your room. "'My only secret when I opened my heart to him at Limeridge "'was a harmless secret, Marian. "'You said so yourself. "'The name was all I kept from him and he has discovered it. I heard her, but I could say nothing. Her last words had killed the little hope that still lived in me. It happened at Rome, she went on, as wearily calm and cold as ever. We were at a little party given to the English by some friends of Sir Percival's, Mr. and Mrs. Markland. Mrs. Markland had the reputation of sketching very beautifully, and some of the guests prevailed on her to show us her drawings. We all admired them. But something I said attracted her attention particularly to me. Surely you draw yourself, she asked. I used to draw a little once, I answered, but I have given it up. If you have once drawn, she said, you may take to it again one of these days, and if you do, I wish you would let me recommend you a master. I said nothing, you know why, Marian, and tried to change the conversation. But Mrs. Markland persisted. I have had all sorts of teachers, she went on, but the best of all, the most intelligent and the most attentive, was a Mr. Hartwright. If you ever take up your drawing again, do try him as a master. He is a young man, modest and gentlemanlike. I am sure you will like him. Think of those words being spoken to me publicly in the presence of strangers, strangers who had been invited to meet the bride and bridegroom. I did all I could to control myself. I said nothing, and looked down close at the drawings. When I ventured to raise my head again, my eyes and my husband's eyes met and I knew by his look that my face had betrayed me. "'We will see about Mr. Hartwright,' he said, looking at me all the time, when we get back to England. "'I agree with you, Mrs. Markland. I think Lady Glyde is sure to like him.' He laid an emphasis on the last words, which made my cheeks burn, and set my heart beating as if it would stifle me. Nothing more was said. We came away early. He was silent in the carriage, driving back to the hotel. He helped me out and followed me upstairs as usual. But the moment we were in the drawing-room, he locked the door, pushed me down into a chair, and stood over me with his hands on my shoulders. Ever since that morning, when you made your audacious confession to me at the marriage, he said, I have wanted to find out the man, and I found him in your face to-night. Your drawing-master was the man, and his name is Hartwright. You shall repent it, and he shall repent it, to the last hour of your lives. Now go to bed, and dream of him, if you like, with the marks of my horsewhip on his shoulders. Whenever he is angry with me now, 
he refers to what I acknowledge to him in your presence, with a sneer or a threat. I have no power to prevent him from putting his own horrible construction on the confidence I placed in him. I have no influence to make him believe me, or to keep him silent. You looked surprised today, when you heard him tell me that I had made a virtue of necessity in marrying him. You will not be surprised again when you hear him repeat it the next time he is out of temper. Oh, Marion, don't, don't you hurt me. I had caught her in my arms, and the sting and torment of my remorse had closed them round her like a vice. Yes, my remorse, the white despair of Walter's face, when my cruel word struck him to the heart in the summer-house at Limeridge, rose before me in mute, unendurable reproach. My hand had pointed the way which led the man my sister loved, step by step, far from his country and his friends. Between those two young hearts I had stood to sunder them for ever, the one from the other, and his life and her life lay wasted before me alike in witness of the deed. I had done this, and done it for Sir Percival Glyde. For Sir Percival Glyde. I heard her speaking, and I knew by the tone of her voice that she was comforting me, I, who deserved nothing but the reproach of her silence, how long it was before I mastered the absorbing misery of my own thoughts, I cannot tell. I was first conscious that she was kissing me, and then my eyes seemed to wake on a sudden to their sense of outward things, and I knew that I was looking mechanically straight before me at the prospect of the lake. "'It is late,' I heard her whisper. "'It will be dark in the plantation.' She shook my arm and repeated, "'Marion, it will be dark in the plantation.' "'Give me a minute longer,' I said, "'a minute to get better in.' I was afraid to trust myself to look at her yet, and I kept my eyes fixed on the view. It was late, the dense brown line of trees in the sky had faded in the gathering darkness to the faint resemblance of a long wreath of smoke. The mist over the lake below had stealthily enlarged and advanced on us. The silence was as breathless as ever, but the horror of it had gone, and the solemn mystery of its stillness was all that remained. "'We are far from the house,' she whispered. "'Let us go back.' She stopped suddenly, and turned her face from me towards the entrance of the boathouse. Marion, she said, trembling violently, do you see nothing? Look! Where? Down there below us. She pointed. My eyes followed her hand, and I saw it, too. A living figure was moving over the waste of heath in the distance. It crossed our range of view from the boathouse, and passed darkly along the outer edge of the mist. It stopped far off in front of us, waited, and passed on, moving slowly, with the white cloud of mist behind it and above it, slowly, slowly, till it glided by the edge of the boathouse, and we saw it no more. We were both unnerved by what had passed between us that evening. Some minutes elapsed before Laura would venture into the plantation and before I could make up my mind to lead her back to the house. "'Was it a man or a woman?' she asked in a whisper, as we moved at last into the dark dampness of the outer air. "'I am not certain. Which do you think? It looked like a woman. I was afraid it was a man in a long cloak. It may be a man in this dim light. It is not possible to be certain. Wait, Marion, I am frightened. I don't see the path. Suppose the figure should follow us? Not at all likely, Laura. There is really nothing to be alarmed about. The shores of the lake are not far from the village, and they are free to any one to walk on by day or night. It is only wonderful we have seen no living creature there before. We were now in the plantation. It was very dark, so dark that we found some difficulty in keeping the path. I gave Laura my arm and we walked as fast as we could on our way back. Before we were halfway through she stopped, and forced me to stop with her. She was listening. Hush, she whispered, I hear something behind us. 
dead leaves i said to cheer her or a twig blown off the trees it is summer-time marion and there is not a breath of wind to listen i heard the sound too a sound like a light footstep following us no matter who it is or what it is i said let us walk on in another minute if there is anything to alarm us we shall be near enough to the house to be heard we went on quickly so quickly that laura was breathless by the time we were nearly through the plantation and within sight of the lighted windows i waited a moment to give her breathing time just as we were about to proceed she stopped me again and signed to me with her hand to listen once more we both heard distinctly a long heavy sigh behind us in the black depths of the trees who's there i called out there was no answer who's there i repeated an instant of silence followed and then we heard the light fall of the footsteps again fainter and fainter sinking away into the darkness sinking 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 till they were lost in the silence we hurried out from the trees to the open lawn beyond crossed it rapidly and without another word passing between us reached the house in the light of the hall lamp laura looked at me with white cheeks and startled eyes i am half dead with fear she said who could it have been we will try to guess to-morrow i replied in the meantime say nothing to any one of what we have heard and seen why not because silence is safe and we have need of safety in this house i sent laura upstairs immediately waited a minute to take off my hat and put my hair smooth and then went at once to make my first investigations in the library on pretence of searching for a book there sat the count filling out the largest easy chair in the house smoking and reading calmly with his feet on an ottoman his cravat across his knees and his shirt collar wide open and there sat madame fosco like a quiet child on a stool by his side making cigarettes neither husband nor wife could by any possibility have been out late that evening and have just got back to the house in a hurry i felt that my object in visiting the library was answered the moment i set eyes on them count fosco rose in polite confusion and tied his cravat on when i entered the room pray don't let me disturb you i said i have only come here to get a book all unfortunate men of my size suffer from the heat said the count refreshing himself gravely with a large green fan i wish i could change places with my excellent wife she is as cool at this moment as a fish in the pool outside the countess allowed herself to thaw under the influence of her husband's quaint comparison i am never warm miss halcombe she remarked with the modest air of a woman who was confessing to one of her own merits have you and lady glyde been out this evening asked the count while i was taking a book from the shelves to preserve appearances yes we went out to get a little air may i ask in what direction in the direction of the lake as far as the boathouse aha uh -huh. as far as the boathouse under other circumstances i might have resented his curiosity but to-night i held it as another proof that neither he nor his wife were connected with the mysterious appearance of the lake no more adventures i suppose this evening he went on no more discoveries like your discovery of the wounded dog he fixed his unfathomable grey eyes on me with that cold clear irresistible glitter in them which always forces me to look at him and always makes me uneasy while i do look an unutterable suspicion that his mind is prying into mine 
overcomes me at these times, and it overcame me now. No, I said shortly, no adventures, no discoveries. I tried to look away from him and leave the room. Strange as it seems, I hardly think I should have succeeded in the attempt if Madame Bosco had not helped me by causing him to move and look away first. Count, you are keeping Miss Harkham standing, she said. The moment he turned round to get me a chair, I seized my opportunity, thanked him, made my excuses, and slipped out. An hour later, when Laura's maid happened to be in her mistress's room, I took occasion to refer to the closeness of the night, with a view to ascertaining next how the servants had been passing their time. "'Have you been suffering much from the heat downstairs?' I asked. "'No, miss,' said the girl. "'We have not felt it to speak of. "'You have been out in the woods, then, I suppose. "'Some of us thought of going, miss, "'but Cook said she would take her chair into the cool courtyard "'outside the kitchen door, and on second thoughts, all the rest of us took our chairs out there, too. The housekeeper was now the only person who remained to be accounted for. "'Is Mrs. Mitchelson gone to bed yet?' I inquired. "'I should think not, miss,' said the girl, smiling. "'Mrs. Mitchelson is more likely to be getting up just now than going to bed.' "'Why, what do you mean? Has Mrs. Mitchelson been taking to her bed in the daytime?' "'No, miss, not exactly.' But the next thing to it. She's been asleep all the evening on the sofa in her own room. Putting together what I observed for myself in the library, and what I have just heard from Laura's maid, one conclusion seems inevitable. The figure we saw at the lake was not the figure of Madame Posco, of her husband, or of any of the servants. The footsteps we heard behind us were not the footsteps of any one belonging to the house. Who could it have been? It seems useless to inquire. I cannot even decide whether the figure was a man's or a woman's. I can only say that I think it was a woman's. End of chapter 15《Chapter Sixteen of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Six. June eighteenth. The misery of self reproach which I suffered yesterday evening on hearing what Laura told me in the boathouse returned in the loneliness of the night and kept me waking and wretched for hours i lighted my candle at last and searched through my old journals to see what my share in the fatal error of her marriage had really been and what i might have once done to save her from it the result soothed me a little for it showed that however blindly and ignorantly i acted i acted for the best crying generally does me harm but it was not so last night i think it relieved me i rose this morning with a settled resolution and a quiet mind nothing so percival can say or do shall ever irritate me again or make me forget for one moment that i am staying here in defiance of mortifications insults and threats for laura's service and for laura's sake the speculations in which we might have indulged this morning on the subject of the figure at the lake and the footsteps in the plantation have been all suspended by a trifling accident which has caused laura great regret she has lost the little brooch i gave her for a keepsake on the day before her marriage as she wore it when we went out yesterday evening we can only suppose that it must have dropped from her dress either in the boat-house or on our way back the servants have been sent to search and have returned unsuccessful and now laura herself has gone to look for it whether she finds it or not the loss will help to excuse her absence from the house if sir percival returns before the letter from mr gilmore's partner is placed in my hands 
one o'clock has just struck. I am considering whether I had better wait here for the arrival of the messenger from London, or step away quietly and watch for him outside the lodge gate. My suspicion of everybody and everything in this house inclines me to think that the second plan may be the best. The Count is safe in the breakfast room. I heard him through the door, as I ran upstairs ten minutes since, exercising his canary birds at their tricks. Come out on my little finger, my pretty pret pretties. Come and hop upstairs. One, two, three, and up. Three, two, one, and down. One, two, three, twit, 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 twit. The birds burst into their usual ecstasy of singing, and the Count chirruped and whistled at them in return, as if he was a bird himself. My room door is open, and I can hear the shrill singing and whistling at this very moment. If I am really to step out without being observed, now is the time. Four o'clock. The three hours that have passed since I made my last entry have turned the whole march of events of Blackwater Park in a new direction. Whether for good or for evil, I cannot and dare not decide. Let me get back first to the place at which I left off, or I shall lose myself in the confusion of my own thoughts. I went out, as I had proposed, to meet the messenger with my letter from London at the lodge gate. On the stairs I saw no one. In the hall I heard the Count still exercising his birds, but on crossing the quadrangle outside I passed Madame Fosco, walking by herself in her favourite circle round and round the great fish-pond. I at once slackened my pace, so as to avoid all appearance of being in a hurry, and even went the length, for caution's sake, of inquiring if she thought of going out before lunch. She smiled at me in the friendliest manner, said she preferred remaining near the house, nodded pleasantly, and re-entered the hall. I looked back, and saw that she had closed the door before I had opened the wicket by the side of the carriage gates. In less than a quarter of an hour I reached the lodge. The lane outside took a sudden turn to the left, ran on straight for a hundred yards or so, and then took another sharp turn to the right to join the high road. Between these two turns, hidden from the lodge on one side, and from the way to the station on the other, I waited walking backwards and forwards. High hedges were on either side of me, and for twenty minutes by my watch I neither saw nor heard anything. At the end of that time the sound of a carriage caught my ear, and I was met, as I advanced towards the second turning, by a fly from the railway. I made a sign to the driver to stop. As he obeyed me, a respectable-looking man put his head out of the window to see what was the matter. "'I beg your pardon,' I said, "'but am I right in supposing that you are going to Blackwater Park?' "'Yes, ma'am.' "'With a letter for anyone?' "'With a letter for Miss Halcombe, ma'am. "'You may give me the letter. I am Miss Halcombe.' The man touched his hat, got out of the fly immediately, and gave me the letter. I opened it at once, and read these lines— I copy them here, thinking it best to destroy the original for caution's sake. Dear Madam, your letter received this morning has caused me very great anxiety. I will reply to it as briefly and plainly as possible. My careful consideration of the statement made by yourself, and my knowledge of Lady Glyde's position as defined in the settlement, lead me, I regret to say, to the conclusion that a loan of the trust money to Sir Percival or, in other words, a loan of some portion of the twenty thousand pounds of Lady Glyde's fortune is in contemplation, and that she is made a party to the deed in order to secure her approval of a flagrant breach of trust, and to have her signature produced against her if she should complain hereafter. It is impossible on any other supposition to account situated as she is for her execution to a deed of any kind being wanted at all. In the event of Lady Glyde's signing such a document, as I am compelled to suppose the deed in question to be, her trustees would be at liberty to advance money to Sir Percival, 
out of her twenty thousand pounds, if the amount so lent should not be paid back, and if Lady Glyde should have children, their fortune will then be diminished by the sum, large or small, so advanced. In plainer terms still, the transaction, for anything that Lady Glyde knows to the contrary, may be a fraud upon her unborn children. Under these serious circumstances, I would recommend Lady Glyde to assign as a reason for withholding her signature that she wishes the deed to be first submitted to myself as her family solicitor in the absence of my partner, Mr. Gilmore. No reasonable objection can be made to taking this course, for if the transaction is an honourable one, there will necessarily be no difficulty in my giving my approval. Sincerely assuring you of my readiness to afford any additional help or advice that may be wanted, I beg to remain, madam, your faithful servant, William Curl. I read this kind and sensible letter very thankfully. It supplied Laura with a reason for objecting to the signature which was unanswerable, and which we could both of us understand. The messenger waited near me while I was reading, to receive his directions when I had done. "'Will you be good enough to say that I understand the letter, and that I am very much obliged?' I said. "'There is no other reply necessary at present.' Exactly at the moment when I was speaking those words, holding the letter open in my hand, Count Fosco turned the corner of the lane from the high road, and stood before me, as if he had sprung up out of the earth. The suddenness of his appearance, in the very last place under heaven, in which I should have expected to see him, took me completely by surprise. The messenger wished me good morning, and got into the fly again. I could not say a word to him. I was not even able to return his bow. The conviction that I was discovered, and by that man of all others, absolutely petrified me. "'Are you going back to the house, Miss Harkham?' he inquired without showing the least surprise on his side, and without even looking after the fly which drove off while he was speaking to me, I collected myself sufficiently to make a sign in the affirmative. "'I am going back too,' he said. "'Pray allow me the pleasure of accompanying you. Will you take my arm? You look surprised at seeing me.' I took his arm. The first of my scattered senses that came back was the sense that warned me to sacrifice anything rather than make an enemy of him. "'You look surprised at seeing me,' he repeated in his quietly pertinacious way. "'I thought, Count, I heard you with your birds in the breakfast-room,' I answered, as quietly and firmly as I could. "'Surely, but my little feathered children, dear lady, are only too like other children.' They have their days of perversity, and this morning was one of them. My wife came in as I was putting them back in their cage, and said she had left you going out alone for a walk. You told her so, did you not? Certainly. Well, Miss Halcombe, the pleasure of accompanying you was too great a temptation for me to resist. At my age there is no harm in confessing so much as that is that. I seized my hat and set up to offer myself as your escort. Even so fat an old man as Fosco is surely better than no escort at all. I took the wrong path. I came back in despair, and here I am arrived, may I say it, at the height of my wishes. He talked on, in this complimentary strain, with a fluency which left me no exertion to make beyond the effort of maintaining my composure. He never referred in the most distant manner to what he had seen in the lane or to the letter which I still had in my hand. This ominous discretion helped to convince me that he must have surprised by the most dishonourable means the secret of my application in Laura's interest to the lawyer, and that, having now assured himself of the private manner in which I had received the answer, he had discovered enough to suit his purposes, and was only bent on trying to quiet the suspicions which he knew he must have aroused in my mind. I was wise enough under these circumstances, 
not to attempt to deceive him by plausible explanations, and woman enough notwithstanding my dread of him, to feel as if my hand was tainted by resting on his arm. On the drive in front of the house we met the dog-cart, being taken round to the stables. Sir Percival had just returned. He came out to meet us at the house-door. Whatever other results his journey might have had, it had not ended in softening his savage temper. "'Oh, here are two of you come back,' he said, with a lowering face. "'What is the meaning of the house being deserted in this way? Where is Lady Glyde?' I told him of the loss of the brooch, and said that Laura had gone into the plantation to look for it. "'Brooch, or no brooch,' he growled sulkily. "'I recommend her not to forget her appointment in the library this afternoon. I shall expect to see her in half an hour.' I took my hand from the Count's arm, and slowly ascended the steps. He honoured me with one of his magnificent bows, and then addressed himself gaily to the scowling master of the house. "'Tell me, Percival,' he said, "'have you had a pleasant drive, and has your pretty shining brown molly come back at all tired?' "'Brown molly be hanged, and the drive too. I want my lunch.' "'And I want five minutes' talk with you, Percival, first, returned the Count. Five minutes' talk, my friend, here on the grass. What about? About business that very much concerns you. I lingered long enough in passing through the hall door to hear this question and answer, and to see Sir Percival thrust his hands into his pockets in sullen hesitation. If you want to badger me with any more of your infernal scruples, he said, I, for one, won't hear them. I want my lunch. "'Come out here and speak to me,' repeated the Count, still perfectly uninfluenced by the rudest speech that his friend could make to him. Sir Percival descended the steps. The Count took him by the arm and walked him away gently. The business, I was sure, referred to the question of the signature. They were speaking of Laura and of me beyond a doubt. I felt heart-sick and faint with anxiety. It might be of the last importance to both of us to know what they were saying to each other at that moment, and not one word of it could by any possibility reach my ears. I walked about the house, from room to room, with the lawyer's letter in my bosom. I was afraid by this time even to trust it under lock and key, till the oppression of my suspense half-maddened me. There were no signs of Laura's return, and I thought of going out to look for her, but my strength was so exhausted by the trials and anxieties of the morning that the heat of the day quite overpowered me, and after an attempt to get to the door, I was obliged to return to the drawing-room and lie down on the nearest sofa to recover. I was just composing myself when the door opened softly and the Count looked in. "'A thousand pardons, Miss Halcombe,' he said. "'I only venture to disturb you, because I am the bearer of good news. "'Percival, who is capricious in everything, as you know, "'has seen fit to alter his mind at the last moment, "'and the business of the signature is put off for the present. "'A great relief to all of us, Miss Halcombe, "'as I see with pleasure in your face. A "'Pray present my best respects and felicitations,' when you mention this pleasant change of circumstances to Lady Glyde. He left me before I had recovered my astonishment. There could be no doubt that this extraordinary alteration of purpose in the matter of the signature was due to his influence, and that his discovery of my application to London yesterday, and of my having received an answer to it to-day, had offered him the means of interfering with certain success. I felt these impressions, but my mind seemed to share the exhaustion of my body, and I was in no condition to dwell on them with any useful reference to the doubtful present or the threatening future. I tried a second time to run out and find Laura, but my head was giddy and my knees trembled under me. There was no choice but to give it up again and return to the sofa sorely against my will. The quiet in the house, 
and the low murmuring hum of summer insects outside the open window soothed me. My eyes closed of themselves, and I passed gradually into a strange condition which was not waking, for I knew nothing of what was going on about me and not sleeping, for I was conscious of my own repose. In this state my fevered mind broke loose from me while my weary body was at rest, and in a trance or daydream of my fancy, I know not what to call it, I saw Walter Hartwright. I had not thought of him since I rose that morning. Laura had not said one word to me, either directly or indirectly referring to him, and yet I saw him now, as plainly as if the past time had returned, and we were both together again at Limeridge House. He appeared to me as one among many other men, none of whose faces I could plainly discern. They were all lying on the steps of an immense ruined temple, colossal tropical trees with rank creepers twining endlessly about their trunks, and hideous stone idols glimmering and grinning at intervals behind leaves and stalks and branches, surrounded the temple and shut out the sky and threw a dismal shadow over the forlorn band of men on the steps. White exhalations, twisted and curled up stealthily from the ground, approached the men in wreaths like smoke, touched them and stretched them out dead, one by one, in the places where they lay. An agony of pity and fear for Walter loosened my tongue, and I implored him to escape, "'Come back, come back,' I said. "'Remember your promise to her and to me. "'Come back to us before the pestilence reaches you "'and lays you dead like the rest.' "'He looked at me with an unearthly quiet in his face. "'Wait,' he said, "'I shall come back. "'The night when I met the lost woman on the highway "'was the night which set my life apart to be the instrument of a design that is yet unseen. Here, lost in the wilderness, or there, welcome back in the land of my birth, I am still walking on the dark road which leads me, and you, and the sister of your love and mine, to the unknown retribution and the inevitable end. Wait and look. The pestilence which touches the rest will pass me. I saw him again, he was still in the forest, and the numbers of his lost companions had dwindled to very few. The temple was gone, and the idols were gone, and in their place the figures of dark dwarfish men lurked murderously among the trees, with bows in their hands, and arrows fitted to the string. Once more I feared for Walter, and cried out to warn him. Once more! He turned to me with the immovable quiet in his face. Another step, he said, on the dark road. Wait and look. The arrows that strike the rest will spare me. I saw him for the third time in a wrecked ship, stranded on a wild sandy shore. The overloaded boats were making away from him for the land, and he alone was left to sink with the ship. I cried to him to hail the hindmost boat, and to make a last effort for his life. The quiet face looked at me in return, and the unmoved voice gave me back the changeless reply. Another step on the journey, wait and look, the sea which drowns the rest will spare me. I saw him for the last time. He was kneeling by a tomb of white marble and the shadow of a veiled woman rose out of the grave beneath and waited by his side. The unearthly quiet of his face had changed to an unearthly sorrow, but the terrible certainty of his words remained the same. Darker and darker, he said, farther and farther yet, death takes the good, the beautiful and the young, and spares me the pestilence that wastes, the arrow that strikes, the sea that drowns, the grave that closes over love and hope, are steps of my journey, 
and take me nearer and nearer to the end. My heart sank under a dread beyond words, under a grief beyond tears. The darkness closed round the pilgrim at the marble tomb, closed round the veiled woman from the grave, closed round the dreamer who looked on them. I saw and heard no more. I was aroused by a hand laid on my shoulder. It was Laura's. She had dropped on her knees by the side of the sofa. Her face was flushed and agitated, and her eyes met mine in a wild, bewildered manner. I started the instant I saw her. "'What has happened?' I asked. "'What has frightened you?' She looked round at the half-open door, put her lips close to my ear, and answered in a whisper, "'Marian, the figure at the lake, the footsteps last night. I've just seen her. I've just spoken to her. Who, for heaven's sake, Anne Catterick. I was so startled by the disturbance in Laura's face and manner, and so dismayed by the first waking impressions of my dream, that I was not fit to bear the revelation which burst upon me when that name passed her lips. I could only stand rooted to the floor, looking at her in breathless silence. She was too much absorbed by what had happened to notice the effect which her reply had produced on me. I have seen Anne Catherick, I have spoken to Anne Catherick, she repeated, as if I had not heard her. Oh, Marian, I have such things to tell you. Come away. We may be interrupted here. Come at once into my room. With those eager words, she caught me by the hand, and led me through the library to the end room on the ground floor, which had been fitted up for her own especial use. No third person except her maid could have any excuse for surprising us here. She pushed me in before her, locked the door, and drew the chintz curtains that hung over the inside. The strange, stunned feeling which had taken possession of me still remained, but a growing conviction that the complications which had long threatened to gather about her, and to gather about me, had suddenly closed fast round us both, was now beginning to penetrate my mind. I could not express it in words. I could hardly even realise it dimly in my own thoughts. Anne Catherick, I whispered to myself, with useless, helpless reiteration, Anne Catherick. Laura drew me to the nearest seat, an ottoman in the middle of the room. Look, she said, look here, and pointed to the bosom of her dress. I saw for the first time that the lost brooch was pinned in its place again. There was something real in the sight of it, something real in the touching of it afterwards, which seemed to steady the whirl and confusion in my thoughts, and to help me to compose myself. Where did you find your brooch? The first words I could say to her were the words which put that trivial question at that important moment. She found it, Marian. Where? On the floor of the boathouse. Oh, how shall I begin? How shall I tell you about it? She talked to me so strangely. She looked so fearfully ill. She left me so suddenly. Her voice rose as the tumult of her recollections pressed upon her mind. The inveterate distrust which weighs night and day on my spirits in this house instantly roused me to warn her, just as the sight of the brooch had roused me to question her the moment before. Speak low, I said. The window is open, and the garden path runs beneath it. Begin at the beginning, Laura. Tell me word for word what passed between that woman and you. Shall I close the window? No, only speak low. Only remember that Anne Catherick is a dangerous subject under your husband's roof. Where did you first see her? At the boathouse, Marianne. I went out, as you know, to find my brooch and I walked along the path through the plantation, looking down on the ground carefully at every step. In that way I got on, after a long time, to the boathouse, and as soon as I was inside it I went on my knees to hunt over the floor. I was still searching with my back to the doorway, when I heard a soft, strange voice behind me say, Miss Fairley. Miss Fairley? Yes, my old name, the dear familiar name that I thought I had parted from for ever, I started up, not frightened, 
the voice was too kind and gentle to frighten anybody but very much surprised there looking at me from the doorway stood a woman whose face i never remembered to have seen before how was she dressed she had a neat pretty white gown on and over it a poor worn thin dark shawl her bonnet was of brown straw as poor and worn as the shawl i was struck by the difference between her gown and the rest of her dress and she saw that i noticed it don't look at my bonnet and shawl she said speaking in a quick breathless sudden way if i mustn't wear white i don't care what i wear look at my gown as much as you please i'm not ashamed of that very strange was it not before i could say anything to soothe her she held out one of her hands and i saw my brooch in it i was so pleased and so grateful that i went quite close to her to say what i really felt are you thankful enough to do me one little kindness she asked yes indeed i answered any kindness in my power i shall be glad to show you then let me pin your brooch on for you now i have found it her request was so unexpected marian and she made it with such extraordinary eagerness that i drew back a step or two not well knowing what to do ah oh, she said your mother would have let me pin on the brooch there was something in her voice and her look as well as in her mentioning my mother in that reproachful manner which made me ashamed of my distrust i took her hand with the brooch in it and put it up gently on the bosom of my dress you knew my mother i said was it very long ago have i ever seen you before her hands were busy fastening the brooch she stopped and pressed them against my breast you don't remember a fine spring day at the bridge she said and your mother walking down the path that led to the school with a little girl on each side of her i have had nothing else to think of since and i remember it you were one of the little girls and i was the other pretty clever miss Furley, and poor dazed and catherick were nearer to each other then than they are now did you remember her laura when she told you her name yes i remembered your asking me about anne catherick at limeridge and your saying that she had once been considered like me what reminded you of that laura she reminded me while i was looking at her while she was very close to me it came over my mind suddenly that we were like each other her face was pale and thin and weary but the sight of it startled me as if it had been the sight of my own face in the glass after a long illness the discovery i don't know why gave me such a shock that i was perfectly incapable of speaking to her for the moment did she seem hurt by your silence i am afraid she was hurt by it you have not got your mother's face she said or your mother's heart your mother's face was dark and your mother's heart miss Fairley, was the heart of an angel i am sure i feel kindly towards you i said though i may not be able to express it as i ought why do you call me miss Fairley? because i love the name of Fairley and hate the name of glyde she broke out violently i had seen nothing like madness in her before this but i fancied i saw it now in her eyes i only thought you might not know i was married i said remembering the wild letter she wrote to me at limeridge and trying to quiet her she sighed bitterly and turned away from me not know you were married she repeated i am here because you are married i am here to make atonement to you before i meet your mother in the world beyond the grave she drew farther and farther away from me till she was out of the boathouse and then she watched and listened for a little while when she turned round to speak again instead of coming back she stopped where she was looking in at me with a hand on each side of the entrance did you see me at the lake last night she said did you hear me following you in the wood i have been waiting for days together to speak to you alone i have left the only friend i have in the world anxious and frightened about me i have risked being shut up again in the madhouse and all for your sake miss Fairley, all for your sake her words alarmed me marian and yet there was something in the way she spoke that made me pity her with all my heart i am sure my pity must have been sincere for it made me bold enough to ask the poor creature to come in and sit down in the boat-house by my side did she do so no she shook her head 
and told me she must stop where she was to watch and listen, and see that no third person surprised us, and from first to last there she waited at the entrance, with a hand on each side of it, sometimes bending in suddenly to speak to me, sometimes drawing back suddenly to look about her. I was here yesterday, she said, before it came dark, and I heard you and the lady with you talking together. I heard you tell her about your husband. I heard you say you had no influence to make him believe you, and no influence to keep him silent. Ah, I knew what those words meant. My conscience told me while I was listening, why did I ever let you marry him? Oh, my fear, my mad, miserable, wicked fear! She covered up her face in her poor worn shawl, and moaned and murmured to herself behind it. I began to be afraid she might break out into some terrible despair which neither she nor I could master. Try to quiet yourself, I said. Try to tell me how you might have prevented my marriage. She took the shawl from her face and looked at me vacantly. I ought to have had heart enough to stop at Limerick, she answered. I ought never to have let the news of his coming there frighten me away. I ought to have warned you and saved you before it was too late. Why did I only have courage enough to write you that letter? Why did I only do harm when I wanted and meant to do good? Oh, my fear, my mad, miserable, wicked fear! She repeated those words again, and hid her face again in the end of her poor worn shawl. It was dreadful to see her and dreadful to hear her. Surely, Laura, you asked what the fear was which she dwelt on so earnestly. Yes, I asked that. And what did she say? She asked me in return if I should not be afraid of a man who had shut me up in a madhouse, and who would shut me up again if he could. I said, Are you afraid still? Surely you would not be here if you were afraid now. No, she said, I am not afraid now. I asked why not. She suddenly bent forward into the boathouse and said, Can't you guess why? I shook my head. Look at me, she went on. I told her I was grieved to see that she looked very sorrowful and very ill. She smiled for the first time. Ill, she repeated, I'm dying. You know why I'm not afraid of him now. Do you think I shall meet your mother in heaven? Will she forgive me if I do? I was so shocked and so startled that I could make no reply. I have been thinking of it, she went on, all the time I have been in hiding from your husband, all the time I lay ill. My thoughts have driven me here. I want to make atonement. I want to undo all I can of the harm I once did. I begged her as earnestly as I could to tell me what she meant. She still looked at me with fixed vacant eyes. Shall I undo the harm? She said to herself doubtfully. You have friends to take your part. If you know his secret, he will be afraid of you. He won't dare use you as he used me. He must treat you mercifully for his own sake, if he is afraid of you and your friends. And if he treats you mercifully, and if I can say it was my doing... I listened eagerly for more, but she stopped at those words. You tried to make her go on. I tried, but she only drew herself away from me again, and leaned her face and arms against the side of the boathouse. Oh, I heard her say, with a dreadful, distracted tenderness in her voice. Oh, if I could only be buried with your mother, if I could only wake at her side, when the angel's trumpet sounds, and the graves give up their dead at the resurrection. Marion, I trembled from head to foot. It was horrible to hear her. But there is no hope of that, she said, moving a little so as to look at me again. No hope for a poor stranger like me. I shall not rest under the marble cross that I washed with my own hands, and made so white and pure for her sake. Oh, no, oh, no, God's mercy, not man's, will take me to her, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. She spoke those words, quietly and sorrowfully, with a heavy, hopeless sigh, and then waited a little. Her face was confused and troubled. She seemed to be thinking or trying to think. What was it I said just now? She asked after a while. When your mother is in my mind, everything else goes out of it. Oh, what was I saying? What was I saying? 
I reminded the poor creature as kindly and delicately as I could. Ah, yes, yes, she said, still in a vacant, perplexed manner. You are hopeless with your wicked husband, yes, and I must do what I have come to do here. I must make it up to you for having been afraid to speak out at a better time. What is it you have to tell me? I asked. The secret that your cruel husband is afraid of, she answered. I once threatened him with the secret and frightened him. You shall threaten him with the secret and frighten him too. Her face darkened, and a hard, angry stare fixed itself in her eyes. She began waving her hand at me in a vacant, unmeaning manner. My mother knows the secret, she said. My mother has wasted under the secret half her lifetime. One day, when I was grown up, she said something to me, and the next day your husband— Yes, yes, go on. What did she tell you about your husband? She stopped again, Marian, at that point, and said no more, and listened eagerly. Hush, she whispered, still waving her hand at me. Hush. She moved aside out of the doorway, moved slowly and stealthily, step by step, till I lost her past the edge of the boathouse. Surely you followed her? Yes. My anxiety made me bold enough to rise and follow her. Just as I reached the entrance, she appeared again, suddenly, round the side of the boathouse. The secret, I whispered to her. Wait and tell me the secret. She caught hold of my arm and looked at me with wild, frightened eyes. Not now, she said. We are not alone. We are watched. Come here tomorrow at this time. By yourself, mind, by yourself. She pushed me roughly into the boathouse again, and I saw her no more. Oh, Laura, Laura, another chance lost. If I had only been near you, she should not have escaped us. On which side did you lose sight of her? On the left side, where the ground sinks and the wood is thickest. Did you run out again? Did you call after her? How could I? I was too terrified to move or speak. But when you did move, when you came out, I ran back here to tell you what had happened. Did you see anyone? or hear anyone in the plantation. No, it seemed to be all still and quiet when I passed through it. I waited for a moment to consider. Was this third person, supposed to have been secretly present at the interview, a reality, or the creature of Anne Catherick's excited fancy? It was impossible to determine. The one thing certain was, that we had failed again on the very brink of discovery, failed utterly and irretrievably, unless Anne Catherick kept her appointment at the boathouse for the next day. Are you quite sure you have told me everything that passed, every word that was said? I inquired. I think so, she answered. My powers of memory, Marian, are not like yours, but I was so strongly impressed, so deeply interested that nothing of any importance can possibly have escaped me. My dear Laura, the merest trifles are of importance where Anne Catherick is concerned. Think again. Did no chance reference escape her as to the place in which she is living at the present time? None that I can remember. Did she not mention a companion and friend, a woman named Mrs. Clements? Oh, yes, yes, I forgot that. She told me Mrs. Clements wanted sadly to go with her to the lake and take care of her, and begged and prayed that she would not venture into this neighbourhood alone. Was that all she said about Mrs. Clements? Yes, that was all. She told you nothing about the place in which she took refuge after leaving Todd's Corner? Nothing, I am quite sure. Nor where she has lived since, nor what her illness had been. No, Marian, not a word. Oh, tell me, pray tell me what you think about it. I don't know what to think or what to do next. You must do this, my love. You must carefully keep the appointment at the boathouse tomorrow. It is impossible to say what interests may not depend on your seeing that woman again. You shall not be left to yourself a second time. I will follow you at a safe distance. Nobody shall see me, but I will keep within hearing of your voice if anything happens. Anne Catherick has escaped Walter Hartwright and has escaped you. Whatever happens, she shall not escape me. Laura's eyes read mine attentively. You believe, she said, in this secret that my husband is afraid of. Suppose, Marian, 
it should only exist after all in Anne Catherick's fancy. Suppose she only wanted to see me and to speak to me for the sake of old remembrances. Her manner was so strange. I almost doubted her. Would you trust her in other things? I trust nothing, Laura, but my own observation of your husband's conduct. I judge Anne Catherick's words by his actions, and I believe there is a secret. I said no more, and got up to leave the room. Thoughts were troubling me, which I might have told her if we had spoken together longer, and which it might have been dangerous for her to know. The influence of the terrible dream from which she had awakened me hung darkly and heavily over every fresh impression which the progress of her narrative produced on my mind. I felt the ominous future coming close, chilling me with an unutterable awe, forcing on me the conviction of an unforeseen design in the long series of complications which had now fastened round us. I thought of Hartwright, as I saw him in the body when he said farewell, as I saw him in the spirit in my dream, and I too began to doubt now whether we were not advancing blindfold to an appointed and an inevitable end. Leaving Laura to go upstairs alone, I went out to look about me in the walks near the house. The circumstances under which Anne Catherick had parted from her had made me secretly anxious to know how Count Fosco was passing the afternoon, and had rendered me secretly distrustful of the results of that solitary journey from which Sir Percival had returned but a few hours since. After looking for them in every direction, and discovering nothing, I returned to the house and entered the different rooms on the ground floor one after another. They were all empty. I came out again into the hall, and went upstairs to return to Laura. Madame Fosco opened her door as I passed it in my way along the passage, and I stopped to see if she could inform me of the whereabouts of her husband and Sir Percival. Yes, she had seen them both from her window more than an hour since. The Count had looked up with his customary kindness, and had mentioned with his habitual attention to her in the smallest trifles that he and his friend were going out together for a long walk. For a long walk! They had never yet been in each other's company with that object in my experience of them. Sir Percival cared for no exercise but riding, and the Count, except when he was polite enough to be my escort, cared for no exercise at all. When I joined Laura again, I found that she had called to mind in my absence the impending question of the signature to the deed which, in the interest of discussing her interview with Anne Catherick, we had hitherto overlooked. Her first words when I saw her expressed her surprise at the absence of the expected summons to attend Sir Percival in the library. "'You may make your mind easy on that subject,' I said. "'For the present, at least, neither your resolution nor mine will be exposed to any further trial. Sir Percival has altered his plans. The business of the signature is put off.' "'Put off?' Laura repeated amazedly. Who told you so? My authority is Count Fosco. I believe it is to his interference that we are indebted for your husband's sudden change of purpose. It seems impossible, Marian. If the object of my signing was, as we suppose, to obtain money for Sir Percival that he urgently wanted, how can the matter be put off? I think, Laura, we have the means at hand of setting that doubt at rest. Have you forgotten the conversation that I heard between Sir Percival and the lawyer as they were crossing the hall? No, but I don't remember. I do. There were two alternatives proposed. One was to obtain your signature to the parchment. The other was to gain time by giving bills of three months. The last resource is evidently the resource now adopted, and we may fairly hope to be relieved from our share in Sir Percival's embarrassments for some time to come. Oh, Marian, it sounds too good to be true. Does it, my love? You complimented me on my ready memory not long since, but you seem to doubt it now. I will get my journal, and you shall see if I am right or wrong. I went away and got the book at once. On looking back to the entry referring to the lawyer's visit, 
we found that my recollection of the two alternatives presented was accurately correct. It was almost as great a relief to my mind as to Laura's to find that my memory had served me on this occasion as faithfully as usual. In the perilous uncertainty of our present situation, it is hard to say what future interests may not depend upon the regularity of the entries in my journal and upon the reliability of my recollection at the time when I make them. Laura's face and manner suggested to me that this last consideration had occurred to her as well as to myself. Anyway, it is only a trifling matter, and I am almost ashamed to put it down here in writing. It seems to set the forlornness of our situation in such a miserably vivid light. We must have little indeed to depend on, when the discovery that my memory can still be trusted to serve us is hailed as if it was the discovery of a new friend. The first bell for dinner separated us. Just as it had done ringing, Sir Percival and the Count returned from their walk. We heard the master of the house storming at the servants for being five minutes late, and the master's guest interposing, as usual, in the interests of propriety, patience, and peace. The evening has come and gone. No extraordinary event has happened, but I have noticed certain peculiarities in the conduct of Sir Percival and the Count, which have sent me to my bed feeling very anxious and uneasy about Anne Catherick, and about the results which to-morrow may produce. I know enough by this time to be sure that the aspect of Sir Percival which is the most false, and which therefore means the worst, is his polite aspect that long walk with his friend had ended in improving his manners, especially towards his wife. To Laura's secret surprise, and to my secret alarm, he called her by her Christian name, asked if she had heard lately from her uncle, inquired when Mrs. Vesey was to receive her invitation to Blackwater, and showed her so many other little attentions, that he almost recalled the days of his hateful courtship at Limeridge House. This was a bad sign to begin with, and I thought it more ominous still that he should pretend after dinner to fall asleep in the drawing-room, and that his eyes should cunningly follow Laura and me when he thought we neither of us suspected him. I have never had any doubt that his sudden journey by himself took him to Wellmingham to question Mrs. Catherick, but the experience of to-night has made me fear that the expedition was not undertaken in vain, and that he has got the information which he unquestionably left us to collect. If I knew where Anne Catherick was to be found, I would be up to-morrow with sunrise and warn her. While the aspect under which Sir Percival presented himself to-night was unhappily but too familiar to me, the aspect under which the Count appeared was, on the other hand, entirely new in my experience of him. He permitted me this evening to make his acquaintance for the first time in the character of a man of sentiment of sentiment as i believe really felt not assumed for the occasion for instance he was quiet and subdued his eyes and his voice expressed a restrained sensibility he wore as if there was some hidden connection between his showiest finery and his deepest feeling the most magnificent waistcoat he has yet appeared in it was made of pale sea-green silk, and delicately trimmed with fine silver braid. His voice sank into the tenderest inflections. His smile expressed a thoughtful, fatherly admiration whenever he spoke to Laura or to me. He pressed his wife's hand under the table when she thanked him for trifling little attentions at dinner. He took wine with her. "'Your health and happiness, my angel,' he said, with fond, glistening eyes. He ate little or nothing, and sighed, and said, Good Percival, when his friend laughed at him. After dinner, he took Laura by the hand, and asked her if she would be so sweet as to play to him. She complied through sheer astonishment. He sat by the piano, with his watch-chain resting in folds like a golden serpent on the sea-green protuberance of his waistcoat. His immense head lay languidly on one side, and he gently beat time with two of his yellow-white fingers. He highly approved of the music, and tenderly admired Laura's manner of playing, not as poor Hartwright used to praise it, 
with an innocent enjoyment of the sweet sounds, but with a clear, cultivated, practical knowledge of the merits of the composition in the first place, and of the merits of the player's touch in the second. As the evening closed in, he begged that the lovely dying light might not be profaned just yet by the appearance of the lamps. He came with his horribly silent tread to the distant window at which I was standing, to be out of his way and to avoid the very sight of him. He came to ask me to support his protest against the lamps. If any one of them could only have burnt him up at that moment, I would have gone down to the kitchen and fetched it myself. Surely you like this modest, trembling English twilight, he said softly. Ah, I love it. I feel my inborn admiration of all that is noble and great and good, purified by the breath of heaven on an evening like this. Nature has such imperishable charms, such inextinguishable tenderness for me. I am an old fat man. Talk which would become your lips, Miss Halcombe, sounds like a derision and a mockery on mine. It is hard to be laughed at in my moments of sentiment, as if my soul was like myself old and overgrown. Observe, dear lady, what a light is dying on the trees. Does it penetrate your heart? as it penetrates mine. He paused, looked at me, and repeated the famous lines of Dante on the evening time, with a melody and tenderness which added a charm of their own to the matchless beauty of the poetry itself. Bah! he cried suddenly, as the last cadence of those noble Italian words died away on his lips. I make an old fool of myself, and only weary you all, let us shut up the window in our bosoms, and get back to the matter-of-fact world. Percival, I sanction the admission of the lamps, Lady Glyde, Miss Halcombe, Eleanor, my good wife. Which of you will indulge me with a gain at dominoes? He addressed us all, but he looked especially at Laura. She had learned to feel my dread of offending him, and she accepted his proposal. It was more than I could have done at that moment. I could not have sat down at the same table with him for any consideration. His eyes seemed to reach my inmost soul through the thickening obscurity of the twilight. His voice trembled along every nerve in my body, and turned me hot and cold alternately. The mystery and terror of my dream, which had haunted me at intervals all through the evening, now oppressed my mind with an unendurable foreboding and an unutterable awe. I saw the white tomb again, and the veiled woman rising out of it by Hartwright's side. The thought of Laura welled up like a spring in the depths of my heart, and filled it with waters of bitterness never, never known to it before. I caught her by the hand as she passed me on her way to the table, and kissed her as if that night was to part us for ever. While they were all gazing at me in astonishment, I ran out through the low window which was open before me to the ground ran out to hide from them in the darkness, to hide even from myself. We separated that evening later than usual. Towards midnight the summer silence was broken by the shuddering of a low melancholy wind among the trees. We all felt the sudden chill in the atmosphere, but the Count was the first to notice the stealthy rising of the wind. He stopped while he was lighting my candle for me, and held up his hand warningly. Listen, he said, there will be a change tomorrow. End of chapter 16《Chapter 17 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 7. June 19. The events of yesterday warned me to be ready sooner or later to meet the worst. Today is not yet at an end, and the worst has come. Judging by the closest calculation of time that Laura and I could make, we arrived at the conclusion that Anne Catherick must have appeared at the boathouse at half-past two o'clock on the afternoon of yesterday. 
I accordingly arranged that Laura should just show herself at the luncheon-table to-day, and should then slip out at the first opportunity, leaving me behind to preserve appearances, and to follow her as soon as I could safely do so. This mode of proceeding, if no obstacles occurred to thought us, would enable her to be at the boat-house before half-past two, and, when I left the table in my turn, would take me to a safe position in the plantation before three. The change in the weather, which last night's wind warned us to expect, came with the morning. It was raining heavily when I got up, and it continued to rain until twelve o'clock. When the clouds dispersed, the blue sky appeared, and the sun shone again with the bright promise of a fine afternoon. My anxiety to know how Sir Percival and the Count would occupy the early part of the day was by no means set at rest, so far as Sir Percival was concerned, by his leaving us immediately after breakfast and going out by himself in spite of the rain. He neither told us where he was going, nor when we might expect him back. We saw him pass the breakfast-room window hastily, with his high boots and his waterproof coat on, and that was all. The Count passed the morning quietly indoors, some part of it in the library, some part in the drawing-room, playing odds and ends of music on the piano and humming to himself. Judging by appearances, the sentimental side of his character was persistently inclined to betray itself still. He was silent and sensitive, and ready to sigh and languish ponderously, as only fat men can sigh and languish, on the smallest provocation. Luncheon time came, and Sir Percival did not return. The Count took his friend's place at the table, plaintively devoured the greater part of a fruit tart, submerged under a whole jugful of cream, and explained the full merit of the achievement to us as soon as he had done. A taste for sweets, he said, in his softest tones and his tenderest manner, is the innocent taste of women and children. I love to share it with them. It is another bond, dear ladies, between you and me. Laura left the table in ten minutes' time. I was sorely tempted to accompany her, but if we had both gone out together, we must have excited suspicion, and worse still, if we allowed Anne Catherick to see Laura accompanied by a second person who was a stranger to her, we should, in all probability, forfeit her confidence from that moment, never to regain it again. I waited, therefore, as patiently as I could, until the servant came in to clear the table. When I quitted the room, there were no signs in the house or out of it of Sir Percival's return. I left the Count with a piece of sugar between his lips, and the vicious cockatoo scrambling up his waistcoat to get at it, while Madame Fosco, sitting opposite to her husband, watched the proceedings of his bird and himself as attentively as if she had never seen anything of the sort before in her life. On my way to the plantation I kept carefully beyond the range of view from the luncheon-room window. Nobody saw me and nobody followed me. It was then a quarter to three o'clock by my watch. Once among the trees, I walked rapidly, until I had advanced more than half-way through the plantation. At that point I slackened my pace and proceeded cautiously, but I saw no one, and heard no voices. By little and little I came within view of the back of the boathouse, stopped and listened, then went on till I was close behind it, and must have heard any persons who were talking inside. Still the silence was unbroken, still far and near, no sign of a living creature appeared anywhere. After skirting round by the back of the building, first on one side and then on the other, and making no discoveries, 
I ventured in front of it, and fairly looked in. The place was empty. I called Laura, at first softly, then louder and louder. No one answered, and no one appeared. For all that I could see and hear, the only human creature in the neighbourhood of the lake and the plantation was myself. My heart began to beat violently, but I kept my resolution and searched, first the boathouse and then the ground in front of it, for any sign which might show me whether Laura had really reached the place or not. No mark of her presence appeared inside the building, but I found traces of her outside it, in footsteps on the sand. I detected the footsteps of two persons, large footsteps like a man's, and small footsteps which, by putting my own feet into them and testing their size in that manner, I felt certain were Laura's. The ground was confusedly marked in this way just before the boathouse. Close against one side of it, under shelter of the projecting roof, I discovered a little hole in the sand, a hole artificially made beyond a doubt. I just noticed it, and then turned away immediately to trace the footsteps as far as I could, and to follow the direction in which they might lead me. They led me, starting from the left-hand side of the boathouse, along the edge of the trees, a distance, I should think, of between two and three hundred yards, and then the sandy ground showed no further trace of them. Feeling that the persons whose course I was tracking must necessarily have entered the plantation at this point, I entered it too. At first I could find no path, but I discovered one afterwards, just faintly traced among the trees, and followed it. It took me for some distance in the direction of the village, until I stopped at a point where another foot-track crossed it. The brambles grew thickly on either side of this second path. I stood looking down it, uncertain which way to take next, and while I looked I saw on one thorny branch some fragments of fringe from a woman's shawl. A closer examination of the fringe satisfied me that it had been torn from a shawl of Laura's, and I instantly followed the second path. It brought me out at last to my great relief at the back of the house. I say to my great relief, because I inferred that Laura must, for some unknown reason, have returned before me by this roundabout way. I went in by the courtyard and the offices. The first person whom I met in crossing the servants' hall was Mrs. Mitchelson, the housekeeper. "'Do you know,' I asked, "'whether Lady Glyde has come in from her walk or not?' "'My lady came in a little while ago with Sir Percival,' answered the housekeeper. "'I am afraid, Miss Harkham, something very distressing has happened.' My heart sank within me. "'You don't mean an accident?' I said faintly. "'No. No, thank God, no accident.' but my lady ran upstairs to her own room in tears, and Sir Percival has ordered me to give Fanny warning to leave in an hour's time. Fanny was Laura's maid, a good, affectionate girl who had been with her for years, the only person in the house whose fidelity and devotion we could both depend upon. Where is Fanny? I inquired. In my room, Miss Harkham. The young woman is quite overcome and I told her to sit down and try to recover herself. I went to Mrs. Mitchelson's room, and found Fanny in a corner, with her box by her side, crying bitterly. She could give me no explanation whatever of her sudden dismissal. Sir Percival had ordered that she should have a month's wages in place of a month's warning and go. No reason had been assigned, no objection had been made to her conduct, she had been forbidden to appeal to her mistress, forbidden even to see her for a moment to say good-bye. She was to go without explanations or farewells, and to go at once. After soothing the poor girl by a few friendly words, I asked where she proposed to sleep that night. She replied that she thought of going to the little inn in the village, the landlady of which was a respectable woman, known to the servants of Blackwater Park. The next morning, by leaving early, she might get back to her friends in Cumberland without stopping in London, 
where she was a total stranger. I felt directly that Fanny's departure offered us a safe means of communication with London and with Limeridge House, of which it might be very important to avail ourselves. Accordingly, I told her that she might expect to hear from her mistress or from me in the course of the evening, and that she might depend on our both doing all that lay in our power to help her under the trial of leaving us for the present. Those words said, I shook hands with her and went upstairs. The door which led to Laura's room was the door of an antechamber opening on to the passage. When I tried it, it was bolted on the inside. I knocked, and the door was opened by the same heavy, overgrown housemaid whose lumpish insensibility had tried my patience so severely on the day when I found the wounded dog. I had, since that time, discovered that her name was Margaret Porcher, and that she was the most awkward, slatternly, and obstinate servant in the house. On opening the door, she instantly stepped out to the threshold, and stood grinning at me in stolid silence. "'Why do you stand there?' I said. "'Don't you see that I want to come in?' "'Ah, but you mustn't come in,' was the answer, with another and a broader grin still. "'How dare you talk to me in that way? Stand back instantly!' She stretched out a great red hand and arm, on each side of her, so as to bar the doorway, and slowly nodded her addle head at me. "'Master's orders,' she said, and nodded again. I had need of all my self-control to warn me against contesting the matter with her, and to remind me that the next words I had to say must be addressed to her master. I turned my back on her, and instantly went downstairs to find him. My resolution to keep my temper under all the irritations that Sir Percival could offer was, by this time, as completely forgotten, I say to my shame, as if I had never made it. It did me good, after all I had suffered and suppressed in that house, it actually did me good to feel how angry I was. The drawing-room and the breakfast-room were both empty. I went on to the library, and there I found Sir Percival the Count and Madame Fosco. They were all three standing up close together, and Sir Percival had a little slip of paper in his hand. As I opened the door, I heard the Count say to him, No, a thousand times over, no. I walked straight up to him, and looked him full in the face. Am I to understand, Sir Percival, that your wife's room is a prison, and that your housemaid is the jailer who keeps it? I asked. Yes, that is what you are to understand, he answered. Take care my jailer hasn't got double duty to do. Take care your room is not a prison, too. Take you care how you treat your wife and how you threaten me, I broke out in the heat of my anger. There are laws in England to protect women from cruelty and outrage. If you hurt a hair of Laura's head, if you dare to interfere with my freedom, come what may, to those laws I will appeal. Instead of answering me, he turned round to the Count. What did I tell you? he asked. What do you say now? What I said before, replied the Count. No. Even in the vehemence of my anger, I felt his calm, cold, grey eyes on my face. They turned away from me as soon as he had spoken, and looked significantly at his wife. Madame Fosco immediately moved close to my side, and in that position addressed Sir Percival before either of us could speak again. "'Favour me with your attention for one moment,' she said, in her clear, icily suppressed tones. "'I have to thank you.' sir percival for your hospitality and to decline taking advantage of it any longer i remain in no house in which ladies are treated as your wife and miss harcombe have been treated here to-day sir percival drew back a step and stared at her in dead silence 
the declaration he had just heard, a declaration which she well knew, as I well knew, Madame Fosco would not have ventured to make without her husband's permission, seemed to petrify him with surprise. The Count stood by and looked at his wife with the most enthusiastic admiration. She is sublime, he said to himself. He approached her while he spoke and drew her hand through his arm. I am at your service, Eleanor, he went on, with a quiet dignity that I had never noticed in him before, and at Miss Halcombe's service, if she will honour me by accepting all the assistance I can offer her. Damn it! What do you mean? cried Sir Percival, as the Count quietly moved away with his wife to the door. At other times I mean what I say but at this time I mean what my wife says, replied the impenetrable Italian. We have changed places possible for once, and Madame Fosco's opinion is mine. Sir Percival crumpled up the paper in his hand, and pushing past the Count with another oath, stood between him and the door. Have your own way, he said, with baffled rage in his low half-whispering tones have your own way and see what comes of it with those words he left the room madame fosco glanced inquiringly at her husband he has gone away very suddenly she said what does it mean it means that you and i together have brought the worst-tempered man in all england to his senses answered the count it means, Miss Arkham, that Lady Glyde is relieved from a gross indignity, and you from the repetition of an unpardonable insult. Suffer me to express my admiration of your conduct and your courage at a very trying moment. Sincere admiration, suggested Madame Fosco. Sincere admiration echoed the count i had no longer the strength of my first angry resistance to outrage and injury to support me my heart-sick anxiety to see laura my sense of my own helpless ignorance of what had happened at the boat-house pressed on me with an intolerable weight i tried to keep up appearances by speaking to the count and his wife in the tone which they had chosen to adopt in speaking to me. But the words failed on my lips. My breath came short and thick. My eyes looked longingly in silence at the door. The Count, understanding my anxiety, opened it, went out, and pulled it to after him. At the same time, Sir Percival's heavy step descended the stairs. I heard them whispering together outside, while Madame Fosco was assuring me, in her calmest and most conventional manner, that she rejoiced, for all our sakes, that Sir Percival's conduct had not obliged her husband and herself to leave Blackwater Park. Before she had done speaking, the whispering ceased, the door opened, and the Count looked in. "'Miss Halcombe,' he said, "'I am happy to inform you "'that Lady Glyde is mistress again in her own house. "'I thought it might be more agreeable to you "'to hear of this change for the better from me "'than from Sir Percival, "'and I have therefore expressly returned to mention it.' "'Admirable delicacy,' said Madame Fosco, "'paying back her husband's tribute of admiration with the Count's own coin, in the Count's own manner, he smiled and bowed, as if he had received a formal compliment from a polite stranger, and drew back to let me pass out first. Sir Percival was standing in the hall. As I hurried to the stairs, I heard him call impatiently to the Count to come out of the library. "'What are you waiting there for?' he said. "'I want to speak to you.' and i want to think a little by myself replied the other wait till later possible wait till later 
neither he nor his friend said any more i gained the top of the stairs and ran along the passage in my haste and my agitation i left the door of the antechamber open but i closed the door of the bedroom the moment i was inside it laura was sitting alone at the far end of the room her arms resting wearily on the table and her face hidden in her hands she started up with a cry of delight when she saw me how did you get here she asked who gave you leave not sir percival in my overpowering anxiety to hear what she had to tell me i could not answer her i could only put questions on my side laura's eagerness to know what had passed downstairs proved however too strong to be resisted she persistently repeated her inquiries the count of course i answered impatiently whose influence in the house she stopped me with a gesture of disgust don't speak of him she cried the count is the vilest creature breathing the count is a miserable spy before we could either of us say another word we were alarmed by a soft knocking at the door of the bedroom i had not yet sat down and i went first to see who it was when i opened the door madame fosco confronted me with my handkerchief in her hand you dropped this downstairs miss halcombe she said and i thought i could bring it to you as i was passing by to my own room her face naturally pale had turned to such a ghastly whiteness that i started at the sight of it her hands so sure and steady at all other times trembled violently and her eyes looked wolfishly past me through the open door and fixed on laura she had been listening before she knocked i saw it in her white face i saw it in her trembling hands i saw it in her look at laura after waiting an instant she turned from me in silence and slowly walked away i closed the door again oh laura laura we shall both rue the day when you called the count a spy you would have called him so yourself marian if you had known what i know and catherick was right there was a third person watching us in the plantation yesterday and that third person are you sure it was the count i am absolutely certain he was sir percival's spy he was sir percival's informer he set sir percival watching and waiting all the morning through for anne catherick and for me is anne found did you see her at the lake no she has saved herself by keeping away from the place when i got to the boathouse no one was there yes yes i went in and sat waiting for a few minutes but my restlessness made me get up again to walk about a little as i passed out i saw some marks on the sand close under the front of the boathouse i stooped down to examine them and discovered a word written in large letters on the sand the word was look and you scraped away the sand and dug a hollow place in it how do you know that marian i saw the hollow place myself when i followed you to the boathouse go on go on yes i scraped away the sand on the surface and in a little while i came to a strip of paper hidden beneath which had writing on it the writing was signed with anne catherick's initials where is it sir percival has taken it from me can you remember what the writing was do you think you can repeat it to me in substance i can marian it was very short you would have remembered it word for word try to tell me what the substance was before we go any further she complied i write the lines down here exactly as she repeated them to me they ran thus i was seen with you yesterday by a tall stout old man and had to run to save myself he was not quick enough on his feet to follow me and he lost me among the trees i dare not risk coming back here to-day at the same time i write this and hide it in the sand at six in the morning to tell you so when we speak next of your wicked husband's secret we must speak safely or not at all try to have patience i promise you shall see me again and that soon a c the reference to the tall stout old man 
the terms of which Laura was certain that she had repeated to me correctly, left no doubt as to who the intruder had been. I called to mind that I had told Sir Percival, in the Count's presence the day before, that Laura had gone to the boat-house to look for her brooch. In all probability, he had followed her there, in his officious way, to relieve her mind about the matter of the signature, immediately after he had mentioned the change in Sir Percival's plans to me in the drawing-room. In this case, he could only have got to the neighbourhood of the boat-house at the very moment when Anne Catherick discovered him. The suspiciously hurried manner in which she parted from Laura had no doubt prompted his useless attempt to follow her. Of the conversation which had previously taken place between them, he could have heard nothing. The distance between the house and the lake, and the time at which he left me in the drawing-room, as compared with the time at which Laura and Anne Catherick had been speaking together, proved that fact to us at any rate beyond a doubt. Having arrived at something like a conclusion so far, my next great interest was to know what discovery Sir Percival had made after Count Fosco had given him his information. "'How came you to lose possession of the letter?' I asked. "'What did you do with it when you found it in the sand?' "'After reading it once through,' she replied, "'I took it into the boat-house with me to sit down and look over it a second time. "'While I was reading, a shadow fell across the paper. "'I looked up and saw Sir Percival standing in the doorway watching me. "'Did you try to hide the letter?' "'I tried, but he stopped me. "'You needn't trouble to hide that,' he said. "'I happen to have read it.' "'I could only look at him helplessly. "'I could say nothing.' "'You understand?' he went on. "'I have read it. "'I dug it up out of the sand two hours since, "'and buried it again, "'and wrote the word above it again, "'and left it ready to your hands. "'You can't lay yourself out of the scrape now. "'You saw Anne Catherick in secret yesterday, "'and you have got her letter in your hand at this moment. "'I have not caught her yet, but I have caught you. "'Give me the letter.' "'He stepped close up to me. "'I was alone with him, Marion.' "'What could I do? I gave him the letter.' "'What did he say when you gave it to him?' "'At first he said nothing. He took me by the arm, and led me out of the boat-house, and looked about him on all sides, as if he was afraid of our being seen or heard. Then he clasped his hand fast round my arm, and whispered to me, "'What did Anne Catherick say to you yesterday? I insist on hearing every word from first to last.' "'Did you tell him?' I was alone with him, Marion. His cruel hand was bruising my arm. What could I do? Is the mark on your arm still? Let me see it. Why do you want to see it? I want to see it, Laura, because our endurance must end, and our resistance must begin to-day. That mark is a weapon to strike him with. Let me see it now. I may have to swear to it at some future time. Oh, Marion, don't look so. Don't talk so. It doesn't hurt me now. Let me see it. She showed me the marks. I was past grieving over them, past crying over them, past shuddering over them. They say we are either better than men or worse. If the temptation that has fallen in some women's way, and made them worse, had fallen in mine at that moment. Thank God! My face betrayed nothing that his wife could read. The gentle, innocent, affectionate creature thought I was frightened for her and sorry for her, and thought no more. "'Don't think too seriously of it, Marion,' she said simply, as she pulled us deep down again. "'It doesn't hurt me now.' "'I will try to think quietly of it, my love, for your sake. Well, well. And you told him all that Anne Catherick had said to you, all that you told me?' "'Yes, all. He insisted on it. I was alone with him. I could conceal nothing. Did he say anything when you had done? He looked at me, and laughed to himself in a mocking, bitter way. I mean to have the rest out of you, he said. Do you hear the rest? I declared to him solemnly that I had told him everything I knew. Not you, he answered. You know more than you choose to tell. Won't you tell it? You shall. I'll wring it out of you at home, if I can't wring it out of you here. 
he led me away by a strange path through the plantation, a path where there was no hope of our meeting you, and he spoke no more till we came within sight of the house. Then he stopped again and said, Will you take a second chance if I give it to you? Will you think better of it and tell me the rest? I could only repeat the same words I had spoken before. He cursed my obstinacy and went on and took me with him to the house. You can't deceive me, he said. You know more than you choose to tell. I'll have your secret out of you, and I'll have it out of that sister of yours as well. There shall be no more plotting and whispering between you. Neither you nor she shall see each other again till you have confessed the truth. I'll have you watched morning, noon, and night till you confess the truth. He was deaf to everything I could say. He took me straight upstairs into my own room. Fanny was sitting there doing some work for me, and he instantly ordered her out. I'll take good care. You're not mixed up in the conspiracy, he said. You shall leave this house to-day. If your mistress wants a maid, she shall have one of my choosing. He pushed me into the room and locked the door on me. He set that senseless woman to watch me outside, Marion. He looked and spoke like a madman. You may hardly understand it. He did indeed. I do understand it, Laura. He is mad. Mad with the terrors of a guilty conscience. Every word you have said makes me positively certain that when Anne Catherick left you yesterday, you were on the eve of discovering a secret which might have been your vile husband's ruin, and he thinks you have discovered it. Nothing you can say or do will quiet that guilty distrust and convince his false nature of your truth. I don't say this, my love, to alarm you. I say it to open your eyes to your position, and to convince you of the urgent necessity of letting me act as I best can, for your protection while the chance is our own. Count Fosco's interference has secured me access to you to-day, but he may withdraw that interference to-morrow. Sir Percival has already dismissed Fanny because she is a quick-witted girl, and devotedly attached to you, and has chosen a woman to take her place who cares nothing for your interests, and whose dull intelligence lowers her to the level of the watchdog in the yard. It is impossible to say what violent measures he may take next, unless we make the most of our opportunities while we have them. What can we do, Marion? Oh, if we could only leave this house, never to see it again! Listen to me, my love and try to think that you are not quite helpless so long as I am here with you. I will think so. I do think so. Don't altogether forget poor Fanny in thinking of me. She wants help and comfort, too. I will not forget her. I saw her before I came up here, and I have arranged to communicate with her to-night. Letters are not safe in the post-bag at Blackwater Park, and I shall have two to write to-day in your interests, which must pass through no hands but Fanny's. What letters? I mean to write first, Laura, to Mr. Gilmore's partner, who has offered to help us in any fresh emergency. Little as I know of the law, I am certain that it can protect a woman from such treatment as that ruffian has inflicted on you to-day. I will go into no details about Anne Catherick, because I have no certain information to give. But the lawyer shall know of those bruises on your arm, and of the violence offered to you in this room, he shall, before I rest to-night. But think of the exposure, Marion. I am calculating on the exposure. Sir Percival has more to dread from it than you have. The prospect of an exposure may bring him to terms when nothing else will. I rose as I spoke, but Laura entreated me not to leave her. You will drive him to desperation, she said and increase our dangers tenfold. I felt the truth, the disheartening truth of those words, but I could not bring myself plainly to acknowledge it to her. In our dreadful position there was no help and no hope for us but in risking the worst. I said so in guarded terms. She sighed bitterly, but did not contest the matter. She only asked about the second letter that I had proposed writing. To whom was it to be addressed? To Mr. Fairley, I said. Your uncle is your nearest male relative and the head of the family. He must and shall interfere. 
Laura shook her head sorrowfully. Yes, yes, I went on. Your uncle is a weak, selfish, worldly man, I know. But he is not Sir Percival Glyde, and he has no such friend about him as Count Fosco. I expect nothing from his kindness or his tenderness of feeling towards you or towards me. But he will do anything to pamper his own indolence and to secure his own quiet. Let me only persuade him that his interference at this moment will save him inevitable trouble and wretchedness and responsibility hereafter, and he will bestir himself for his own sake. I know how to deal with him, Laura. I have had some practice. If you could only prevail on him to let me go back to Limeridge for a little while and stay there quietly with you, Marion, I could be almost as happy again as I was before I was married. Those words set me thinking in a new direction. Would it be possible to place Sir Percival between the two alternatives of either exposing himself to the scandal of legal interference on his wife's behalf, or of allowing her to be quietly separated from him for a time, under pretext of a visit to her uncle's house? And could he in that case be reckoned on as likely to accept the last resource? It was doubtful more than doubtful, and yet, hopeless as the experiment seemed, surely it was worth trying. I resolved to try it, in sheer despair of knowing what better to do. "'Your uncle shall know the wish you have just expressed,' I said, "'and I will ask the lawyer's advice on the subject as well. Good may come of it, and will come of it, I hope.' Saying that, I rose again and again Laura tried to make me resume my seat. "'Don't leave me,' she said uneasily. "'My desk is on that table. You can write here.' It tried me to the quick to refuse her, even in her own interests, but we had been too long shut up alone together already. Our chance of seeing each other again might entirely depend on our not exciting any fresh suspicions. It was full time to show myself, quietly and unconcernedly, among the wretches who were at that very moment, perhaps, thinking of us and talking of us downstairs. I explained the miserable necessity to Laura, and prevailed on her to recognise it as I did. "'I will come back again, love, in an hour or less,' I said. "'The worst is over for to-day. Keep yourself quiet, and fear nothing. "'Is the key in the door, Marion? Can I lock it on the inside?' Yes, here is the key. Lock the door, and open it to nobody, until I come upstairs again. I kissed her and left her. It was a relief to me, as I walked away, to hear the key turned in the lock, and to know that the door was at her own command. End of chapter 17《Chapter 18 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 8. June 19. I had only got as far as the top of the stairs when the locking of Laura's door suggested to me the precaution of also locking my own door and keeping the key safely about me while I was out of the room. My journal was already secured with other papers in the table drawer, but my writing materials were left out. These included a seal bearing the common device of two doves drinking out of the same cup, and some sheets of blotting paper, which had the impression on them of the closing lines of my writing in these pages traced during the past night. Distorted by the suspicion which had now become a part of myself, even such trifles as these looked too dangerous to be trusted without a guard. Even the locked table drawer seemed to me not sufficiently protected in my absence until the means of access to it had been carefully secured as well. I found no appearance of anyone having entered the room while I had been talking with Laura. My writing materials, which I had given the servant instructions never to meddle with, 
were scattered over the table much as usual. The only circumstance in connection with them that at all struck me was that the seal lay tidily in the tray with the pencils and the wax. It was not in my careless habits, I am sorry to say, to put it there, and neither did I remember putting it there. But as I could not call to mind, on the other hand, where else I had thrown it down, and as I was also doubtful whether I might not for once have laid it mechanically in the right place, I abstained from adding to the perplexity with which the day's events had filled my mind by troubling it afresh about a trifle. I locked the door, put the key in my pocket, and went downstairs. Madame Fosco was alone in the hall, looking at the weather-glass. "'Still falling,' she said. "'I am afraid we must expect more rain.' Her face was composed again, to its customary expression and its customary colour, but the hand with which she pointed to the dial of the weather-glass still trembled. Could she have told her husband already that she had overheard Laura reviling him in my company as a spy? My strong suspicion that she must have told him, my irresistible dread, all the more overpowering from its very vagueness, of the consequences which might follow, my fixed conviction derived from various little self-betrayals which women notice in each other, that Madame Fosco, in spite of her well-assumed external civility, had not forgiven her niece for innocently standing between her and the legacy of ten thousand pounds, all rushed upon my mind together, all impelled me to speak in the vain hope of using my own influence and my own powers of persuasion for the atonement of Laura's offence. May I trust to your kindness to excuse me, Madame Fosco, if I venture to speak to you on an exceedingly painful subject? She crossed her hands in front of her, and bowed her head solemnly, without uttering a word, and without taking her eyes off mine for a moment. When you were so good as to bring me back my handkerchief, I went on, I am very, very much afraid you must have accidentally heard Laura say something which I am unwilling to repeat and which I will not attempt to defend. I will only venture to hope that you have not thought it of sufficient importance to be mentioned to the Count. I think it of no importance whatever, said Madame Fosco, sharply and suddenly. But, she added, resuming her icy manner in a moment, I have no secrets from my husband, even in trifles. When he noticed just now that I looked distressed, it was my painful duty to tell him why I was distressed, and I frankly acknowledge to you, Miss Halcombe, that I have told him. I was prepared to hear it, and yet she turned me cold all over when she said those words. Let me earnestly entreat you, Madame Fosco, let me earnestly entreat the Count, to make some allowances for the sad position in which my sister is placed. She spoke while she was smarting under the insult and injustice inflicted on her by her husband, and she was not herself when she said those rash words. May I hope that they will be considerately and generously forgiven? Most assuredly, said the Count's quiet voice behind me. He had stolen on us with his noiseless tread and his book in his hand from the library. When Lady Glyde said those hasty words, he went on, she did me an injustice which I lament and forgive. Let us never return to the subject, Miss Halcombe. Let us all comfortably combine to forget it from this moment. You are very kind, I said. You relieve me inexpressibly. I tried to continue, but his eyes were on me. His deadly smile that hides everything was set hard and unwavering on his broad smooth face my distrust of his unfathomable falseness my sense of my own degradation in stooping to conciliate his wife and himself so disturbed and confused me that the next words failed on my lips and i stood there in silence i beg you on my knees to say no more miss halcombe i am truly shocked that you should have thought it necessary to say so much with that polite speech he took my hand. Oh, how I despise myself! Oh, how little comfort there is, even in knowing that I submitted to it for Laura's sake! He took my hand, 
and put it to his poisonous lips. Never did I know all my horror of him till then. That innocent familiarity turned my blood as if it had been the vilest insult that a man could offer me. Yet I hid my disgust from him. I tried to smile. I, who once mercilessly despised deceit in other women, was as false as the worst of them, as false as the Judas whose lips had touched my hand. I could not have maintained my degrading self-control. It is all that redeems me in my own estimation to know that I could not, if he had still continued to keep his eyes on my face. His wife's tigerish jealousy came to my rescue, and forced his attention away from me the moment he possessed himself of my hand. Her cold blue eyes caught light, her dull white cheeks flushed into bright colour. She looked years younger than her age in an instant. Count, she said, your foreign forms of politeness are not understood by English women. Pardon me, my angel, the best and dearest English woman in the world understands them. With those words, he dropped my hand, and quietly raised his wife's hand to his lips in place of it. I ran back up the stairs to take refuge in my own room. If there had been time to think, my thoughts when I was alone again would have caused me bitter suffering, but there was no time to think. Happily for the preservation of my calmness and my courage, there was time for nothing but action. The letters to the lawyer and to Mr. Fairley were still to be written, and I sat down at once, without a moment's hesitation, to devote myself to them. There was no multitude of resources to perplex me. There was absolutely no one to depend on in the first instance but myself. Sir Percival had neither friends nor relatives in the neighbourhood whose intercession I could attempt to employ. He was on the coldest terms, in some cases on the worst terms, with the families of his own rank and station, who lived near him. We two women had neither father nor brother to come to the house and take our parts. There was no choice but to write those two doubtful letters, or to put Laura in the wrong, and myself in the wrong, and to make all peaceable negotiation in the future impossible, by secretly escaping from Blackwater Park. Nothing but the most imminent personal peril could justify our taking that second course, the letters must be tried first, and I wrote them. I said nothing to the lawyer about Anne Catherick, because, as I had already hinted to Laura, that topic was connected with a mystery which we could not yet explain, and which it would therefore be useless to write about to a professional man. I left my correspondent to attribute Sir Percival's disgraceful conduct, if he pleased, to fresh disputes about money matters and simply consulted him on the possibility of taking legal proceedings for Laura's protection in the event of her husband's refusal to allow her to leave Blackwater Park for a time and return with me to Limeridge. I referred him to Mr. Fairley for the details of this last arrangement. I assured him that I wrote with Laura's authority, and I ended by entreating him to act in her name to the utmost extent of his power and with the least possible loss of time. The letter to Mr. Fairley occupied me next. I appealed to him on the terms which I had mentioned to Laura as the most likely to make him bestir himself. I enclosed a copy of my letter to the lawyer to show him how serious the case was, and I represented our removal to Limeridge as the only compromise which would prevent the danger and distress of Laura's present position from inevitably affecting her uncle as well as herself at no very distant time. When I had done, and had sealed and directed the two envelopes, I went back with the letters to Laura's room, to show her that they were written. "'Has anybody disturbed you?' I asked, when she opened the door to me. "'Nobody has knocked,' she replied, "'but I heard someone in the outer room. Was it a man or a woman? A woman. I heard the rustling of her gown.' A rustling like silk. Yes, like silk. Madame Fosco had evidently been watching outside. The mischief she might do by herself was little to be feared. 
but the mischief she might do, as a willing instrument in her husband's hands, was too formidable to be overlooked. What became of the rustling of the gown when you no longer heard it in the ante-room, I inquired? Did you hear it go past your wall along the passage? Yes, I kept still and listened, and just heard it. Which way did it go? Towards your room. I considered again. The sound had not caught my ears, but I was then deeply absorbed in my letters, and I write with a heavy hand and a quill pen, scraping and scratching noisily over the paper. It was more likely that Madame Flosco would hear the scraping of my pen than that I should hear the rustling of her dress. Another reason, if I had wanted one, for not trusting my letters to the post-bag in the hall. Laura saw me thinking. More difficulties, she said wearily. More difficulties and more dangers. No dangers, I replied. Some little difficulty, perhaps. I am thinking of the safest way of putting my two letters into Fanny's hands. You have really written them, then? Oh, Marian, run no risks. Pray, pray, run no risks. No, no, no fear. Let me see. What o'clock is it now? It was a quarter to six. There will be time for me to get to the village inn and to come back again before dinner. If I waited till the evening, I might find no second opportunity of safely leaving the house. Keep the key turned in the lock, Laura, I said, and don't be afraid about me. If you hear any inquiries made, call through the door and say that I am gone out for a walk. When shall you be back? Before dinner without fail. Courage, my love. By this time to-morrow you will have a clear-headed, trustworthy man acting for your good. Mr. Gilmore's partner is our next best friend to Mr. Gilmore himself. A moment's reflection, as soon as I was alone, convinced me that I had better not appear in my walking dress until I had first discovered what was going on in the lower part of the house. I had not ascertained yet whether Sir Percival was indoors or out. The singing of the canaries in the library, and the smell of tobacco smoke that came through the door, which was not closed, told me at once where the Count was. I looked over my shoulder as I passed the doorway, and saw, to my surprise, that he was exhibiting the docility of the birds in his most engagingly polite manner to the housekeeper. He must have specially invited her to see them, for she would never have thought of going into the library of her own accord. The man's slightest actions had a purpose of some kind at the bottom of every one of them. What could be his purpose here? It was no time, then, to inquire into his motives. I looked about for Madame Fosco next, and found her following her favourite circle round and round the fish-pond. I was a little doubtful how she would meet me, after the outbreak of jealousy of which I had been the cause so short a time since. But her husband had tamed her in the interval, and she now spoke to me with the same civility as usual. My only object in addressing myself to her was to ascertain if she knew what had become of Sir Percival. I contrived to refer to him indirectly, and after a little fencing on either side, she at last mentioned that he had gone out. "'Which of the horses has he taken?' I asked carelessly. "'None of them,' she replied. "'He went away two hours since on foot. "'As I understood it, his object was to make fresh inquiries "'about the woman named Anne Catherick. "'He appears to be unreasonably anxious about tracing her. "'Do you happen to know if she is dangerously mad, Miss Halcombe?' "'I do not, Countess. Are you going in?' "'Yes, I think so.' I suppose it will soon be time to dress for dinner. We entered the house together. Madame Fosco strolled into the library and closed the door. I went at once to fetch my hat and shawl. Every moment was of importance, if I was to get to Fanny at the inn and be back before dinner. When I crossed the hall again, no one was there, and the singing of the birds in the library had ceased. I could not stop to make any fresh investigations. I could only assure myself that the way was clear, and then leave the house with the two letters safe in my pocket. On my way to the village, I prepared myself for the possibility of meeting Sir Percival. As long as I had him to deal with alone, 
I felt certain of not losing my presence of mind. Any woman who is sure of her own wits is a match at any time for a man who is not sure of his own temper. I had no such fear of Sir Percival as I had of the Count. Instead of fluttering, it had composed me to hear of the errand on which he had gone out. While the tracing of Anne Catherick was the great anxiety that occupied him, Laura and I might hope for some cessation of any active persecution at his hands. For our sakes, now, as well as for Anne's, I hoped and prayed fervently that she might still escape him. I walked on as briskly as the heat would let me, till I reached the crossroad which led to the village, looking back from time to time to make sure that I was not followed by any one. Nothing was behind me all the way but an empty country wagon. The noise made by the lumbering wheels annoyed me, and when I found that the wagon took the road to the village as well as myself, I stopped to let it go by and pass out of hearing. As I looked toward it, more attentively than before, I thought I detected at intervals the feet of a man walking close behind it, the carter being in front by the side of the horses. The part of the cross-road which I had just passed over was so narrow that the wagon coming after me brushed the trees and thickets on either side, and I had to wait until it went by before I could test the correctness of my impression. Apparently that impression was wrong, for when the wagon had passed me the road behind it was quite clear. I reached the inn without meeting Sir Percival, and without noticing anything more, and was glad to find that the landlady had received Fanny with all possible kindness. The girl had a little parlour to sit in, away from the noise of the tap-room, and a clean bedchamber at the top of the house. She began crying again at the sight of me, and said, poor soul, truly enough, that it was dreadful to feel herself turned out into the world, as if she had committed some unpardonable fault, when no blame could be laid at her door by anybody, not even by her master who had sent her away. "'Try to make the best of it, Fanny,' I said. "'Your mistress and I will stand your friends, and will take care that your character shall not suffer. Now listen to me. I have very little time to spare, and I am going to put a great trust in your hands. I wish you to take care of these two letters. The one with the stamp on it you are to put into the post when you reach London to-morrow.' The other, directed to Mr. Fairley, you are to deliver to him yourself as soon as you get home. Keep both the letters about you, and give them up to no one. They are of the last importance to your mistress's interests. Fanny put the letters into the bosom of her dress. There they shall stop, miss, she said, till I have done what you tell me. Mind you are at the station in good time to-morrow morning, I continued and when you see the housekeeper at Limeridge, give her my compliments, and say that you are in my service until Lady Glyde is able to take you back. We may meet again sooner than you think. So keep a good heart, and don't miss the seven o'clock train. Thank you, miss, thank you kindly. It gives me courage to hear your voice again. Please to offer my duty to my lady, and say I left all the things as tidy as I could in the time. Oh, dear, dear! Who will dress her for dinner to-day? It really breaks my heart, miss, to think of it. When I got back to the house, I had only a quarter of an hour to spare to put myself in order for dinner, and to say two words to Laura before I went downstairs. The letters are in Fanny's hands, I whispered to her at the door. Do you mean to join us at dinner? Oh, no, no, not for the world. Has anything happened? Has anyone disturbed you? "'Yes, just now, Sir Percival. Did he come in?' "'No. He frightened me by a thump on the door outside. I said, "'Who's there?' "'You know,' he answered. "'Will you alter your mind and tell me the rest? You shall. Sooner or later I'll wring it out of you. You know where Anne Catherick is at this moment.' "'Indeed, indeed, I said I don't. You do,' he called back. "'I'll crush your obstinacy. Mind that. I'll wring it out of you.' He went away with those words went away, Marion, hardly five minutes ago. He had not found Anne. We were safe for that night. He had not found her yet. You are going downstairs, Marion. Come up again in the evening. Yes, yes. Don't be uneasy if I am a little late. 
I must be careful not to give offence by leaving them too soon. The dinner bell rang, and I hastened away. Sir Percival took Madame Fosco into the dining room, and the Count gave me his arm. He was hot and flushed, and was not dressed with his customary care and completeness. Had he too been out before dinner, and been late in getting back? Or was he only suffering from the heat a little more severely than usual? However this might be, he was unquestionably troubled by some secret annoyance or anxiety, which, with all his powers of deception, he was not able entirely to conceal. Through the whole of dinner he was almost as silent as Sir Percival himself, and he, every now and then, looked at his wife with an expression of furtive uneasiness which was quite new in my experience of him. The one social obligation which he seemed to be self-possessed enough to perform as carefully as ever was the obligation of being persistently civil and attentive to me. What vile object he has in view I cannot still discover, but be the design what it may, invariable politeness towards myself, invariable humility towards Laura, and invariable suppression at any cost of Sir Percival's clumsy violence, have been the means he has resolutely and impenetrably used to get to his end ever since he set foot in this house. I suspected it when he first interfered in our favour on the day when the deed was produced in the library, and I feel certain of it now. When Madame Fosco and I rose to leave the table, the Count rose also to accompany us back to the drawing-room. "'What are you going away for?' asked Sir Percival. "'I mean you, Fosco.' "'I am going away because I have had dinner enough and wine enough,' answered the Count. "'Be so kind, Percival, as to make allowances for my foreign habit of going out with the ladies as well as coming in with them.' "'Nonsense! Another glass of claret won't hurt you. Sit down again like an Englishman.' I want half an hour's quiet talk with you over our wine. A quiet talk, Percival, with all my heart. But not now, and not over the wine. Later in the evening, if you please. Later in the evening. Sybil, said Sir Percival savagely. Sybil, behaviour upon my soul to a man in his own house. I had more than once seen him look at the Count uneasily during dinner time, and had observed that the Count carefully abstained from looking at him in return. This circumstance, coupled with the host's anxiety for a little quiet talk over the wine, and the guest's obstinate resolution not to sit down again at the table, revived in my memory the request which Sir Percival had vainly addressed to his friend earlier in the day, to come out of the library and speak to him. The Count had deferred granting that private interview when it was first asked for in the afternoon, and had again deferred granting it when it was a second time asked for at the dinner-table. Whatever the coming subject of discussion between them might be, it was clearly an important subject in Sir Percival's estimation, and perhaps, judging from his evident reluctance to approach it, a dangerous subject as well, in the estimation of the Count. These considerations occurred to me while we were passing from the dining-room to the drawing-room, Sir Percival's angry commentary on his friend's desertion of him had not produced the slightest effect. The Count obstinately accompanied us to the tea-table, waited a minute or two in the room, went out into the hall, and returned with the post-bag in his hands. It was then eight o'clock, the hour at which the letters were always dispatched from Blackwater Park. "'Have you any letters for the post, Miss Halcombe? he asked, approaching me with the bag. I saw Madame Fosco, who was making the tea, pause with the sugar-tongs in her hand, to listen for my answer. No, Count, thank you, no letters to-day. He gave the bag to the servant, who was then in the room, sat down at the piano, and played the air of the lively Neapolitan street-song, La Mia Carolina, twice over. His wife, who was usually the most deliberate of women in all her movements, made the tea as quickly as I could have made it myself, finished her own cup in two minutes, and quietly glided out of the room. I rose to follow her example, partly because I suspected her of attempting some treachery upstairs with Laura, 
partly because I was resolved not to remain alone in the same room with her husband. Before I could get to the door, the Count stopped me, by a request for a cup of tea. I gave him the cup of tea, and tried a second time to get away. He stopped me again, this time by going back to the piano, and suddenly appealing to me on a musical question, in which he declared that the honour of his country was concerned. I vainly pleaded my own total ignorance of music, and total want of taste in that direction. He only appealed to me again, with a vehemence which set all further protest on my part at defiance. The English and the Germans, he indignantly declared, were always reviling the Italians for their inability to cultivate the higher kinds of music. We were perpetually talking of our oratorios, and they were perpetually talking of their symphonies. Did we forget, and did they forget, his immortal friend and countryman Rossini, what was Moses in Egypt but a sublime oratorio, which was acted on the stage, instead of being coldly sung in a concert-room? What was the overture to William Tell but a symphony under another name? Had I heard Moses in Egypt? Would I listen to this, and this, and this, and say if anything more sublimely sacred and grand had ever been composed by mortal man? And without waiting for a word of assent or dissent on my part, looking me hard in the face all the time, he began thundering on the piano, and singing to it with loud and lofty enthusiasm, only interrupting himself at intervals to announce to me fiercely the titles of the different pieces of music. Chorus of Egyptians in the Plague of Darkness, Miss Harkham. Recitativo of Moses with the Tables of the Law. Prayer of Israelites at the Passage of the Red Sea. Ah, 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 ah. Is that sacred? Is that sublime? The piano trembled under his powerful hands, and the teacups on the table rattled as his big bass voice thundered out the notes, and his heavy foot beat time on the floor. There was something horrible, something fierce and devilish, in the outburst of his delight at his own singing and playing, and in the triumph with which he watched its effect upon me, as I shrank nearer and nearer to the door. I was released at last, not by my own efforts, but by Sir Percival's interposition. He opened the dining-room door, and called out angrily to know what that infernal noise meant. The Count instantly got up from the piano. Ah, if Percival is coming, he said, harmony and melody are both at an end. The muse of music, Miss Halcombe, deserts us in dismay, and I, the fat old minstrel, exhale the rest of my enthusiasm in the open air. He stalked out into the veranda, put his hands in his pockets, and resumed the recitativo of Moses sotto voce in the garden. I heard Sir Percival call after him from the dining-room window, but he took no notice. He seemed determined not to hear. That long-deferred quiet talk between them was still to be put off, was still to wait for the Count's absolute will and pleasure. He had detained me in the drawing-room nearly half an hour from the time when his wife left us. Where had she been, and what had she been doing in that interval? I went upstairs to ascertain, but I made no discoveries, and when I questioned Laura, I found that she had not heard anything. Nobody had disturbed her. No faint rustling of the silk dress had been audible, either in the ante-room or in the passage. It was then twenty minutes to nine. After going to my room to get my journal, I returned and sat with Laura, sometimes writing, sometimes stopping to talk with her. Nobody came near us, and nothing happened. We remained together till ten o'clock. I then rose, said my last cheering words, and wished her good night. She locked her door again, after we had arranged that I should come in and see her the first thing in the morning. I had a few sentences more to add to my diary before going to bed myself and as I went down again to the drawing-room, after leaving Laura for the last time that weary day, I resolved merely to show myself there, to make my excuses, and then to retire an hour earlier than usual for the night. Sir Percival and the Count and his wife 
were sitting together. Sir Percival was yawning in an easy chair, the Count was reading, Madame Fosco was fanning herself. Strange to say, her face was flushed now. She, who never suffered from the heat, was most undoubtedly suffering from it to-night. "'I am afraid, Countess, you are not quite so well as usual,' I said. "'The very remark I was about to make to you,' she replied. "'You are looking pale, my dear.' "'My dear, it was the first time she had ever addressed me with that familiarity. There was an insolent smile, too, on her face when she said the words. "'I am suffering from one of my bad headaches,' I answered coldly. "'Ah, indeed, want of exercise, I suppose. A walk before dinner would have been just the thing for you.' She referred to the walk with a strange emphasis. Had she seen me go out? No matter if she had. The letters were safe now in Fanny's hands. "'Come and have a smoke, Fosco,' said Sir Percival, rising with another uneasy look at his friend. "'With pleasure, Percival, when the ladies have gone to bed,' replied the Count. "'Excuse me, Countess, if I set you the example of retiring,' I said. "'The only remedy for such a headache as mine is going to bed.' I took my leave. There was the same insolent smile on the woman's face when I shook hands with her. Sir Percival paid no attention to me. He was looking impatiently at Madame Fosco, who showed no signs of leaving the room with me. The Count smiled to himself behind his book. There was yet another delay to that quiet talk with Sir Percival, and the Countess was the impediment this time. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 9. June 19th. Once safely shut into my own room, I opened these pages and prepared to go on with that part of the day's record which was still left to write. For ten minutes or more I sat idle, with the pen in my hand, thinking over the events of the last twelve hours. When I at last addressed myself to my task, I found a difficulty in proceeding with it, which I had never experienced before. In spite of my efforts to fix my thoughts on the matter in hand, they wandered away with the strangest persistency in the one direction of Sir Percival and the Count, and all the interest which I tried to concentrate on my journal centred instead in that private interview between them which had been put off all through the day and which was now to take place in the silence and solitude of the night in this perverse state of my mind the recollection of what had passed since the morning would not come back to me and there was no resource but to close my journal and to get away from it for a little while i opened the door which led from my bedroom into my sitting-room and having passed through pulled it to again, to prevent any accident in case of draught with the candle left on the dressing-table. My sitting-room window was wide open, and I leaned out listlessly to look at the night. It was dark and quiet. Neither moon nor stars were visible. There was a smell like rain in the still heavy air, and I put my hand out of window. No, the rain was only threatening. It had not come yet. I remained leaning on the window-sill for nearly a quarter of an hour, looking out absently into the black darkness, and hearing nothing except now and then the voices of the servants, or the distant sound of a closing door in the lower part of the house. Just as I was turning away wearily from the window to go back to the bedroom and make a second attempt to complete the unfinished entry in my journal, I smelt the odour of tobacco smoke stealing towards me on the heavy night air. The next moment I saw a tiny red spark advancing from the farther end of the house in the pitch darkness. I heard no footsteps, and I could see nothing but the spark. 
It travelled along in the night, past the window at which I was standing, and stopped opposite my bedroom window, inside which I had left the light burning on the dressing-table. The spark remained stationary for a moment, then moved back again in the direction from which it had advanced. As I followed its progress, I saw a second red spark, larger than the first, approaching from the distance. The two met together in the darkness. Remembering who smoked cigarettes and who smoked cigars, I inferred immediately that the Count had come out first to look and listen under my window, and that Sir Percival had afterwards joined him. They must both have been walking on the lawn, or I should certainly have heard Sir Percival's heavy footfall, though the Count's soft step might have escaped me even on the gravel walk. I waited quietly at the window, certain that they could neither of them see me in the darkness of the room. "'What's the matter?' I heard Sir Percival say in a low voice. "'Why don't you come in and sit down?' "'I want to see the light out of that window,' replied the Count softly. "'What harm does the light do? "'It shows she is not in bed yet. She is sharp enough to suspect something, and bold enough to come downstairs and listen, if she can get the chance. Patience, Percival, patience, humbug. You're always talking of patience. I shall talk of something else presently. My good friend, you are on the edge of your domestic precipice, and if I let you give the women one other chance, on my sacred word of honour, they will put you over it. What the devil do you mean? We will come to our explanations, Percival, when the light is out of that window, and when I have had one little look at the rooms on each side of the library, and the peep at the staircase as well. They slowly moved away, and the rest of the conversation between them, which had been conducted throughout in the same low tones, ceased to be audible. It was no matter. I had heard enough to determine me on justifying the Count's opinion of my sharpness and my courage. Before the red sparks were out of sight in the darkness, I had made up my mind that there should be a listener when those two men sat down to their talk, and that the listener, in spite of all the Count's precautions to the contrary, should be myself. I wanted but one motive to sanction the act to my own conscience, and to give me courage enough for performing it, and that motive I had. Laura's honour, Laura's happiness, Laura's life itself, might depend on my quick ears and my faithful memory to-night. I had heard the Count say that he meant to examine the rooms on each side of the library and the staircase as well before he entered on any explanation with Sir Percival. This expression of his intentions was necessarily sufficient to inform me that the library was the room in which he proposed that the conversation should take place. The one moment of time which was long enough to bring me to that conclusion was also the moment which showed me a means of baffling his precautions, or, in other words, of hearing what he and Sir Percival said to each other, without the risk of descending at all into the lower regions of the house. In speaking of the rooms on the ground floor, I have mentioned, incidentally, the veranda outside them, on which they all open by means of French windows, extending from the cornice to the floor. The top of this veranda was flat, the rain-water being carried off from it by pipes into tanks, which helped to supply the house. On the narrow leaden roof, which ran along past the bedrooms, and which was rather less, I should think, than three feet below the sills of the window, a row of flower-pots was ranged, with wide intervals between each pot, the whole being protected from falling in high winds by an ornamental iron railing along the edge of the roof. The plan which had now occurred to me was to get out of my sitting-room window on to this roof, to creep along noiselessly till I reached that part of it which was immediately over the library window, and to crouch down between the flower-pots with my ear against the outer railing. 
if Sir Percival and the Count sat and smoked to-night, as I had seen them sitting and smoking many nights before, with their chairs close at the open window, and their feet stretched on the zinc garden seats which were placed under the veranda. Every word they said to each other above a whisper, and no long conversation, as we all know by experience, can be carried on in a whisper, must inevitably reach my ears. If, on the other hand, they chose to-night to sit far back inside the room, then the chances were that I should hear little or nothing, and in that case I must run the far more serious risk of trying to outwit them downstairs. Strongly as I was fortified in my resolution by the desperate nature of our situation, I hoped most fervently that I might escape this last emergency. My courage was only a woman's courage after all, and it was very near to failing me when I thought of trusting myself on the ground floor at the dead of night, within reach of Sir Percival and the Count. I went softly back to my bedroom, to try the safer experiment of the veranda roof first. A complete change in my dress was imperatively necessary for many reasons. I took off my silk gown to begin with, because the slightest noise from it on that still night might have betrayed me. I next removed the white and cumbersome parts of my underclothing, and replaced them by a petticoat of dark flannel. Over this I put my black travelling cloak, and pulled the hood on to my head. In my ordinary evening costume I took up the room of three men at least. In my present dress, when it was held close about me, no man could have passed through the narrowest space more easily than I. The little breadth left on the roof of the veranda, between the flower-pots on one side, and the wall and the windows of the house on the other, made this a serious consideration. If I knocked anything down, if I made the least noise, who could say what the consequences might be? I only waited to put the matches near the candle before I extinguished it, and groped my way back into the sitting-room. I locked that door as I had locked my bedroom door, then quietly got out of the window, and cautiously set my feet on the leaden roof of the veranda. My two rooms were at the inner extremity of the new wing of the house in which we all lived, and I had five windows to pass before I could reach the position it was necessary to take up immediately over the library. The first window belonged to a spare room which was empty. The second and third windows belonged to Laura's room. The fourth window belonged to Sir Percival's room. The fifth belonged to the Countess's room. The others, by which it was not necessary for me to pass, were the windows of the Count's dressing-room, of the bathroom, and of the second empty spare room. No sound reached my ears. The black, blinding darkness of the night was all round me when I first stood on the veranda, except at that part of it which Madame Fosco's window overlooked. There, at the very place above the library to which my course was directed, there I saw a gleam of light. The Countess was not yet in bed. It was too late to draw back. It was no time to wait. I determined to go on at all hazards, and trust for security to my own caution and to the darkness of the night, for Laura's sake, I thought to myself, as I took the first step forward on the roof, with one hand holding my cloak close round me, and the other groping against the wall of the house. It was better to brush close by the wall than to risk striking my feet against the flower-pots within a few inches of me on the other side. I passed the dark window of the spare room, trying the leaden roof at each step with my foot, before I risked resting my weight on it. I passed the dark windows of Laura's room. God bless her and keep her to-night. I passed the dark window of Sir Percival's room. Then I waited a moment, knelt down with my hands to support me, and so crept to my position, under the protection of the low wall, between the bottom of the lighted window and the veranda roof. 
when I ventured to look up at the window itself, I found that the top of it only was open, and that the blind inside was drawn down. While I was looking, I saw the shadow of Madame Fosco pass across the white field of the blind, then pass slowly back again. Thus far she could not have heard me, or the shadow would surely have stopped at the blind, even if she had wanted courage enough to open the window and look out. I placed myself sideways against the railing of the veranda, first ascertaining by touching them the position of the flower-pots on either side of me. There was room enough for me to sit between them and no more. The sweet-scented leaves of the flower on my left hand just brushed my cheek as I lightly rested my head against the railing. The first sounds that reached me from below were caused by the opening or closing, most probably the latter, of three doors in succession. The doors, no doubt, leading into the hall and into the rooms on each side of the library, which the Count had pledged himself to examine. The first object that I saw was the red spark again travelling out into the night from under the veranda, moving away towards my window, waiting a moment, and then returning to the place from which it had set out. "'The devil take your restlessness! When do you mean to sit down?' growled Sir Percival's voice beneath me. "'Oh, how hot it is!' said the Count, sighing and puffing wearily. His exclamation was followed by the scraping of the garden chairs on the tile pavement under the veranda, the welcome sound, which told me they were going to sit close at the window as usual. So far the chance was mine. The clock in the turret struck the quarter to twelve as they settled themselves in their chairs. I heard Madame Fosco through the open window yawning, and saw her shadow pass once more across the white field of the blind. Meanwhile, Sir Percival and the Count began talking together below, now and then dropping their voices a little lower than usual, but never sinking them to a whisper. The strangeness and peril of my situation, the dread which I could not master, of Madame Fosco's lighted window, made it difficult, almost impossible for me at first, to keep my presence of mind, and to fix my attention solely on the conversation beneath. For some minutes I could only succeed in gathering the general substance of it. I understood the Count to say that the one window alight was his wife's, that the ground floor of the house was quite clear, and that they might now speak to each other without fear of accident. Sir Percival merely answered by upbraiding his friend with having unjustifiably slighted his wishes and neglected his interests all through the day. The Count thereupon defended himself by declaring that he had been beset by certain troubles and anxieties which had absorbed all his attention, and that the only safe time to come to an explanation was a time when they could feel certain of being neither interrupted nor overheard. "'We are at a serious crisis in our affairs, Percival,' he said, "'and if we are to decide on the future at all, "'we must decide secretly to-night.' "'That sentence of the Count's was the first "'which my attention was ready enough to master "'exactly as it was spoken. "'From this point, with certain breaks and interruptions, "'my whole interest fixed breathlessly on the conversation, "'and I followed it word for word.' Crisis, repeated Sir Percival. It's a worse crisis than you think, for I can tell you. So I should suppose, from your behaviour for the last day or two, returned the other coolly. But wait a little, before we advance to what I do not know. Let us be quite certain of what I do know. Let us first see if I am right about the time that is past, before I make any proposal to you for the time that is to come. Stop till I get the brandy and water. Have some yourself. Thank you, Percival. The cold water with pleasure, a spoon and the basin of sugar. Oh, sucre, my friend, nothing more. Sugar and water for a man of your age. There, mix your sickly mess. You foreigners are all alike. Now listen, Percival. 
I will put our position plainly before you as I understand it, and you shall say if I am right or wrong. You and I both came back to this house from the continent with our affairs very seriously embarrassed. Cut it short. I wanted some thousands, and you some hundreds, and without the money we were both in a fair way to go to the dogs together. There's the situation. Make what you can of it. Go on. Well, Percival, in your own solid English words, you wanted some thousands, and I wanted some hundreds, and the only way of getting them was for you to raise the money for your own necessity, with a small margin beyond, for my poor little hundreds, by the help of your wife. What did I tell you about your wife on our way to England? And what did I tell you again when we had come here, and when I had seen for myself the sort of woman Miss Halcombe was? How should I know? You talked nineteen to the dozen, I suppose, just as usual. I said this. Human ingenuity, my friend, has hitherto only discovered two ways in which a man can manage a woman. One way is to knock her down a method largely adopted by the brutal lower orders of the people, but utterly abhorrent to the refined and educated classes above them. The other way, much longer, much more difficult, but in the end not less certain, is never to accept a provocation at a woman's hands. It holds with animals, it holds with children, and it holds with women who are nothing but children grown up. Quiet resolution is the one quality the animals, the children, and the women all fail in. If they can only shake this superior quality in their master, they get the better of him. If they can never succeed in disturbing it, he gets the better of them. I said to you, remember that plain truth when you want your wife to help you to the money. I said, remember it doubly and trebly, in the presence of your wife's sister, Miss Halcombe. Have you remembered it? Not once, in all the implications that have twisted themselves about us in this house. Every provocation that your wife and her sister could offer to you, you instantly accepted from them. Your mad temper lost the signature to the deed, lost the ready money, set Miss Halcombe, writing to the lawyer for the first time. First time? Has she written again? Yes, she has written again today. A chair fell on the pavement of the veranda, fell with a crash, as if it had been kicked down. It was well for me that the Count's revelation roused Sir Percival's anger as it did. On hearing that I had been once more discovered, I started so that the railing against which I leaned cracked again. Had he followed me to the inn? Did he infer that I must have given my letters to Fanny when I told him I had none for the post-bag? Even if it was so, how could he have examined the letters when they had gone straight from my hand to the bosom of the girl's dress? Thank your lucky star, I heard the Count say next, that you have me in the house to undo the harm as fast as you do it. Thank your lucky star that I said no, when you were mad enough to talk of turning the key to-day on Miss Halcombe, as you turned it in your mischievous folly on your wife. Where are your eyes? Can you look at Miss Halcombe, and not see that she has the foresight and the resolution of a man? With that woman for my friend, I would snap these fingers of mine at the world. With that woman for my enemy, I, with all my brains and experience, I, Fosco, cunning as the devil himself, as you have told me a hundred times, I walk, in your English phrase, upon eggshells, and this grand creature, I drink the health in my sugar and water, this grand creature, who stands in the strength of our love and our courage firm as a rock, between us two, and that poor, flimsy, pretty blonde wife of yours, this magnificent woman, whom I admire with all my soul, though I oppose her in your interests and in mine, who try to extremities, as if she was no sharper and no bolder than the rest of her sex. Percival, Percival, you deserve to fail, 
and you have failed. There was a pause. I write the villain's words about myself, because I mean to remember them, because I hope yet for the day when I may speak out once for all in his presence, and cast them back one by one in his teeth. Sir Percival was the first to break the silence again. Yes, yes, bully and bluster as much as you like, he said sulkily. The difficulty about the money is not the only difficulty. You would be for taking strong measures with the women yourself if you knew as much as I do. We will come to that second difficulty all in good time, rejoined the Count. You may confuse yourself, Percival, as much as you please, but you shall not confuse me. Let the question of the money be settled first. Have I convinced your obstinacy? Have I shown you that your temper will not let you help yourself? Or must I go back and, as you put it in your dear straightforward English, bully and bluster a little more? Pooh! It's easy enough to grumble at me. Say what is to be done. That's a little harder. Is it? Bah! This is what is to be done. You give up all direction in the business from tonight. You leave it for the future in my hands only. I am talking to a practical British man, Hat. Well, practical. Will that do for you? What do you propose if I leave it all to you? Answer me first. Is it to be in my hands or not? Say it is in your hands. What then? A few questions, Percival, to begin with. I must wait a little yet to let circumstances guide me, and I must know in every possible way what those circumstances are likely to be. There is no time to lose. I have told you already that Miss Halcombe has written to the lawyer today for the second time. How did you find it out? What did she say? If I told you, Percival, we should only come back at the end to where we are now. Enough that I have found it out and the finding has caused that trouble and anxiety which made me so inaccessible to you all through today. Now, to refresh my memory about your affairs, it is some time since I talked them over with you. The money has been raised, in the absence of your wife's signature, by means of bills at three months, raised at a cost that makes my poverty-stricken foreign hair stand on end to think of it, when the bills are due, is there really and truly no earthly way of paying them but by the help of your wife? None. What? You have no money at the bankers? A few hundreds, when I want as many thousands. Have you no other security to borrow upon? Not a shred. What have you actually got with your wife at the present moment? Nothing but the interest of her twenty thousand pounds barely enough to pay our daily expenses. What do you expect from your wife? Three thousand a year when her uncle dies. A fine fortune, Percival. What sort of a man is this uncle? Old? No, neither old nor young. A good-tempered, freely living man. Married? No, I think my wife told me not married. Of course not. If he was married and had a son... Lady Glyde would not be next heir to the property. I'll tell you what he is. He's a maudlin, twaddling, selfish fool, and bores everybody who comes near him about the state of his health. Men of that sort, Percival, live long and marry malevolently when you least expect it. I don't give you much, my friend, for your chance of the three thousand a year. Is there nothing more that comes to you from your wife? Nothing. Absolutely nothing? Absolutely nothing, except in case of her debt. Aha! In the case of her debt. There was another pause. The Count moved from the veranda to the gravel walk outside. I knew that he had moved by his voice. The rain has come at last, I heard him say. It had come. The state of my cloak showed that it had been falling thickly for some little time. The Count went back under the veranda. I heard the chair creak beneath his weight as he sat down in it again. Well, Percival, he said, and in the case of Lady Glyde's death, 
what do you get then if she leaves no children which she is likely to do which she is not in the least likely to do yes why then i get her twenty thousand pounds paid down paid down they were silent once more as their voices ceased madame fosco's shadow darkened the blind again instead of passing this time it remained for a moment quite still i saw her fingers steal round the corner of the blind and draw it on one side the dim white outline of her face looking out straight over me appeared behind the window i kept still shrouded from head to foot in my black cloak the rain which was fast wetting me tripped over the glass blurred it and prevented her from seeing anything more rain i heard her say to herself she dropped the blind and i breathed again freely the talk went on below me the count resuming it this time percival do you care about your wife fosco that's rather a downright question i am a downright man and i repeat it why the devil do you look at me in that way you won't answer me well then let us say your wife dies before the summer is out drop it fosco let us say your wife dies drop it i tell you in that case you would gain twenty thousand pounds and you would lose i should lose the chance of three thousand a year the remote chance percival the remote chance only and you want money at once in your position the gain is certain the loss doubtful speak for yourself as well as for me some of the money i want has been borrowed for you and if you come to gain my wife's death will be ten thousand pounds in your wife's pocket sharp as you are you seem to have conveniently forgotten madame fosco's legacy don't look at me in that way i won't have it what with your looks and your questions upon my soul you make my flesh creep your flesh does flesh mean conscience in english i speak of your wife's death as i speak of a possibility why not the respectable lawyers who scribble scrabble your deeds and your wills look the death of living people in the face do lawyers make your flesh creep why should i it is my business to-night to clear up your position beyond the possibility of mistake and i have now done it here is your position if your wife lives you pay those bills with her signature to the parchment if your wife dies you pay them with her death as he spoke the light in madame fosco's room was extinguished and the whole second floor of the house was now sunk in darkness talk talk grumbled sir percival one would think to hear you that my wife's signature to the deed was got already you have left the matter in my hands retorted the count and i have more than two months before me to turn round in say no more about it if you please for the present when the bills are due you will see for yourself if my talk talk is worth something or if it is not and now percival having done with the money matters for to-night i can place my attention at your disposal if you wish to consult me on that second difficulty which has mixed itself up with our little embarrassments and which has so altered you for the worse that i hardly know you again speak my friend and pardon me if i shock your fiery national tastes by mixing myself a second glass of sugar and water it's very well to say speak replied sir percival in a far more quiet and more polite tone than he had yet adopted but it's not so easy to know how to begin shall i help you suggested the count shall i give this private difficulty of yours a name what if i call it anne catherick look here fosco you and i have known each other for a long time and if you have helped me out of one or two scrapes before this i have done the best i could to help you in return as far as money would go we have made as many friendly sacrifices on both sides as men could but we have had our secrets from each other of course haven't we 
you have had a secret from me percival there is a skeleton in your cupboard here at blackwater park that has peeped out in these last few days at other people besides yourself well suppose it has if it doesn't concern you you needn't be curious about it need you do i look curious about it yes you do so so my face speaks the truth then what an immense foundation of good there must be in the nature of a man who arrives at my age and whose face has not yet lost the habit of speaking the truth come glide let us be candid one with the other this secret of yours has sought me i have not sought it let us say i am curious do you ask me as your old friend to respect your secret and to leave it once for all in your own keeping yes that's just what i do ask then my curiosity is at an end it dies in me from this moment do you really mean that what makes you doubt me i have had some experience bosco of your roundabout ways and i am not so sure that you won't worm it out of me after all the chair below suddenly creaked again i felt the trellis work pillar under me shake from top to bottom the count had started to his feet and had struck it with his hand in indignation possible possible he cried passionately do you know me no better than that has all your experience shown you nothing of my character yet i am a man of the antique type i am capable of the most exalted acts of virtue when i have the chance of performing them it has been the misfortune of my life that i have had few chances my conception of friendship is sublime is it my fault that your skeleton has peeped out at me why do i confess my curiosity you poor superficial englishman it is to magnify my own self-control i could draw your secret out of you if i liked as i draw this finger out of the palm of my hand you know i could but you have appealed to my friendship and the duties of friendship are sacred to me see i trample my base curiosity under my feet my exalted sentiments lift me above it recognize them percival imitate them percival shake hand i forgive you his voice faltered over the last words faltered as if he were actually shedding tears sir percival confusedly attempted to excuse himself but the count was too magnanimous to listen to him no he said when my friend has wounded me i can pardon him without apologies tell me in plain words do you want my help yes badly enough and you can ask for it without compromising yourself i can try at any rate try then well this is how it stands i told you to-day that I had done my best to find Anne Catherick and failed. Yes, you did. Fosco, I'm a lost man if I don't find her. Ha! Is it so serious as that? A little stream of light travelled out under the veranda and fell over the gravel walk. The Count had taken the lamp from the inner part of the room to see his friend clearly by the light of it. Yes, he said, your face speaks the truth this time. Serious indeed as serious as the money matters themselves more serious as true as i sit here more serious the light disappeared again and the talk went on i showed you the letter to my wife that anne catherick hid in the sand sir percival continued there's no boasting in that letter bosco she does know the secret say as little as possible percival in my presence of the secret does she know it from you no from her mother two women in possession of your private mind bad 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 my friend one question here before we go any farther the motive of your shutting up the daughter in the asylum is now plain enough to me but the manner of her escape is not quite so clear do you suspect the people in charge of her of closing their eyes purposely at the instance of some enemy who could afford to make it worth their while no she was the best behaved patient they had and like fools they trusted her she's just mad enough to be shut up 
and just sane enough to ruin me when she's at large, if you understand that. I do understand it. Now, Percival, come at once to the point, and then I shall know what to do. Where is the danger of your position at the present moment? Anne Catterick is in this neighbourhood, and in communication with Lady Glyde. There's the danger, plain enough. Who can read the letter she hid in the sand, and not see that my wife is in possession of the secret, deny it as she may? One moment, Percival. If Lady Glyde does know the secret, she must know also that it is a compromising secret for you. As your wife, surely it is her interest to keep it. Is it? I'm coming to that. It might be her interest if she cared two straws about me. But I happen to be an encumbrance in the way of another man. She was in love with him before she married me. She's in love with him now. An infernal vagabond of a drawing-master named Hartwright. My dear friend, what is there extraordinary in that? They are all in love with some other man. Who gets the first of a woman's heart? In all my experience, I have never yet met with a man who was number one. Number two sometimes. Number three, four, five, often. Number one, never. He exists, of course, but I have not met with him. Wait, I haven't done yet. Who do you think helped Anne Catherick to get the start, when the people from the madhouse were after her? Hartwright. Who do you think saw her again in Cumberland? Hartwright. Both times he spoke to her alone. Stop! Don't interrupt me. The scoundrel's as sweet on my wife as she is on him. He knows the secret, and she knows the secret. Once let them both get together again, and it's her interest and his interest to turn their information against me. Gently, Percival, gently. Are you insensible to the virtue of Lady Glyde? That for the virtue of Lady Glyde. I believe in nothing about her but her money. Don't you see how the case stands? She might be harmless enough by herself, but if she and that vagabond Hartwright yes yes i see where is mr hartwright out of the country if he means to keep a whole skin on his bones i recommend him not to come back in a hurry are you sure he is out of the country certain i had him watched from the time he left cumberland to the time he sailed oh i've been careful i can tell you and catherick lived with some people at a farmhouse near limeridge i went there myself after she had given me the slip and made sure that they knew nothing I gave her mother a form of letter to write to Miss Halcombe, exonerating me from any bad motive in putting her under restraint. I've spent, I'm afraid to say, how much in trying to trace her, and in spite of it all, she turns up here and escapes me on my own property. How do I know who else may see her? Who else may speak to her? That prying scoundrel Hartwright may come back without my knowing it, and may make use of her tomorrow. Not he percival while i am on the spot and while that woman is in the neighbourhood i will answer for our laying hands on her before mr hartwright even if he does come back i see yes yes i see the finding of anne catherick is the first necessity make your mind easy about the rest your wife is here under your thumb miss halcombe is inseparable from her and is therefore under your thumb also. And Mr. Hartwright is out of the country. This invisible Anne of yours is all we have to think of for the present. You have made your inquiries. Yes, I have been to her mother, have ransacked the village, and all to no purpose. Is her mother to be depended on? Yes. She has told your secret once. She won't tell it again. Why not? Are her own interests concerned in keeping it as well as yours? Yes deeply concerned i am glad to hear it possible for your sake don't be discouraged my friend our money matters as i told you leave me plenty of time to turn round him and i may search for anne catherick to-morrow to better purpose than you 
One last question before we go to bed. What is it? It is this. When I went to the boathouse to tell Lady Glyde that the little difficulty of her signature was put off, accident took me there in time to see a strange woman parting in a very suspicious manner from your wife. But accident did not bring me near enough to see this same woman's face plainly. I must know how to recognize our invisible Anne. What is she like? light come i'll tell you in two words she's a sickly likeness of my wife the chair creaked and the pillar shook once more the count was on his feet again this time in astonishment what he exclaimed eagerly fancy my wife after a bad illness with a touch of something wrong in her head and there is anne catherick for you answered sir percival are they related to each other not a bit of it and yet so like yes so like what are you laughing about there was no answer and no sound of any kind the count was laughing in his smooth silent internal way what are you laughing about reiterated sir percival perhaps at my own fancies my good friend allow me my italian humour do i not come of the illustrious nation which invented the exhibition of punch. Well, 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 I shall know Anne Catherick when I see her, and so enough for to-night. Make your mind easy, Percival. Sleep, my son, the sleep of the just, and see what I will do for you when daylight comes to help us both. I have my projects and my plans here in my big head. You shall pay those bills and find Anne Catherick. My sacred word of honour on it, but you shall. Am I a friend to be treasured in the best corner of your heart, or am I not? Am I worth those loans of money which you so delicately reminded me of a little while since? Whatever you do, never wound me in my sentiments any more. Recognize them, Percival. Imitate them, Percival. I forgive you again. I shake hands again. Good night. Not another word was spoken. I heard the Count close the library door. I heard Sir Percival barring up the window shutters. It had been raining, raining all the time. I was cramped by my position and chilled to the bones. When I first tried to move, the effort was so painful to me that I was obliged to desist. I tried a second time and succeeded in rising to my knees on the wet roof. As I crept to the wall and raised myself against it, I looked back and saw the window of the Count's dressing-room gleam into light. My sinking courage flickered up in me again and kept my eyes fixed on his window as I stole my way back step by step past the wall of the house. The clock struck the quarter after one when I laid my hands on the window-sill of my own room. I had seen nothing and heard nothing which could lead me to suppose that my retreat had been discovered. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 20. June 20th, 8 o'clock. The sun is shining in a clear sky. I have not been near my bed. I have not once closed my weary wakeful eyes. From the same window at which I looked out into the darkness of last night, I look out now at the bright stillness of the morning. I count the hours that have passed since I escaped to the shelter of this room by my own sensations, and those hours seem like weeks. How short a time, and yet how long to me, since I sank down in the darkness here on the floor, drenched to the skin, cramped in every limb, cold to the bones, a useless, helpless, panic-stricken creature. I hardly know when I roused myself. I hardly know when I groped my way back to the bedroom and lighted the candle and searched, 
with a strange ignorance at first of where to look for them, for dry clothes to warm me. The doing of these things is in my mind, but not the time when they were done. Can I even remember when the chilled, cramped feeling left me, and the throbbing heat came in its place? Surely it was before the sun rose. Yes, I heard the clock strike three. I remember the time by the sudden brightness and clearness, the feverish strain and excitement of all my faculties, which came with it. I remember my resolution to control myself, to wait patiently, hour after hour, till the chance offered of removing Laura from this horrible place, without the danger of immediate discovery and pursuit. I remember the persuasion settling itself in my mind that the words those two men had said to each other would furnish us not only with our justification for leaving the house, but with our weapons of defence against them as well. I recall the impulse that awakened in me to preserve those words in writing, exactly as they were spoken, while the time was my own, and while my memory vividly retained them. All this I remember plainly. There is no confusion in my head yet. The coming in here from the bedroom, with my pen and ink and paper before sunrise. The sitting down at the widely opened window to get all the air I could to cool me. The ceaseless writing, faster and faster, hotter and hotter, driving on more and more wakefully all through the dreadful interval before the house was astir again. How clearly I recall it from the beginning by candlelight to the end on the page before this in the sunshine of the new day why do i sit here still why do i weary my hot eyes and my burning head by writing more why not lie down and rest myself and try to quench the fever that consumes me in sleep i dare not attempt it a fear beyond all other fears has got possession of me i am afraid of this heat that parches my skin i am afraid of the creeping and throbbing that i feel in my head if i lie down now how do i know that i may have the sense and the strength to rise again oh the rain the rain the cruel rain that chilled me last night nine o'clock was it nine struck or eight nine surely i am shivering again shivering from head to foot in the summer air have i been sitting here asleep i don't know what i have been doing oh my god am i going to be ill ill at such a time as this my head i am sadly afraid of my head i can write but the lines all run together i see the words laura i can write laura and see i write it eight or nine which was it so cold so cold all oh, that rain last night and the strokes of the clock the strokes i can't count keep striking in my head Note. At this place, the entry in the diary ceases to be legible. The two or three lines which follow contain fragments of words only, mingled with blots and scratches of the pen. The last marks on the paper bear some resemblance to the first two letters, L and A, of the name of Lady Glyde. On the next page of the diary, another entry appears. It is in a man's handwriting large bold and firmly regular and the date is june the twenty first it contains these lines postscript by a sincere friend the illness of our excellent miss halcombe has afforded me the opportunity of enjoying an unexpected intellectual pleasure I refer to the perusal which I have just completed of this interesting diary. There are many hundred pages here. I can lay my hand on my heart and declare that every page has charmed, refreshed, delighted me. To a man of my sentiments, it is unspeakably gratifying to be able to say this. Admirable woman, I allude to Miss Halcombe stupendous effort i refer to the diary yes these pages are amazing 
the tact which i find here the discretion the rare courage the wonderful power of memory the accurate observation of character the easy grace of style the charming outbursts of womanly feeling have all inexpressibly increased my admiration of this sublime creature of this magnificent marion the presentation of my own character is masterly in the extreme i certify with my whole heart to the fidelity of the portrait i feel how vivid an impression i must have produced to have been painted in such strong such rich such massive colours as these i lament afresh the cruel necessity which sets our interests at variance and opposes us to each other under happier circumstances how worthy i should have been of miss Hockham. how worthy miss Hockham would have been of me the sentiments which animate my heart assure me that the lines i have just written express a profound truth those sentiments exalt me above all merely personal considerations i bear witness in the most disinterested manner to the excellence of the stratagem by which this unparalleled woman surprised the private interview between percival and myself also to the marvellous accuracy of her report of the whole conversation from its beginning to its end those sentiments have induced me to offer to the unimpressionable doctor who attends on her my vast knowledge of chemistry and my luminous experience of the more subtle resources which medical and magnetic science have placed at the disposal of mankind he has hitherto declined to avail himself of my assistance miserable man finally those sentiments dictate the lines grateful sympathetic paternal lines which appear in this place i close the book my strict sense of propriety restores it by the hands of my wife to its place on the writer's table events are hurrying me away circumstances are guiding me to serious issues vast perspectives of success unroll themselves before my eyes i accomplish my destiny with a calmness which is terrible to myself nothing but the homage of my admiration is my own i deposit it with respectful tenderness at the feet of miss halcom i breathe my wishes for her recovery i condole with her on the inevitable failure of every plan that she has formed for her sister's benefit at the same time i entreat her to believe that the information which i have derived from her diary will in no respect help me to contribute to that failure it simply confirms the plan of conduct which i had previously arranged i have to thank these pages for awakening the finest sensibilities in my nature nothing more to a person of similar sensibility this simple assertion will explain and excuse everything miss halcom is a person of similar sensibility in that persuasion i sign myself fosco end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Story Continued by Frederick Fairley, Esquire of Limeridge House. Note The manner in which Mr. Fairley's narrative and other narratives that are shortly to follow it were originally obtained forms the subject of an explanation which will appear at a later period 
it is the grand misfortune of my life that nobody will let me alone why i ask everybody why worry me nobody answers that question and nobody lets me alone relatives friends and strangers all combine to annoy me what have i done i ask myself i ask my servant louis fifty times a day what have i done neither of us can tell most extraordinary the last annoyance that has assailed me is the annoyance of being called upon to write this narrative is a man in my state of nervous wretchedness capable of writing narrative when i put this extremely reasonable objection i am told that certain very serious events relating to my niece have happened within my experience and that i am the fit person to describe them on that account i am threatened if i fail to exert myself in the manner required with consequences which i cannot so much as think of without perfect prostration there is really no need to threaten me shattered by my miserable health and my family troubles i am incapable of resistance if you insist you take your unjust advantage of me and i give way immediately i will endeavour to remember what i can under protest and to write what i can also under protest and what i can't remember and can't write louis must remember and write for me he is an ass and i am an invalid and we are likely to make all sorts of mistakes between us how humiliating i am told to remember date good heavens i never did such a thing in my life how am i to begin now i have asked louis he is not quite such an ass as i have hitherto supposed he remembers the date of the event within a week or two and i remember the name of the person the date was towards the end of june or the beginning of july and the name in my opinion a remarkably vulgar one was fanny at the end of june or the beginning of july then i was reclining in my customary state surrounded by the various objects of art which i have collected about me to improve the taste of the barbarous people in my neighbourhood that is to say i had the photographs of my pictures and prints and coins and so forth all about me which i intend one of these days to present the photographs i mean if the clumsy english language will let me mean anything to present to the institution at carlisle horrid place with a view to improving the tastes of the members goths and bandals to a man it might be supposed that a gentleman who was in course of conferring a great national benefit on his countrymen who was the last gentleman in the world to be unfeelingly worried about private difficulties and family affairs quite a mistake i assure you in my case however there i was reclining with my art treasures about me and wanting a quiet morning because i wanted a quiet morning of course louis came in 
it was perfectly natural that i should inquire what the deuce he meant by making his appearance when i had not rung my bell i seldom swear it is such an ungentlemanlike habit but when louis answered by a grin i think it was also perfectly natural that i should damn him for grinning at any rate i did the rigorous mode of treatment i have observed invariably brings persons in the low class of life to their senses and brought louis to his senses he was so obliging as to leave off grinning and inform me that a young person was outside wanting to see me he added with the odious talkativeness of servants that her name was fanny who is fanny lady glyde's maid sir what does lady glyde's maid want with me a letter sir take it she refuses to give it to anybody but you sir who sends the letter miss halcombe sir the moment i heard miss halcombe's name i gave up it is a habit of mine always to give up to miss halcombe i find by experience that it saves noise i gave up on this occasion dear marion let lady glyde's maid come in louis stop do her shoes creak i was obliged to ask the question creaking shoes invariably upset me for the day i was resigned to see the young person but i was not resigned to let the young person's shoes upset me there is a limit even to my endurance louis affirmed distinctly that her shoes were to be depended upon i waved my hand he introduced her is it necessary to say that she expressed her sense of embarrassment by shutting up her mouth and breathing through her nose to the student of female human nature in the lower orders surely not let me do the girl justice her shoes did not creak but why do young persons in service all perspire at the hands why have they all got fat noses and hard cheeks and why are their faces so sadly unfinished especially about the corners of the eyelids i am not strong enough to think deeply myself on any subject but i appeal to professional men who are why have we no variety in our breed of young persons you have a letter for me from miss harcombe put it down on the table please and don't upset anything how is miss harcombe very well thank you sir and lady glyde i received no answer the young person's face became more unfinished than ever and i think she began to cry i certainly saw something moist about her eyes tears or perspiration louis whom i have just consulted is inclined to think tears he is in her class of life and he ought to know best a letter say tears except when the refining process of art judiciously removes them from all resemblance to nature i distinctly object to tears tears are scientifically described as a secretion i can understand that a secretion may be 
healthy or unhealthy but i cannot see the interest of her secretion from a sentimental point of view perhaps my own secretions being all wrong together i am a little prejudiced on the subject no matter i behaved on this occasion with all possible propriety and feeling i closed my eyes and said to louis endeavour to ascertain what she means louis endeavoured and the young person endeavoured they succeeded in confusing each other to such an extent that i am bound in common gratitude to say they really amused me i think i shall send for them again when i am in low spirits i have just mentioned this idea to louis strange to say it seems to make him uncomfortable poor devil surely i am not expected to repeat my niece's maid's explanation of her tears interpreted in the english of my swiss valet the thing is manifestly impossible i can give my own impressions and feelings perhaps will that do as well oh please say yes my idea is that she began by telling me through louis that her master had dismissed her from her mistress's service observe throughout the strange irrelevancy of the young person was it my fault that she had lost her place on her dismissal she had gone to the inn to sleep i don't keep the inn why mention it to me between six o'clock and seven miss halcombe had come to say good-bye and had given her two letters one for me and one for a gentleman in london i am not a gentleman in london hang the gentleman in london she had carefully put the two letters into her bosom what have i to do with her bosom she had been very unhappy when miss halcombe had gone away again she had not had the heart to put bit or drop between her lips till it was near bedtime and then when it was close on nine o'clock she had thought she should like a cup of tea am i responsible for any of these vulgar fluctuations which begin with unhappiness and end with tea just as she was warming the pot i give the words on the authority of louis who says he knows what they mean and wishes to explain but i snub him on principle just as she was warming the pot the door opened and she was struck of a heap her own words again and perfectly unintelligible this time to louis as well as to myself by the appearance in the inn parlour of her ladyship the countess i give my niece's maid's description of my sister's title with a sense of the highest relish my poor dear sister is a tiresome woman who married a foreigner to resume the door opened her ladyship the countess appeared in the parlour and the young person was struck of a heap most remarkable i must really rest a little before i can get on any farther 
when I have reclined for a few minutes with my eyes closed, and when Louis has refreshed my poor aching temples with a little eau de cologne, I may be able to proceed. <laughs> Ladyship the Countess, no, I am able to proceed, but not to sit up. I will recline and dictate. Louis has a horrid accent, but he knows the language and can write. How very convenient. Her ladyship, the countess, explained her unexpected appearance at the inn by telling Fanny that she had come to bring one or two little messages which Miss Harkham in her hurry had forgotten. The young person thereupon waited anxiously to hear what the messages were, but the countess seemed disinclined to mention them, so like my sister's tiresome way, until Fanny had had her tea. Her ladyship was surprisingly kind and thoughtful about it, extremely unlike my sister, and said, I am sure, my poor girl, you must want your tea. We can let the messages wait till afterwards. Come, come, if nothing else will put you at your ease, I'll make the tea and have a cup with you. I think those were the words as reported excitably in my presence by the young person. At any rate, the countess insisted on making the tea, and carried her ridiculous ostentation of humility so far as to take one cup herself, and to insist on the girl's taking the other. The girl drank the tea, and, according to her own account, solemnized the extraordinary occasion five minutes afterwards, by fainting dead away for the first time in her life. Here again I use her own words. Louis thinks they were accompanied by an increased secretion of tears. I can't say myself. The effort of listening being quite as much as I could manage. My eyes were closed. Where did I leave off? Ah, uh, yes, she fainted after drinking a cup of tea with the countess, a proceeding which might have interested me if I had been a medical man, but being nothing of the sort, I felt bored by hearing of it nothing more. When she came to herself in half an hour's time, she was on the sofa, and nobody was with her but the landlady. The countess, finding it too late to remain any longer at the inn, had gone away as soon as the girl showed signs of recovering, and the landlady had been good enough to help her upstairs to bed. Left by herself, she had felt in her bosom I regret the necessity of referring to this part of the subject a second time, and had found the two letters there quite safe, but strangely crumpled. She had been giddy in the night, but had got up well enough to travel in the morning. She had put the letter addressed to that obtrusive stranger, the gentleman in London, into the post, and had now delivered the other letter into my hands, as she was told. This was the plain truth, and though she could not blame herself for any intentional neglect, she was sadly troubled in her mind, and sadly in want of a word of advice. At this point Louis thinks, 
perhaps the secretions appeared again perhaps they did but it is of infinitely greater importance to mention that at this point also i lost my patience opened my eyes and interfered what is the purpose of all this i inquired my niece's irrelevant maid stared and stood speechless endeavour to explain i said to my servant translate me louis louis endeavoured and translated in other words he descended immediately into a bottomless pit of confusion and the young person followed him down i really don't know when i have been so amused i left them at the bottom of the pit as long as they diverted me when they ceased to divert me i exerted my intelligence and pulled them up again it is unnecessary to say that my interference enabled me in due course of time to ascertain the purport of the young person's remarks i discovered that she was uneasy in her mind because the train of events that she had just described to me had prevented her from receiving those supplementary messages which miss halcombe had entrusted to the countess to deliver she was afraid the messages might have been of great importance to her mistress's interest her dread of sir percival had deterred her from going to blackwater park late at night to inquire about them and miss halcombe's own directions to her on no account to miss the train in the morning had prevented her from waiting at the inn the next day she was most anxious that the misfortune of her fainting fit should not lead to the second misfortune of making her mistress think her neglectful and she would humbly beg to ask me whether i would advise her to write her explanations and excuses to miss halcombe requesting to receive the messages by letter if it was not too late i make no apologies for this extremely prosy paragraph i have been ordered to write it there are people unaccountable as it may appear who actually take more interest in what my niece's maid said to me on this occasion than in what i said to my niece's maid amusing perversity i should feel very much obliged to you sir if you would kindly tell me what i had better do remarked the young person let things stop as they are i said adapting my language to my listener i invariably let things stop as they are yes is that all if you think it would be a liberty in me sir to write of course i wouldn't venture to do so but i am so very anxious to do all i can to serve my mistress faithfully people in the lower class of life never know when or how to go out of a room they invariably require to be helped out by their betters i thought it high time to help the young person out i did it with two judicious words good morning something outside or inside this singular girl suddenly creaked louis who was looking at her which i was not says she creaked 
when she captured curious was it her shoes her stays or her bones louis thinks it was her stays most extraordinary as soon as i was left by myself i had a little nap i really wanted it when i awoke again i noticed dear marion's letter if i had had the least idea of what it contained i should certainly not have attempted to open it being unfortunately for myself quite innocent of all suspicion i read the letter it immediately upset me for the day i am by nature one of the most easy-tempered creatures that ever lived i make allowances for everybody and i take offence at nothing but as i have before remarked there are limits to my endurance i laid down marion's letter and felt myself justly felt myself an injured man i am about to make a remark it is of course applicable to the very serious matter now under notice or i should not allow it to appear in this place nothing in my opinion sets the odious selfishness of mankind in such a repulsively vivid light as the treatment in all classes of society which the single people receive at the hands of the married people when you have once shown yourself too considerate and self-denying to add a family of your own to an already overcrowded population you are vindictively marked out by your married friends who have no similar consideration and no similar self-denial as the recipient of half their conjugal troubles and the born friend of all their children husbands and wives talk of the cares of matrimony and bachelors and spinsters bear them take my own case i considerately remain single and my poor dear brother philip inconsiderately marries what does he do when he dies he leaves his daughter to me she is a sweet girl she is also a dreadful responsibility why lay her on my shoulders because i am bound in the harmless character of a single man to relieve my married connections of all their own troubles i do my best with my brother's responsibility i marry my niece with infinite fuss and difficulty to the man her father wanted her to marry she and her husband disagree and unpleasant consequences follow what does she do with those consequences she transfers them to me why transfer them to me because i am bound in the harmless character of a single man to relieve my married connections of all their own troubles poor single people poor human nature it is quite unnecessary to say that marion's letter threatened me everybody threatens me all sorts of horrors were to fall on my devoted head if i hesitated to turn limeridge house into an asylum for my niece and her misfortunes i did hesitate nevertheless i have mentioned that my usual course hitherto had been to submit to dear marion and save noise but on this occasion the consequences involved 
in her extremely inconsiderate proposal were of a nature to make me pause if i opened limeridge house as an asylum to lady glyde what security had i against sir percival glyde's following her here in a state of violent resentment against me for harbouring his wife i saw such a perfect labyrinth of troubles involved in this proceeding that i determined to feel my ground as it were i wrote therefore to dear marion to beg as she had no husband to lay claim to her that she would come here by herself first and talk the matter over with me if she could answer my objections to my own perfect satisfaction then i assured her that i would receive our sweet laura with the greatest pleasure but not otherwise i felt of course at the time that this temporizing on my part would probably end in bringing marion here in a state of virtuous indignation banging doors but then the other course of proceeding might end in bringing sir percival here in a state of virtuous indignation banging doors also and of the two indignations and bangings i preferred marion's because i was used to her accordingly i dispatched the letter by return of post it gained me time at all events and oh dear me what a point that was to begin with when i am totally prostrated did i mention that i was totally prostrated by marion's letter it always takes me three days to get up again i was very unreasonable i expected three days of quiet of course i didn't get them the third day's post brought me a most impertinent letter from a person with whom i was totally unacquainted he described himself as the acting partner of a man of business our dear pig-headed old gilmore and he informed me that he had lately received by the post a letter addressed to him in miss halcombe's handwriting on opening the envelope he had discovered to his astonishment that it contained nothing but a blank sheet of note-paper this circumstance appeared to him so suspicious as suggesting to his restless legal mind that the letter had been tampered with that he had at once written to miss harkham and had received no answer by return of post in this difficulty instead of acting like a sensible man and letting things take their proper course his next absurd proceeding on his own showing was to pester me by writing to inquire if i knew anything about it what the deuce should i know about it why alarm me as well as himself i wrote back to that effect it was one of my keenest letters i have produced nothing with a sharper epistolary edge to it since i tendered his dismissal in writing to that extremely troublesome person mr walter hartwright my letter produced its effect i heard nothing more from the lawyer this perhaps 
was not altogether surprising but it was certainly a remarkable circumstance that no second letter reached me from marion and that no warning signs appeared of her arrival her unexpected absence did me amazing good it was so very soothing and pleasant to infer as i did of course that my married connections had made it up again five days of undisturbed tranquillity of delicious single blessedness quite restored me on the sixth day i felt strong enough to send for my photographer and to set him at work again on the presentation copies of my art treasures with a view as i have already mentioned to the improvement of taste in this barbarous neighbourhood i had just dismissed him to his workshop and had just begun coquetting with my coins when louis suddenly made his appearance with a card in his hand another young person i said i won't see her in my state of health young persons disagree with me not at home it is a gentleman this time sir a gentleman of course made a difference i looked at the card gracious heaven my tiresome sister's foreign husband count fosco is it necessary to say what my first impression was when i looked at my visitor's card surely not my sister having married a foreigner there was but one impression that any man in his senses could possibly feel of course the count had come to borrow money of me louis i said do you think he would go away if you gave him five shillings louis looked quite shocked he surprised me inexpressibly by declaring that my sister's foreign husband was dressed superbly and looked the picture of prosperity under these circumstances my first impression altered to a certain extent i now took it for granted that the count had matrimonial difficulties of his own to contend with and that he had come like the rest of the family to cast them all on my shoulders did he mention his business i asked count fosco said he had come here sir because miss halcombe was unable to leave blackwater park fresh troubles apparently not exactly his own as i had supposed but dear marion's troubles anyway oh dear show him in i said resignedly the count's first appearance really startled me he was such an alarmingly large person that i quite trembled i felt certain that he would shake the floor and knock down my art treasures he did neither the one nor the other he was refreshingly dressed in summer costume his manner was delightfully self-possessed and quiet he had a charming smile my first impression of him was highly favourable it is not creditable to my penetration as the sequel will show to acknowledge this but i am a naturally candid man and i do acknowledge it notwithstanding allow me to present myself mr fairley he said i come from blackwater park 
and I have the honour and the happiness of being Madame Fosco's husband. Let me take my first and last advantage of that circumstance by entreating you not to make a stranger of me. I beg you will not disturb yourself. I beg you will not move. You are very good, I replied. I wish I was strong enough to get up. Charmed to see you at Limeridge. Please take a chair. I am afraid you are suffering today, said the Count. As usual, I said, I am nothing but a bundle of nerves dressed up to look like a man. I have studied many subjects in my time, remarked this sympathetic person. Among others, the inexhaustible subject of nerves. May I make a suggestion at once, the simplest and the most profound? Will you let me alter the light in your room? Certainly, if you will be so very kind as not to let any of it in on me. He walked to the window. Such a contrast to dear Marion, so extremely considerate in all his movements. Light he said, in that delightfully confidential tone which is so soothing to an invalid, is the first essential. Light stimulates, nourishes, preserves. You can no more do without it, Mr. Fairley, than if you were a flower. Observe, here, where you sit, I close the shutters to compose you. There, where you do not sit, I draw up the blind, and let in the invigorating sun. Admit the light into your room, if you cannot bear it on yourself. Light, sir, is the grand decree of providence. You accept providence with your own restriction accept light on the same term i thought this very convincing and attentive he had taken me in up to that point about the light he had certainly taken me in you see me confused he said returning to his place on my word of honour mr fairly you see me confused in your presence shocked to hear it i am sure may i inquire why sir can i enter this room where you sit a sufferer and see you surrounded by these admirable objects of art without discovering that you are a man whose feelings are acutely impressionable whose sympathies are perpetually alive. Tell me, can I do this? If I had been strong enough to sit up in my chair, I should, of course, have bowed. Not being strong enough, I smiled my acknowledgments instead. It did just as well. We both understood one another. Pray, follow my train of thought, continued the Count. I sit here, a man of refined sympathies myself, in the presence of another man of refined sympathies also. I am conscious of a terrible necessity for lacerating those sympathies by referring to domestic events of a very melancholy kind. What is the inevitable consequence? I have done myself the honour of pointing it out to you already. I sit confused. Was it at this point that I began to suspect he was going to bore me? I rather think it was. Is it absolutely necessary to refer to these unpleasant matters i inquired in our 
homely english phrase count fosco won't they keep the count with the most alarming solemnity sighed and shook his head must i really hear them he shrugged his shoulders it was the first foreign thing he had done since he had been in the room and looked at me in an unpleasantly penetrating manner my instincts told me that i had better close my eyes i obeyed my instincts please break it gently i pleaded anybody dead dead <laughs> cried the count with unnecessary foreign fierceness mr Ferry, your national composure terrifies me in the name of heaven what have i said or done to make you think me the messenger of death pray accept my apologies i answered you have said and done nothing i make it a rule in these distressing cases always to anticipate the worst it breaks the blow by meeting it halfway and so on inexpressibly relieved i am sure to hear that nobody is dead anybody ill i opened my eyes and looked at him was he very yellow when he came in or had he turned very yellow in the last minute or two i really can't say and I can't ask Louis, because he was not in the room at the time. Anybody ill? I repeated, observing that my national composure still appeared to affect him. That is part of my bad news, Mr. Fairley. Yes, somebody is ill. Grieved, I am sure. Which of them is it? to my profound sorrow miss halcombe perhaps you were in some degree prepared to hear this perhaps when you found that miss halcombe did not come here by herself as you proposed and did not write a second time your affectionate anxiety may have made you fear that she was ill i have no doubt my affectionate anxiety had led to that melancholy apprehension at some time or other but at the moment my wretched memory entirely failed to remind me of the circumstance however i said yes in justice to myself i was much shocked it was so very uncharacteristic of such a robust person as dear marion to be ill that i could only suppose she had met with an accident a horse or a false step on the stairs or something of that sort is it serious i asked serious beyond a doubt he replied dangerous i hope and trust not miss halcombe unhappily exposed herself to be wetted through by a heavy rain the cold that followed was of an aggravated kind and it has now brought with it the worst consequence fever when i heard the word fever and when i remembered at the same moment that the unscrupulous person who was now addressing me had just come from blackwater park i thought i should have fainted on the spot good god i said is it infectious not at present he answered with detestable composure it may turn to infection but no such deplorable complication had taken place when i left blackwater park i have felt the deepest interest in the case mr Fairley. i have endeavoured to assist the regular medical attendant in watching it accept my personal assurances of the uninfectious nature of the fever when i last saw it 
accept his assurances i never was farther from accepting anything in my life i would not have believed him on his oath he was too yellow to be believed he looked like a walking west indian epidemic he was big enough to carry typhus by the ton and to dye the very carpet he walked on with scarlet fever in certain emergencies my mind is remarkably soon made up i instantly determined to get rid of him you will kindly excuse an invalid i said but long conferences of any kind invariably upset me may i beg to know exactly what the object is to which i am indebted for the honour of your visit i fervently hoped that this remarkably broad hint would throw him off his balance confuse him reduce him to polite apologies in short get him out of the room on the contrary it only settled him in his chair he became additionally solemn and dignified and confidential he held up two of his horrid fingers and gave me another of his unpleasantly penetrating looks what was i to do i was not strong enough to quarrel with him conceive my situation if you please is language adequate to describe it i think not the objects of my visit he went on quite irrepressibly are numbered on my fingers they are two first i come to bear my testimony with profound sorrow to the lamentable disagreements between sir percival and lady glyde i am sir percival's oldest friend i am related to lady glyde by marriage i am an eye-witness of all that has happened at blackwater park in those three capacities i speak with authority with confidence with honourable regret sir i inform you as the head of lady glyde's family that miss halcombe has exaggerated nothing in the letter which she wrote to your address i affirm that the remedy which that admirable lady has proposed is the only remedy that will spare you the horrors of public scandal a temporary separation between husband and wife is the one peaceable solution of this difficulty part them for the present and when all causes of irritation are removed i who have now the honour of addressing you i will undertake to bring sir percival to reason lady glyde is innocent lady glyde is injured but follow my thought here she is on that very account i say it with shame the cause of irritation while she remains under her husband's roof no other house can receive her with propriety but yours i invite you to open it cool here was a matrimonial hailstorm pouring in the south of england and i was invited by a man with fever in every fold of his coat to come out from the north of england and take my share of the pelting i tried to put the point forcibly just as i had put it here the count deliberately lowered one of his horrid fingers kept the other up and went on rode over me as it were without even the common coachman-like attention of crying hi before he knocked me down follow my thought once more if you please he resumed my first object you have heard my second object in coming to this house is to do what miss halcombe's illness has prevented her from doing for herself my large experience is consulted on all the difficult matters at blackwater park and my friendly advice 
was requested on the interesting subject of your letter to Miss Halcombe. I understood at once, for my sympathies are your sympathies, why you wish to see her here, before you pledged yourself to inviting Lady Glyde. You are most right, sir, in hesitating to receive the wife until you are quite certain that the husband will not exert his authority to reclaim her. I agree to that. I also agree that such delicate explanations as this difficulty involves are not explanations which can be properly disposed of by writing only. My presence here to my own great inconvenience is the proof that I speak sincerely. As for the explanations themselves, I, Fosco, I, who know Sir Percival much better than Miss Halcombe knows him, affirm to you on my honour and my word that he will not come near this house or attempt to communicate with this house while his wife is living in it his affairs are embarrassed offer him his freedom by means of the absence of lady glyde i promise you he will take his freedom and go back to the continent at the earliest moment when he can get away is this clear to you as crystal yes it is have you questions to address to me be it so i am here to answer ask mr fairy oblige me by asking to your heart's content he had said so much already in spite of me and he looked so dreadfully capable of saying a great deal more also in spite of me that i declined his amiable invitation in pure self-defence many thanks i replied i am sinking fast in my state of health i must take things for granted allow me to do so on this occasion we quite understand each other yes much obliged i am sure for your kind interference if i ever get better and ever have a second opportunity of improving our acquaintance he got up i thought he was going no more talk more time for the development of infectious influences in my room too remember that in my room one moment yet he said one moment before i take my leave i ask permission at parting to impress on you an urgent necessity it is this sir you must not think of waiting till miss halcombe recovers before you receive lady glyde miss halcombe has the attendance of the doctor, of the housekeeper at Blackwater Park, and of an experienced nurse as well. Three persons, for whose capacity and devotion I answer with my life. I tell you that. I tell you also that the anxiety and alarm of her sister's illness has already affected the health and spirits of Lady Glyde and has made her totally unfit to be of use in the sick-room. Her position with her husband grows more and more deplorable and dangerous every day. If you leave her any longer at Blackwater Park, you do nothing whatever to hasten her sister's recovery, and at the same time you risk the public scandal which you and I and all of us are bound in the sacred interests of the family to avoid with all my soul i advise you to remove the serious responsibility of delay from your own shoulders by writing to lady glyde to come here at once do your affection at your honourable your inevitable duty and whatever happens in the future no one can lay the blame on you i speak from my large experience i offer my friendly advice is it accepted yes or no i looked at him merely looked at him with my sense of his amazing assurance and my dawning resolution to ring for louis and have him shown out of the room expressed in every line of my face it is perfectly incredible, but quite true, that my 
face did not appear to produce the slightest impression on him born without nerves evidently born without nerves you hesitate he said mr fairly i understand that hesitation you object see sir how my sympathies look straight down into your thoughts you object that lady glyde is not in health and not in spirits to take the long journey from hampshire to this place by herself her own maid is removed from her as you know and of other servants fit to travel with her from one end of england to another there are none at blackwater park you object again that she cannot comfortably stop and rest in london on her way here because she cannot comfortably go alone to a public hotel where she is a total stranger in one breath i grant both objections in another breath i remove them follow me if you please for the last time it was my intention when i returned to england with sir percival to settle myself in the neighbourhood of london the purpose has just been happily accomplished i have taken for six months a little furnished house in the quarter called st john's wood be so obliging as to keep this fact in your mind and observe the programme i now propose lady glyde travels to london a short journey i myself meet her at the station i take her to rest and sleep at my house which is also the house of her aunt when she is restored i escort her to the station again she travels to this place and her own maid who is now under your roof receives her at the carriage door here is comfort consulted here are the interests of propriety consulted here is your own duty duty of hospitality sympathy protection to an unhappy lady in need of all three smoothed and made easy from the beginning to the end i cordially invite you sir to second my efforts in the sacred interests of the family i seriously advise you to write by my hands offering the hospitality of your house and heart and the hospitality of my house and heart to that injured and unfortunate lady whose cause i plead to-day he waved his horrid hand at me he struck his infectious breast he addressed me oratorically as if i was laid up in the house of commons it was high time to take a desperate course of some sort it was also high time to send for louis and adopt the precaution of fumigating the room in this trying emergency an idea occurred to me an inestimable idea which so to speak killed two intrusive birds with one stone i determined to get rid of the count's tiresome eloquence and of lady glyde's tiresome troubles by complying with this odious foreigner's request and writing the letter at once there was not the least danger of the invitation being accepted for there was not the least chance that laura would consent to leave blackwater park while marian was lying there ill how this charmingly convenient obstacle could have escaped the officious penetration of the count it was impossible to conceive but it had escaped him my dread that he might yet discover it if i allowed him any more time to think stimulated me to such an amazing degree that i struggled into a sitting position seized really seized the writing materials by my side and produced the letter as rapidly as if i had been a common clerk in an office dearest laura please come whenever you like break the journey by sleeping in london at your aunt's house grieve to hear of dear marian's illness ever affectionately yours 
I handed these lines at arm's length to the count. I sank back in my chair. I said, Excuse me, I am entirely prostrated. I can do no more. Will you rest and lunch downstairs? Love to all and sympathy and so on. Good morning. He made another speech. The man was absolutely inexhaustible. I closed my eyes. I endeavoured to hear as little as possible. In spite of my endeavours, I was obliged to hear a great deal. My sister's endless husband congratulated himself and congratulated me on the result of our interview. He mentioned a great deal more about his sympathies and mine. He deplored my miserable health. He offered to write me a prescription. He impressed on me the necessity of not forgetting what he had said about the importance of light. He accepted my obliging invitation to rest and lunch. He recommended me to expect Lady Glyde in two or three days' time. He begged my permission to look forward to our next meeting, instead of paining himself and paining me by saying farewell. He added a great deal more, which I rejoice to think I did not attend to at the time, and do not remember now. I heard his sympathetic voice, travelling away from me by degrees, but, large as he was, I never heard him. He had the negative merit of being absolutely noiseless. I don't know when he opened the door or when he shut it. I ventured to make use of my eyes again after an interval of silence, and he was gone. I rang for Louis and retired to my bathroom, tepid water, strengthened with aromatic vinegar for myself, and copious fumigation for my study, were the obvious precautions to take, and, of course, I adopted them. I rejoice to say they proved successful. I enjoyed my customary siesta. I awoke moist and cool. My first inquiries were for the Count. Had we really got rid of him? Yes, he had gone away by the afternoon train. Had he lunched, and if so, upon what? Entirely upon fruit tart and cream. What a man! What a digestion! Am I expected to say anything more? I believe not. I believe I have reached the limits assigned to me. The shocking circumstances which happened at a later period did not, I am thankful to say, happen in my presence. I do beg and entreat that nobody will be so very unfeeling as to lay any part of the blame of those circumstances on me. I did everything for the best. I am not answerable for a deplorable calamity which it was quite impossible to foresee. I am shattered by it. I have suffered under it as nobody else has suffered. My servant, Louis, who is really attached to me in his unintelligent way, thinks I shall never get over it. He sees me dictating at this moment with my handkerchief to my eyes. I wish to mention in justice to myself that it was not my fault, and that I am quite exhausted and heartbroken. Need I say more? End of chapter 21Chapter 22 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Story Continued by Eliza Mitchelson, Housekeeper at Blackwater Park. One. I am asked to state plainly what I know of the progress of Miss Halcombe's illness, and of the circumstances under which Lady Glyde left Blackwater Park for London. 
the reason given for making this demand on me is that my testimony is wanted in the interests of truth as the widow of a clergyman of the church of england reduced by misfortune to the necessity of accepting a situation i have been taught to place the claims of truth above all other considerations i therefore comply with a request which i might otherwise through reluctance to connect myself with distressing family affairs have hesitated to grant. I made no memorandum at the time, and I cannot therefore be sure to a day of the date, but I believe I am correct in stating that Miss Halcombe's serious illness began during the last fortnight or ten days in June. The breakfast hour was late at Blackwater Park, sometimes as late as ten, never earlier than half-past nine. On the morning to which I am now referring, Miss Harkham, who was usually the first to come down, did not make her appearance at the table. After the family had waited a quarter of an hour, the upper housemaid was sent to see after her, and came running out of the room, dreadfully frightened. I met the servant on the stairs, and went at once to Miss Halcombe, to see what was the matter. The poor lady was incapable of telling me. She was walking about her room with a pen in her hand, quite light-headed, in a state of burning fever. Lady Glyde, being no longer in Sir Percival's service, I may, without impropriety, mention my former mistress by her name, instead of calling her my lady, was the first to come in from her own bedroom. She was so dreadfully alarmed and distressed that she was quite useless. The Count Fosco and his lady, who came upstairs immediately afterwards, were both most serviceable and kind. Her ladyship assisted me to get Miss Halcombe to her bed. His lordship, the Count, remained in the sitting-room, and having sent for my medicine-chest, made a mixture for Miss Halcombe, and a cooling lotion to be applied to her head, so as to lose no time before the doctor came. We applied the lotion, but we could not get her to take the mixture. Sir Percival undertook to send for the doctor. He dispatched a groom on horseback for the nearest medical man, Mr. Dawson of Oak Lodge. Mr. Dawson arrived in less than an hour's time. He was a respectable elderly man, well known all round the country, and we were much alarmed when we found that he considered the case to be a very serious one. His lordship, the Count, affably entered into conversation with Mr. Dawson, and gave his opinions with a judicious freedom. Mr. Dawson, not over-courteously, inquired if his lordship's advice was the advice of a doctor, and being informed that it was the advice of one who had studied medicine unprofessionally, replied that he was not accustomed to consult with amateur physicians. The Count, with truly Christian meekness of temper, smiled and left the room. Before he went out, he told me that he might be found, in case he was wanted, in the course of the day, at the boat-house on the banks of the lake. Why he should have gone there I cannot say, but he did go, remaining away the whole day till seven o'clock, which was dinner-time. Perhaps he wished to set the example 
of keeping the house as quiet as possible. It was entirely in his character to do so. He was a most considerate nobleman. Miss Halcombe passed a very bad night, the fever coming and going, and getting worse towards the morning instead of better. No nurse fit to wait on her, being at hand in the neighbourhood. Her ladyship, the countess, and myself undertook the duty, relieving each other. A lady Glyde, most unwisely, insisted on sitting up with us. She was much too nervous, and too delicate in health, to bear the anxiety of Miss Halcombe's illness calmly. She only did herself harm, without being of the least real assistance. A more gentle and affectionate lady never lived, but she cried, and she was frightened. Two weaknesses which made her entirely unfit to be present in a sick-room. Sir Percival and the Count came in the morning to make their inquiries. Sir Percival, from distress, I presume, at his lady's affliction, and at Miss Halcombe's illness, appeared much confused and unsettled in his mind. His lordship testified, on the contrary, a becoming composure and interest. He had his straw hat in one hand, and his book in the other, and he mentioned to Sir Percival in my hearing that he would go out again and study at the lake. Let us keep the house quiet, he said. Let us not smoke indoors, my friend. Now Miss Halcombe is ill, you go your way, and I will go mine. When I study, I like to be alone. Good morning, Mrs. Mitchelson. Sir Percival was not civil enough. Perhaps I ought, in justice to say, not composed enough, to take leave of me with the same polite attention. The only person in the house, indeed, who treated me at that time, or at any other, on the footing of a lady in distressed circumstances, was the Count. He had the manners of a true nobleman. He was considerate towards every one. Even the young person, a Fanny by name, who attended on Lady Glyde, was not beneath his notice. When she was sent away by Sir Percival, his lordship, showing me his sweet little birds at the time, was most kindly anxious to know what had become of her, where she was to go the day she left Blackwater Park, and so on. It is in such little delicate attentions that the advantages of aristocratic birth always show themselves. I make no apology for introducing these particulars. They are brought forward in justice to his lordship, whose character, I have reason to know, is viewed rather harshly in certain quarters. A nobleman who can respect a lady in distressed circumstances, and can take a fatherly interest in the fortunes of an humble servant-girl, shows principles and feelings of too high an order to be lightly called in question. I advance no opinions, I offer facts only. My endeavour through life is to judge not that I be not judged. One of my beloved husband's finest sermons was on that text. I read it constantly in my own copy of the edition printed by subscription in the first days of my widowhood, and at every fresh perusal I derive an increase of spiritual benefit and edification. There was no improvement in Miss Halcombe, and the second night was even worse than the first. 
Mr. Dawson was constant in his attendance. The practical duties of nursing were still divided between the Countess and myself, Lady Glyde persisting in sitting up with us, though we both entreated her to take some rest. "'My place is by Marion's bedside,' was her only answer. "'Whether I am ill or well, nothing will induce me to lose sight of her.' Towards midday, I went downstairs to attend to some of my regular duties. An hour afterwards, on my way back to the sick room, I saw the Count, who had gone out again early for the third time, entering the hall, to all appearance in the highest good spirits. Sir Percival, at the same moment, put his head out of the library door, and addressed his noble friend with extreme eagerness in these words. "'Have you found her?' His lordship's large face became dimpled all over with placid smiles, but he made no reply in words. At the same time, Sir Percival turned his head observed that I was approaching the stairs, and looked at me in the most rudely angry manner possible. "'Come in here, and tell me about it,' he said to the Count. "'Whenever there are women in a house, they're always sure to be going up or down stairs.' "'My dear Percival,' observed his lordship kindly, "'Mrs. Mitchelson, has duties. Pray recognize her admirable performance of them as sincerely as I do. How is the sufferer, Mrs. Mitchelson? No better, my lord, I regret to say. Sad, most sad, remarked the Count. You look fatigued, Mrs. Mitchelson. It is certainly time you and my wife had some help in nursing. I think I may be the means of offering you that help. Circumstances have happened which will oblige Madame Fosco to travel to London either tomorrow or the day after. She will go away in the morning and return at night, and she will bring back with her to relieve you a nurse of excellent conduct and capacity who is now disengaged. The woman is known to my wife as a person to be trusted. Before she comes here, say nothing about her, if you please, to the doctor, because he will look with an evil eye on any nurse of my providing. When she appears in this house, she will speak for herself, and Mr. Dawson will be obliged to acknowledge that there is no excuse for not employing her. Lady Glyde will say the same. Pray present my best respects and sympathies to Lady Glyde. I expressed my grateful acknowledgments for his lordship's kind consideration. Sir Percival cut them short by calling to his noble friend, using I regret to say, a profane expression, to come into the library, and not to keep him waiting there any longer. I proceeded upstairs. We are poor erring creatures, and however well established a woman's principles may be, she cannot always keep on her guard against the temptation to exercise an idle curiosity. I am ashamed to say that an idle curiosity on this occasion got the better of my principles, and made me unduly inquisitive about the question which Sir Percival had addressed to his noble friend at the library door. Who was the Count expected to find in the course of his studious morning rambles at Blackwater Park? A woman? It was to be presumed, from the terms of Sir Percival's inquiry. 
I did not suspect the Count of any impropriety. I knew his moral character too well. The only question I asked myself was, had he found her? To resume, the night passed as usual without producing any change for the better in Miss Halcombe. The next day she seemed to improve a little. The day after that, her ladyship the countess, without mentioning the object of her journey to any one in my hearing, proceeded by the morning train to London. Her noble husband, with his customary attention, accompanying her to the station. I was now left in sole charge of Miss Halcombe, with every apparent chance, in consequence of her sister's resolution not to leave the bedside, of having Lady Glyde herself to nurse next. The only circumstance of any importance that happened in the course of the day was the occurrence of another unpleasant meeting between the doctor and the Count. His lordship, on returning from the station, stepped up into Miss Halcombe's sitting-room to make his inquiries. I went out from the bedroom to speak to him. Mr. Dawson and Lady Glyde, being both with the patient at the time. The Count asked me many questions about the treatment and the symptoms. I informed him that the treatment was of the kind described as saline, and that the symptoms between the attacks of fever were certainly those of increasing weakness and exhaustion. Just as I was mentioning these last particulars, Mr. Dawson came out from the bedroom. "'Good morning, sir,' said his lordship, stepping forward in the most urbane manner, and stopping the doctor with a high-bred resolution impossible to resist. "'I greatly fear you find no improvement in the symptoms to-day?' I find decided improvement, answered Mr. Dawson. You still persist in your lowering treatment of this case of fever, continued his lordship. I persist in the treatment which is justified by my own professional experience, said Mr. Dawson. Permit me to put one question to you on the vast subject of professional experience, observed the Count. I presume to offer no more advice. I only presume to make an inquiry. You live at some distance, sir, from the gigantic centres of scientific activity, London and Paris. Have you ever heard of the wasting effects of fever being reasonably and intelligibly repaired by fortifying the exhausted patient with brandy, wine, ammonia, and quinine? Has that new heresy of the highest medical authorities ever reached your ears, yes or no? When a professional man puts that question to me, I shall be glad to answer him, said the doctor, opening the door to go out. You are not a professional man, and I beg to decline answering you. Buffeted in this inexcusably uncivil way on one cheek, the Count, like a practical Christian, immediately turned the other and said, in the sweetest manner, Good morning, Mr. Dawson. If my late beloved husband had been so fortunate as to know his lordship, how highly he and the Count would have esteemed each other her ladyship, the countess, returned by the last train that night, and brought with her the nurse from London. I was instructed that this person's name was Mrs. Rubell. Her personal appearance 
and her imperfect English when she spoke, informed me that she was a foreigner. I have always cultivated a feeling of humane indulgence for foreigners. They do not possess our blessings and advantages, and they are for the most part brought up in the blind errors of popery. It has also always been my precept and practice, as it was my dear husband's precept and practice before me. See Sermon XX1X in the collection by the late Rev. Samuel Mitchelson, M.A. To do as I would be done by. On both these accounts, I will not say that Mrs. Rubell struck me as being a small, wiry, sly person of fifty or thereabouts, with a dark brown or creole complexion, and watchful, light grey eyes. Nor will I mention for the reasons just alleged, that I thought her dress, though it was of the plainest black silk, inappropriately costly in texture, and unnecessarily refined in trimming and finish, for a person in her position in life. I should not like these things to be said of me, and therefore it is my duty not to say them of Mrs. Rubell. I will merely mention that her manners were not, perhaps, unpleasantly reserved, but only remarkably quiet and retiring, that she looked about her a great deal, and said very little, which might have arisen quite as much from her own modesty as from distrust of her position at Blackwater Park, and that she declined to partake of supper, which was curious, perhaps, but surely not suspicious, although I myself politely invited her to that meal in my own room. At the Count's particular suggestion, so like his lordship's forgiving kindness, it was arranged that Mrs. Rubell should not enter on her duties until she had been seen and approved by the doctor the next morning. I sat up that night. Lady Glyde appeared to be very unwilling that the new nurse should be employed to attend on Miss Harkin. Such want of liberality towards a foreigner on the part of a lady of her education and refinement, surprised me. I ventured to say, My lady, we must all remember not to be hasty in our judgments on our inferiors, especially when they come from foreign parts. Lady Glyde did not appear to attend to me. She only sighed, and kissed Miss Harcum's hand as it lay on the counterpane, scarcely a judicious proceeding in a sick room, with a patient whom it was highly desirable not to excite. But poor Lady Glyde knew nothing of nursing, nothing whatever, I am sorry to say. The next morning Mrs. Rubell was sent to the sitting-room, to be approved by the doctor on his way through to the bedroom. I left Lady Glyde with Miss Harkin, who was slumbering at the time, and joined Mrs. Rubell, with the object of kindly preventing her from feeling strange and nervous in consequence of the uncertainty of her situation. She did not appear to see it in that light, she seemed to be quite satisfied beforehand that Mr. Dawson would approve of her, and she sat 
calmly looking out of window, with every appearance of enjoying the country air. Some people might have thought such conduct suggestive of brazen assurance. I beg to say that I more liberally set it down to extraordinary strength of mind. Instead of the doctor coming up to us, I was sent for to see the doctor. I thought this change of affairs rather odd, but Mrs. Robell did not appear to be affected by it in any way. I left her still calmly looking out of the window, and still silently enjoying the country air. Mr. Dawson was waiting for me by himself in the breakfast-room. "'About this new nurse, Mrs. Mitchelson,' said the doctor. "'Yes, sir.' "'I find that she has been brought here from London by the wife of that fat old foreigner who is always trying to interfere with me. "'Mrs. Mitchelson, the fat old foreigner is a quack.' This was very rude. I was naturally shocked at it. "'Are you aware, sir,' I said, "'that you are talking of a nobleman?' "'Poor! He isn't the first quack with a handle to his name. "'They're all counts, hang em. "'He would not be a friend of Sir Percival Glyde, sir, "'if he was not a member of the highest aristocracy. "'Excepting the English aristocracy, of course.' "'Very well.' "'Mrs. Mitchelson, call him what you like, and let us get back to the nurse. "'I have been objecting to her already.' "'Without having seen her, sir?' "'Yes, without having seen her. "'She may be the best nurse in existence, but she is not a nurse of my providing. "'I have put that objection to Sir Percival as the master of the house. "'He doesn't support me. "'He says a nurse of my providing.' would have been a stranger from London also, and he thinks the woman ought to have a trial after his wife's aunt has taken the trouble to fetch her from London. There is some justice in that, and I can't decently say no, but I have made it a condition that she is to go at once, if I find reason to complain of her. This proposal being one which I have some right to make, as medical attendant, Sir Percival has consented to it, now, Mrs. Mitchelson, I know I can depend on you, and I want you to keep a sharp eye on the nurse for the first day or two, and to see that she gives Miss Halcombe no medicines but mine. This foreign nobleman of yours is dying to try his quack remedies, mesmerism included, on my patient, and a nurse who is brought here by his wife may be a little too willing to help him, you understand? Very well, then. We may go upstairs. Is the nurse there? I'll say a word to her before she goes into the sick-room. We found Mrs. Rubell still enjoying herself at the window. When I introduced her to Mr. Dawson, neither the doctor's doubtful looks nor the doctor's searching questions appeared to confuse her in the least. She answered him quietly in her broken English, and though he tried hard to puzzle her, she never betrayed the least ignorance so far about any part of her duties. This was doubtless the result of strength of mind, as I said before, and not of brazen assurance by any means. We all went into the bedroom, Mrs. Rubell looked very attentively at the patient, curtsied to Lady Glyde, set one or two little things right in the room, and sat down quietly in a corner to wait until she was wanted. Her ladyship seemed startled and annoyed by the appearance of the strange nurse. No one said anything, for fear of rousing Miss Halcombe, who was still slumbering, except the doctor, who whispered a question about the night. I softly answered, much 
as usual, and then Mr. Dawson went out. A Lady Glyde followed him, I suppose to speak about Mrs. Rubell. For my own part, I had made up my mind already that this quiet foreign person would keep her situation. She had all her wits about her, and she certainly understood her business. So far, I could hardly have done much better by the bedside myself. Remembering Mr. Dawson's caution to me, I subjected Mrs. Rubell to a severe scrutiny at certain intervals for the next three or four days. I over and over again entered the room softly and suddenly, but I never found her out in any suspicious action. Lady Glyde, who watched her as attentively as I did, discovered nothing either. I never detected a sign of the medicine bottles being tampered with. I never saw Mrs. Rubell say a word to the Count, or the Count to her. She managed Miss Halcombe with unquestionable care and discretion. The poor lady wavered backwards and forwards between a sort of sleepy exhaustion which was half faintness and half slumbering, and attacks of fever which brought with them more or less of wandering in her mind. Mrs. Rubell never disturbed her in the first case, and never startled her in the second, by appearing too suddenly at the bedside in the character of a stranger. Honour to whom honour is due, whether foreign or English, and I give her privilege impartially to Mrs. Rubell. She was remarkably uncommunicative about herself, and she was too quietly independent of all advice from experienced persons who understood the duties of a sick room. But with these drawbacks, she was a good nurse and she never gave either Lady Glyde or Mr. Dawson the shadow of a reason for complaining of her. The next circumstance of importance that occurred in the house was the temporary absence of the Count, occasioned by business, which took him to London. He went away, I think, on the morning of the fourth day after the arrival of Mrs. Rubell, and, at parting, he spoke to Lady Clyde very seriously in my presence, on the subject of Miss Halcombe. "'Trust Mr. Dawson,' he said, "'for a few days more, if you please, but if there is not some change for the better in that time, send for advice from London, which this mule of a doctor must accept in spite of himself.' offend mr dawson and save miss halcombe i say this seriously on my word of honour and from the bottom of my heart his lordship spoke with extreme feeling and kindness but poor lady glyde's nerves were so completely broken down that she seemed quite frightened at him she trembled from head to foot and allowed him to take his leave without uttering a word on her side she turned to me when he had gone, and said, "'Oh, Mrs. Mitchelson, I am heartbroken about my sister, and I have no friend to advise me. Do you think Mr. Dawson is wrong? He told me himself this morning that there was no fear, and no need to send for another doctor.' "'With all respect to Mr. Dawson,' I answered, "'in your ladyship's place, I should remember the Count's advice.' Lady Glyde turned away from me, suddenly, with an appearance of despair, for which I was quite unable to account. His advice, she said to herself, God help us, his advice. The Count was away from Blackwater Park, as nearly as I remember, a week. Sir Percival seemed to feel the loss of his lordship in various ways, and appeared also, I thought, 
much depressed and altered by the sickness and sorrow in the house. Occasionally he was so very restless that I could not help noticing it, coming and going, and wandering here and there and everywhere in the grounds. His inquiries about Miss Halcombe, and about his lady, whose failing health seemed to cause him sincere anxiety, were most attentive. I think his heart was much softened. If some kind clerical friend, some such friend as he might have found in my late excellent husband, had been near him at this time, cheering moral progress might have been made with Sir Percival. I seldom find myself mistaken on a point of this sort, having had experience to guide me in my happy married days. Her ladyship, the countess, who was now the only company for Sir Percival downstairs, rather neglected him, as I considered. Or perhaps it might have been that he neglected her. A stranger might almost have supposed that they were bent, now they were left together alone, on actually avoiding one another. This, of course, could not be. But it did so happen, nevertheless, that the countess made her dinner at luncheon time, and that she always came upstairs towards evening, although Mrs. Rubell had taken the nursing duties entirely off her hands. A Sir Percival dined by himself, and William, the man out of livery, made the remark in my hearing that his master had put himself on half rations of food and on a double allowance of drink. I attached no importance to such an insolent observation as this on the part of a servant. I reprobated it at the time, and I wish to be understood as reprobating it once more on this occasion. In the course of the next few days, Miss Halcombe did certainly seem by all of us to be mending a little. Our faith in Mr. Dawson revived. He appeared to be very confident about the case, and he assured Lady Glyde, when she spoke to him on the subject, that he would himself propose to send for a physician the moment he felt so much as the shadow of a doubt crossing his own mind. The only person among us who did not appear to be relieved by these words was the Countess. She said to me privately that she could not feel easy about Miss Halcombe on Mr. Dawson's authority, and that she should wait anxiously for her husband's opinion on his return. That return, his letters informed her, would take place in three days' time. The Count and Countess corresponded regularly every morning during his lordship's absence. They were in that respect, as in all others, a pattern to married people. On the evening of the third day I noticed a change in Miss Harkham which caused me serious apprehension. Mrs. Rubell noticed it too. We said nothing on the subject to Lady Glyde, who was then lying asleep, completely overpowered by exhaustion, on the sofa in the sitting-room. Mr. Dawson did not pay his evening visit till later than usual. As soon as he set eyes on his patient, I saw his face alter. He tried to hide it, but he looked both confused and alarmed. A messenger was sent to his residence, for his medicine chest, disinfecting preparations were used in the room, and a bed was made up for him in the house by his own directions. "'Has the fever turned to infection?' I whispered to him. "'I am afraid it has,' he answered. "'We shall know better to-morrow morning.' 
by Mr. Dawson's own directions, Lady Glyde was kept in ignorance of this change for the worse. He himself absolutely forbade her, on account of her health, to join us in the bedroom that night. She tried to resist. There was a sad scene, but he had his medical authority to support him, and he carried his point. The next morning, one of the men-servants was sent to London at eleven o'clock, with a letter to a physician in town, and with orders to bring the new doctor back with him by the earliest possible train. Half an hour after the messenger had gone, the Count returned to Blackwater Park. The Countess, on her own responsibility, immediately brought him in to see the patient there was no impropriety that I could discover in her taking this course. His lordship was a married man. He was old enough to be Miss Halcombe's father, and he saw her in the presence of a female relative, a Lady Glyde's aunt. Mr. Dawson nevertheless protested against his presence in the room, but I could plainly remark the doctor was too much alarmed to make any serious resistance on this occasion. The poor, suffering lady was past knowing any one about her. She seemed to take her friends for enemies. When the Count approached her bedside, her eyes, which had been wandering incessantly round and round the room before, settled on his face with a dreadful stare of terror, which I shall remember to my dying day. The Count sat down by her, felt her pulse and her temples, looked at her very attentively, and then turned round upon the doctor, with such an expression of indignation and contempt in his face, that the words failed on Mr. Dawson's lips, and he stood for a moment pale with anger and alarm, pale and perfectly speechless. His lordship looked next at me. "'When did the change happen?' he asked. I told him the time. Has Lady Glyde been in the room since? I replied that she had not. The doctor had absolutely forbidden her to come into the room on the evening before, and had repeated the order again in the morning. Have you and Mrs. Rubell been made aware of the full extent of the mischief? was his next question. We were aware, I answered that the malady was considered infectious. He stopped me before I could add anything more. It is typhus fever, he said. In the minute that passed, while these questions and answers were going on, Mr. Dawson recovered himself and addressed the Count with his customary firmness. It is not typhus fever, he remarked sharply. I protest against this intrusion, sir. No one has a right to put questions here but me. I have done my duty to the best of my ability. The Count interrupted him, not by words, but only by pointing to the bed. Mr. Dawson seemed to feel that silent contradiction to his assertion of his own ability, and to grow only the more angry under it. I say I have done my duty, he reiterated. A physician has been sent for from London. I will consult on the nature of the fever with him and with no one else. I insist on your leaving the room. I entered this room, sir, in the sacred interests of humanity, said the Count, and in the same interests, if the coming of the physician is delayed, I will enter it again. I warn you once more that the fever has turned to typhus, and that your treatment is responsible for this lamentable change. If that unhappy lady dies, I will give my testimony in a court of justice that your ignorance and obstinacy have been the cause of her death. Before Mr. Dawson could answer, before the Count could leave us, the door was opened from the sitting-room, and we saw Lady Glyde on the threshold. "'I must 
and will come in she said with extraordinary firmness instead of stopping her the count moved into the sitting-room and made way for her to go in on all other occasions he was the last man in the world to forget anything but in the surprise of the moment he apparently forgot the danger of infection from typhus and the urgent necessity of forcing lady glyde to take proper care of herself to my astonishment mr dawson showed more presence of mind he stopped her ladyship at the first step she took towards the bedside i am sincerely sorry i am sincerely grieved he said the fever may i fear be infectious until i am certain that it is not i entreat you to keep out of the room she struggled for a moment then suddenly dropped her arms and sank forward she had fainted the countess and i took her from the doctor and carried her into her own room the count preceded us and waited in the passage till i came out and told him that we had recovered her from the swoon i went back to the doctor to tell him by lady glyde's desire that she insisted on speaking to him immediately he withdrew at once to quiet her ladyship's agitation and to assure her of the physician's arrival in the course of a few hours those hours passed very slowly sir percival and the count were together downstairs and sent up from time to time to make their inquiries at last between five and six o'clock to our great relief the physician came he was a younger man than mr dawson very serious and very decided what he thought of the previous treatment i cannot say but it struck me as curious that he put many more questions to myself and to mrs rubell than he put to the doctor and that he did not appear to listen with much interest to what mr dawson said while he was examining mr dawson's patient i began to suspect from what i observed in this way that the count had been right about the illness all the way through and i was naturally confirmed in that idea when mr dawson after some little delay asked the one important question which the london doctor had been sent for to set at rest what is your opinion of the fever he inquired typhus replied the physician typhus fever beyond all doubt that quiet foreign person mrs rubell crossed her thin brown hands in front of her and looked at me with a very significant smile the count himself could hardly have appeared more gratified if he had been present in the room and had heard the confirmation of his own opinion after giving us some useful directions about the management of the patient and mentioning that he would come again in five days time the physician withdrew to consult in private with mr dawson he would offer no opinion on miss harcombe's chances of recovery he said it was impossible at that stage of the illness to pronounce one way or the other the five days passed anxiously countess fosco and myself took it by turns to relieve mrs rubell miss halcombe's condition growing worse and worse and requiring our utmost care and attention it was a terribly trying time lady glyde supported as mr dawson said by the constant strain of her suspense on her sister's account rallied in the most extraordinary manner and showed a firmness and determination for which i should myself never have given her credit 
she insisted on coming into the sick-room two or three times every day to look at Miss Halcombe with her own eyes, promising not to go too close to the bed if the doctor would consent to her wishes so far. Mr. Dawson very unwillingly made the concession required of him. I think he saw that it was hopeless to dispute with her. She came in every day, and she self-denyingly kept her promise. I felt it personally so distressing, as reminding me of my own affliction during my husband's last illness, to see how she suffered under these circumstances, that I must beg not to dwell on this part of the subject any longer. It is more agreeable to me to mention that no fresh disputes took place between Mr. Dawson and the Count. His lordship made all his inquiries by deputy, and remained continually in company with Sir Percival downstairs. On the fifth day, the physician came again, and gave us a little hope. He said the tenth day, from the first appearance of the typhus, would probably decide the result of the illness, and he arranged for his third visit to take place on that date. The interval passed as before, except that the Count went to London again one morning, and returned at night. On the tenth day it pleased a merciful providence to relieve our household from all further anxiety and alarm. The physician positively assured us that Miss Halcombe was out of danger. She wants no doctor now. All she requires is careful watching and nursing for some time to come, and that I see she has. Those were his own words. That evening I read my husband's touching sermon on recovery from sickness with more happiness and advantage in a spiritual point of view than I ever remember to have derived from it before. The effect of the good news on poor Lady Glyde was, I grieve to say, quite overpowering. She was too weak to bear the violent reaction, and in another day or two she sank into a state of debility and depression which obliged her to keep her room. Rest and quiet and change of air afterwards were the best remedies which Mr. Dawson could suggest for her benefit. It was fortunate that matters were no worse, for on the very day after she took to her room, the Count and the Doctor had another disagreement, and this time the dispute between them was of so serious a nature that Mr. Dawson left the house. I was not present at the time, but I understood that the subject of dispute was the amount of nourishment which it was necessary to give to assist Miss Halcombe's convalescence after the exhaustion of the fever. Mr. Dawson, now that his patient was safe, was less inclined than ever to submit to unprofessional interference and the Count, I cannot imagine why, lost all the self-control which he had so judiciously preserved on former occasions, and taunted the doctor over and over again with his mistake about the fever when it changed to typhus. The unfortunate affair ended in Mr. Dawson's appealing to Sir Percival, and threatening, now that he could leave, without absolute danger to Miss Halcombe, to withdraw from his attendance at Blackwater Park, if the Count's interference was not peremptorily suppressed from that moment. Sir Percival's reply, though not designedly uncivil, had only resulted in making matters worse, and Mr. Dawson had thereupon withdrawn from the house in a state of extreme indignation at Count Fosco's usage of him, and had sent in his bill the next morning. We were now, therefore, left without the attendance of a medical man. Although there was no actual necessity for another doctor, nursing and watching being, as the physician had observed, all that Miss Halcombe required, I should still, 
if my authority had been consulted, have obtained professional assistance from some other quarter, for form's sake. The matter did not seem to strike Sir Percival in that light. He said it would be time enough to send for another doctor, if Miss Halcombe showed any signs of a relapse. In the meanwhile, we had the Count to consult in any minor difficulty, and we need not unnecessarily disturb our patient in her present weak and nervous condition by the presence of a stranger at her bedside. There was much that was reasonable, no doubt, in these considerations, but they left me a little anxious, nevertheless. Nor was I quite satisfied in my own mind of the propriety of our concealing the doctor's absence, as we did, from Lady Glyde. It was a merciful deception, I admit, for she was in no state to bear any fresh anxieties. But still it was a deception, and as such, to a person of my principles, at best a doubtful proceeding. A second perplexing circumstance, which happened on the same day, and which took me completely by surprise, added greatly to the sense of uneasiness that was now weighing on my mind. I was sent for to see Sir Percival in the library. The Count, who was with him when I went in, immediately rose and left us alone together. Sir Percival civilly asked me to take a seat, and then, to my great astonishment, addressed me in these terms. I want to speak to you, Mrs. Mitchelson, about a matter which I decided on some time ago, and which I should have mentioned before, but for the sickness and trouble in the house. In plain words, I have reason for wishing to break up my establishment immediately at this place, leaving you in charge, of course, as usual. As soon as Lady Clyde and Miss Halcombe can travel, they must both have change of air, my friends, Count Bosco and the Countess, will leave us before that time to live in the neighbourhood of London, and I have reasons for not opening the house to any more company, with a view to economising as carefully as I can. I don't blame you, but my expenses here are a great deal too heavy. In short, I shall sell the horses and get rid of all the servants at once, I never do things by halves, as you know, and I mean to have the house clear of a pack of useless people by this time to-morrow. I listened to him, perfectly aghast with astonishment. Do you mean, Sir Percival, that I am to dismiss the indoor servants under my charge without the usual month's warning? I asked. Certainly I do. We may all be out of the house before another month and I am not going to leave the servants here in idleness, with no master to wait on. Who is to do the cooking, Sir Percival, while you are still staying here? Margaret Porcher can roast and boil, keep her. What do I want with a cook, if I don't mean to give any dinner parties? The servant you have mentioned is the most unintelligent servant in the house, Sir Percival. Keep her, I tell you and have a woman in from the village to do the cleaning, and go away again. My weekly expenses must and shall be lowered immediately. I don't send for you to make objections, Mrs. Mitchelson. I send for you to carry out my plans of economy. Dismiss the whole lazy pack of indoor servants to-morrow, except Porcher. She is as strong as a horse, and will make her work like a horse. You will excuse me for reminding you, Sir Percival, that if the servants go to-morrow, they must have a month's wages in lieu of a month's warning. Let them! A month's wages saves a month's waste and gluttony in the servants' hall. This last remark conveyed an aspersion of the most offensive kind on my management, 
I had too much self-respect to defend myself under so gross an imputation. Christian consideration for the helpless position of Miss Halcombe and Lady Clyde, and for the serious inconvenience which my sudden absence might inflict on them, alone prevented me from resigning my situation on the spot. I rose immediately. It would have lowered me in my own estimation to have permitted the interview to continue a moment longer. After that last remark, Sir Percival, I have nothing more to say. Your directions shall be attended to. Pronouncing those words, I bowed my head with the most distant respect, and went out of the room. The next day the servants left in a body. Sir Percival himself dismissed the grooms and stablemen, sending them with all the horses but one to London. Of the whole domestic establishment, indoors and out, there now remained only myself, Margaret Porcher, and the gardener this last living in his own cottage, and being wanted to take care of the one horse that remained in the stables. With the house left in this strange and lonely condition, with the mistress of it ill in her room, with Miss Halcombe still as helpless as a child, and with the doctor's attendants withdrawn from us in enmity, it was surely not unnatural that my spirits should sink, and my customary composure be very hard to maintain. My mind was ill at ease. I wished the poor ladies both well again, and I wished myself away from Blackwater Park. End of chapter 22《Chapter 23 of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. 2. The next event that occurred was of so singular a nature that it might have caused me a feeling of superstitious surprise if my mind had not been fortified by principle against any pagan weakness of that sort. The uneasy sense of something wrong in the family, which had made me wish myself away from Blackwater Park, was actually followed, strange to say, by my departure from the house. It is true that my absence was for a temporary period only, but the coincidence was, in my opinion, not the less remarkable on that account. My departure took place under the following circumstances. A day or two after the servants all left, I was again sent for to see Sir Percival. The undeserved slur which he had cast on my management of the household did not, I am happy to say, prevent me from returning good for evil to the best of my ability by complying with his request as readily and respectfully as ever. It cost me a struggle with that fallen nature which we all share in common, before I could suppress my feelings. Being accustomed to self-discipline, I accomplished the sacrifice. I found Sir Percival and Count Fosco sitting together again. On this occasion his lordship remained present at the interview, and assisted in the development of Sir Percival's views. The subject to which they now requested my attention related to the healthy change of air by which we all hoped that Miss Halcombe and Lady Glyde might soon be enabled to profit. Sir Percival mentioned that both the ladies would probably pass the autumn by invitation of Frederick Fairley Esquire at Limeridge House, Cumberland, 
but before they went there it was his opinion confirmed by count fosco who here took up the conversation and continued it to the end that they would benefit by a short residence first in the genial climate of torquay the great object therefore was to engage lodgings at that place affording all the comforts and advantages of which they stood in need and the great difficulty was to find an experienced person capable of choosing the sort of residence which they wanted in this emergency the count begged to inquire on sir percival's behalf whether i would object to give the ladies the benefit of my assistance by proceeding myself to torquay in their interests it was impossible for a person in my situation to meet any proposal made in these terms with a positive objection i could only venture to represent the serious inconvenience of my leaving blackwater park in the extraordinary absence of all the indoor servants with the one exception of margaret Porchet. but sir percival and his lordship declared that they were both willing to put up with inconvenience for the sake of the invalids i next respectfully suggested writing to an agent at torquay but i was met here by being reminded of the imprudence of taking lodgings without first seeing them i was also informed that the countess who would otherwise have gone to devonshire herself could not in lady glyde's present condition leave her niece and that sir percival and the count had business to transact together which would oblige them to remain at blackwater park in short it was clearly shown me that if i did not undertake the errand no one else could be trusted with it under these circumstances i could only inform sir percival that my services at the disposal of miss halcombe and lady glyde it was thereupon arranged that i should leave the next morning that i should occupy one or two days in examining all the most convenient houses in torquay and that i should return with my report as soon as i conveniently could a memorandum was written for me by his lordship stating the requisites which the place i was sent to take must be found to possess and a note of the pecuniary limit assigned to me was added by sir percival my own idea on reading over these instructions was that no such residence as i saw described could be found at any watering-place in england and that even if it could by chance be discovered it would certainly not be parted with for any period on such terms as i was permitted to offer i hinted at these difficulties to both the gentlemen but sir percival who undertook to answer me did not appear to feel them it was not for me to dispute the question i said no more but i felt a very strong conviction that the business on which i was sent away was so beset by difficulties that my errand was almost hopeless at starting before i left i took care to satisfy myself that miss halcombe was going on favourably there was a painful expression of anxiety in her face which made me fear that her mind on first recovering itself was not at ease but she was certainly strengthening more rapidly than i could have ventured to anticipate and she was able to send kind messages to lady glyde saying that she was fast getting well and entreating her ladyship not to exert herself again too soon i left her in charge of mrs rubell who was still as quietly independent of every one else in the house as ever when i knocked at lady glyde's door before going away i was told that she was still sadly weak and depressed 
my informant being the countess, who was then keeping her company in her room. Sir Percival and the Count were walking on the road to the lodge, as I was driven by in the chaise. I bowed to them, and quitted the house, with not a living soul left in the servants' offices but Margaret Porcher. Every one must feel what I have felt myself since that time, that these circumstances were more than unusual, they were almost suspicious. Let me, however, say again that it was impossible for me, in my dependent position, to act otherwise than I did. The result of my errand at Torquay was exactly what I had foreseen. No such lodgings as I was instructed to take could be found in the whole place, and the terms I was permitted to give were much too low for the purpose, even if I had been able to discover what I wanted. I accordingly returned to Blackwater Park, and informed Sir Percival, who met me at the door, that my journey had been taken in vain. He seemed too much occupied with some other subject to care about the failure of my errand, and his first words informed me that even in the short time of my absence another remarkable change had taken place in the house. The Count and Countess Bosco had left Blackwater Park for their new residence in St. John's Wood. I was not made aware of the motive for this sudden departure. I was only told that the Count had been very particular in leaving his kind compliments to me. When I ventured on asking Sir Percival whether Lady Glyde had any one to attend to her comforts in the absence of the Countess, he replied that she had Margaret Porcher to wait on her, and he added that a woman from the village had been sent for to do the work downstairs. The answer really shocked me. There was such a glaring impropriety in permitting an under-housemaid to fill the place of confidential attendant on Lady Glyde. I went upstairs at once, and met Margaret on the bedroom landing. Her services had not been required, naturally enough, her mistress having sufficiently recovered that morning to be able to leave her bed. I asked next after Miss Halcombe, but I was answered in a slouching, sulky way which left me no wiser than I was before. I did not choose to repeat the question, and perhaps provoke an impertinent reply. It was, in every respect, more becoming to a person in my position to present myself immediately in Lady Glyde's room. I found that her ladyship had certainly gained in health during the last few days. Although still sadly weak and nervous, she was able to get up without assistance, and to walk slowly about her room, feeling no worse effect from the exertion than a slight sensation of fatigue. She had been made a little anxious that morning about Miss Halcombe, through having received no news of her from any one. I thought this seemed to imply a blamable want of attention on the part of Mrs. Rubell, but I said nothing, and remained with Lady Glyde to assist her to dress. When she was ready, we both left the room together to go to Miss Halcombe. We were stopped in the passage by the appearance of Sir Percival. He looked as if he had been purposely waiting there to see us. "'Where are you going?' he said to Lady Glyde. "'To Marion's room,' she answered. "'It may spare you a disappointment,' remarked Sir Percival, "'if I tell you at once that you will not find her there.' "'Not find her there? No. She left the house yesterday morning with Fosco and his wife. Lady Glyde was not strong enough to bear the surprise of this extraordinary statement. She turned fearfully pale, and leaned back against the wall, 
looking at her husband in dead silence. I was so astonished myself that I hardly knew what to say. I asked Sir Percival if he really meant that Miss Halcombe had left Blackwater Park. I certainly mean it, he answered. In her state, Sir Percival, without mentioning her intentions to Lady Glyde? Before he could reply, her ladyship recovered herself a little, and spoke. Impossible! she cried out, in a loud, frightened manner, taking a step or two forward from the wall. Where was the doctor? Where was Mr. Dawson when Marian went away? Mr. Dawson wasn't wanted and wasn't here, said Sir Percival. He left of his own accord, which is enough of itself, to show that she was strong enough to travel. How you stared! If you don't believe she has gone, look for yourself. Open her room door, and all the other room doors, if you like. She took him at his word, and I followed her. There was no one in Miss Halcombe's room but Margaret Porcher, who was busy setting it to rights. There was no one in the spare rooms, or the dressing-rooms, when we looked into them afterwards. Sir Percival still waited for us in the passage. As we were leaving the last room that we had examined, Lady Clyde whispered, Don't go, Mrs. Mitchelson, don't leave me, for God's sake. Before I could say anything in return, she was out again in the passage, speaking to her husband. What does it mean, Sir Percival? I insist. I beg and pray you will tell me what it means. It means, he answered, that Miss Halcombe was strong enough yesterday morning to sit up and be dressed, and that she insisted on taking advantage of Fosco's going to London to go there too. To London? Yes, on her way to Limeridge. Lady Glyde turned and appealed to me. You saw Miss Halcombe last, she said. Tell me plainly, Mrs. Mitchelson, did you think she looked fit to travel? Not in my opinion, your ladyship. Sir Percival, on his side, instantly turned and appealed to me also. Before you went away, he said, did you or did you not? Tell the nurse that Miss Halcombe looked much stronger and better. I certainly made the remark, Sir Percival. He addressed her ladyship again the moment I offered that reply. Set one of Mrs. Mitchelson's opinions fairly against the other, he said, and try to be reasonable about a perfectly plain matter. If she had not been well enough to be moved, do you think we should any of us have risked letting her go? She has got three competent people to look after her, Fosco and your aunt and Mrs. Rubell, who went away with them expressly for that purpose. They took a whole carriage yesterday and made a bed for her on the seat in case she felt tired. Today, Fosco and Mrs. Rubell go on with her themselves to Cumberland. Why does Marian go to Limeridge and leave me here by myself? said her ladyship, interrupting Sir Percival. Because your uncle won't receive you till he has seen your sister first, he replied. Have you forgotten the letter he wrote to her at the beginning of her illness? It was shown to you. You read it yourself, and you ought to remember it. I do remember it. If you do, why should you be surprised at her leaving you? You want to be back at Limeridge. And she has gone there to get your uncle's leave for you on his own terms. Poor Lady Clyde's eyes filled with tears. Marian never left me before, she said, without bidding me good-bye. She would have bid you good-bye this time return sir percival if she had not been afraid of herself and of you she knew you would try to stop her she knew you would distress her by crying do you want to make any more objections if you do you must come downstairs and ask questions in the dining-room these worries upset me i want a glass of wine 
he left us suddenly. His manner, all through this strange conversation, had been very unlike what it usually was. He seemed to be almost as nervous and fluttered every now and then as his lady herself. I should never have supposed that his health had been so delicate, or his composure so easy to upset. I tried to prevail on Lady Glyde to go back to her room, but it was useless. She stopped in the passage, with the look of a woman whose mind was panic-stricken. "'Something has happened to my sister,' she said. "'Remember, my lady, what surprising energy there is in Miss Halcombe,' I suggested. She might well make an effort which other ladies in her situation would be unfit for. I hope and believe there is nothing wrong. I do, indeed. I must follow Marian, said her ladyship, with the same panic-stricken look. I must go where she has come. I must see that she is alive and well with my own eyes. Come, come down with me to Sir Percival. I hesitated, fearing that my presence might be considered an intrusion. I attempted to represent this to her ladyship, but she was deaf to me. She held my arm fast enough to force me to go downstairs with her, and she still clung to me with all the little strength she had at the moment when I opened the dining-room door. Sir Percival was sitting at the table with a decanter of wine before him. He raised the glass to his lips as we went in, and drained it at a draught. Seeing that he looked at me angrily when he put it down again, I attempted to make some apology for my accidental presence in the room. "'Do you suppose there are any secrets going on here?' he broke out suddenly. "'There are none. There is nothing at hand, nothing kept from you or from any one.' After speaking those strange words, loudly and sternly, he filled himself another glass of wine, and asked Lady Glyde what she wanted of him. "'If my sister is fit to travel, I am fit to travel,' said her ladyship, with more firmness than she had yet shown. "'I come to beg you will make allowances for my anxiety about Marian, and let me follow her at once by the afternoon train.' "'You must wait till to-morrow,' replied Sir Percival, and then— if you don't hear to the contrary, you can go. I don't suppose you are at all likely to hear to the contrary, so I shall write to Fosco by tonight's post. He said those last words, holding his glass up to the light, and looking at the wine in it, instead of at Lady Glyde. Indeed, he never once looked at her throughout the conversation. Such a singular want of good breeding in a gentleman of his rank impressed me, I own, very painfully. "'Why should you write to Count Fosco?' she asked, in extreme surprise. "'To tell him to expect you by the midday train,' said Sir Percival. "'He will meet you at the station when you get to London, and take you on to sleep at your aunt's in St. John's Wood.' Lady Glyde's hand began to tremble violently round my arm, why I could not imagine. There is no necessity for Count Bosco to meet me, she said. I would rather not stay in London to sleep. You must. You can't take the whole journey to Cumberland in one day. You must rest a night in London, and I don't choose you to go by yourself to an hotel. Fosco made the offer to your uncle to give you house-room on the way down, and your uncle has accepted. Here, here is a letter from him addressed to yourself. I ought to have sent it up this morning, but I forgot. Read it, and see what Mr. Fairley himself says to you. Lady Glyde looked at the letter for a moment, and then placed it in my hands. Read it, she said faintly. I don't know what is the matter with me. I can't read it myself. It was a note of only four lines, so short and so careless that it quite struck me. If I remember correctly, it contained no more than these words. Dearest Laura, please come whenever you like. Break the journey by sleeping at your aunt's house. Grieve to hear of dear Marian's illness. Affectionately yours, 
Frederick fairly. I would rather not go there. I would rather not stay a night in London, said her ladyship, breaking out eagerly with those words, before I had quite done reading the note, short as it was. Don't write to Count Bosco. Pray, pray, don't write to him. Sir Percival filled another glass from the decanter so awkwardly that he upset it, and spilt all the wine over the table. My sight seems to be failing me, he muttered to himself in an odd, muffled voice. He slowly set the glass up again, refilled it, and drained it once more at a draught. I began to fear, from his look and manner, that the wine was getting into his head. "'Pray don't write to Count Fosco,' persisted Lady Glyde, more earnestly than ever. "'Why not, I should like to know?' cried Sir Percival, with a sudden burst of anger that startled us both. "'Where can you stay more properly in London than at the place your uncle himself chooses for you at your aunt's house? Ask Mrs. Mitchelson.' The arrangement proposed was so unquestionably the right and the proper one, that I could make no possible objection to it. Much as I sympathised with Lady Glyde in other respects, I could not sympathise with her in her unjust prejudices against Count Fosco. I never before met with any lady of her rank and station who was so lamentably narrow-minded on the subject of foreigners. Neither her uncle's note, nor Sir Percival's increasing impatience, seemed to have the least effect on her. She still objected to staying a night in London. She still implored her husband not to write to the Count. "'Drop it!' said Sir Percival, rudely turning his back on us. If you haven't sense enough to know what is best for yourself, other people must know it for you. The arrangement is made, and there is an end of it. You are only wanted to do what Miss Halcombe has done before you. Marion, repeated her ladyship in a bewildered manner. Marion, sleeping in Count Fosco's house. Yes, in Count Fosco's house. She slept there last night to break the journey, and you are to follow her example and do what your uncle tells you. You are to sleep at Fosco's to-morrow night, as your sister did, to break the journey. Don't throw too many obstacles in my way. Don't make me repent of letting you go at all. He started to his feet, and suddenly walked out into the veranda through the open glass doors. Will your ladyship excuse me, I whispered, if I suggest that we had better not wait here till Sir Percival comes back. I am very much afraid he is over-excited with wine. She consented to leave the room in a weary, absent manner. As soon as we were safe upstairs again, I did all I could to compose her ladyship's spirits. I reminded her that Mr. Fairley's letters to Miss Halcombe and to herself did certainly sanction and even render necessary, sooner or later, the course that had been taken. She agreed to this, and even admitted of her own accord, that both letters were strictly in character with her uncle's peculiar disposition. But her fears about Miss Halcombe, and her unaccountable dread of sleeping at the Count's house in London, still remained unshaken, in spite of every consideration that I could urge. I thought it my duty to protest against Lady Glyde's unfavourable opinion of his lordship, and I did so with becoming forbearance and respect. "'Your ladyship will pardon my freedom,' I remarked in conclusion, "'but it is said by their fruits ye shall know them.' I am sure the Count's constant kindness and constant attention, from the very beginning of Miss Halcombe's illness, merit our best confidence and esteem. Even his lordship's serious misunderstanding with Mr. Dawson, 
was entirely attributable to his anxiety on Miss Falcombe's account. What misunderstanding? inquired her ladyship, with a look of sudden interest. I related the unhappy circumstances under which Mr. Dawson had withdrawn his attendance, mentioning them all the more readily, because I disapproved of Sir Percival's continuing to conceal what had happened as he had done in my presence from the knowledge of Lady Glyde. Her ladyship started up with every appearance of being additionally agitated and alarmed by what I had told her. Worse! worse than i thought she said walking about the room in a bewildered manner the count knew mr dawson would never consent to marian's taking a journey he purposely insulted the doctor to get him out of the house oh my lady my lady i remonstrated mrs mitchelson she went on vehemently no words that ever were spoken persuade me that my sister is in that man's power and in that man's house with her own consent my horror of him is such that nothing sir percival could say and no letters my uncle could write would induce me if i had only my own feelings to consult to eat drink or sleep under his roof but my misery of suspense about marian gives me the courage to follow her anywhere to follow her even into count fosco's house i thought it right at this point to mention that Miss Harcombe had already gone on to Cumberland, according to Sir Percival's account of the matter. I am afraid to believe it, answered her ladyship. I am afraid she is still in that man's house. If I am wrong, if she has really gone on to Limeridge, I am resolved I will not sleep to-morrow night under Count Fosco's roof. My dearest friend in the world next to my sister lives near London. You have heard me. You have heard Miss Halcombe speak of Mrs. Vesey. I mean to write, and propose to sleep at her house. I don't know how I shall get there. I don't know how I shall avoid the Count. But to that refuge I will escape in some way, if my sister has gone to Cumberland. All I ask of you to do is to see yourself that my letter to Mrs. Vesey goes to London to-night, as certainly as Sir Percival's letter goes to Count Fosco. I have reasons for not trusting the post-bag downstairs. Will you keep my secret and help me in this? It is the last favour, perhaps, that I shall ever ask of you. I hesitated. I thought it all very strange. I almost feared that her ladyship's mind had been a little affected by recent anxiety and suffering. At my own risk, however, I ended by giving my consent. If the letter had been addressed to a stranger, or to any one but a lady so well known to me by report as Mrs. Vesey, I might have refused. I thank God, looking to what happened afterwards. I thank God I never thwarted that wish or any other which Lady Glyde expressed to me on the last day of her residence at Blackwater Park. The letter was written and given into my hands. I myself put it into the post-box in the village that evening. We saw nothing more of Sir Percival for the rest of the day. I slept, by Lady Glyde's own desire, in the next room to hers, with the door open between us. There was something so strange and dreadful in the loneliness and emptiness of the house, that I was glad on my side to have a companion near me. Her ladyship sat up late, reading letters and burning them, and emptying her drawers and cabinets of little things she prized, as if she never expected to return to Blackwater Park. Her sleep was sadly disturbed when she at last went to bed. She cried out, in it several times, once so loud that she woke herself. Whatever her dreams were, she did not think fit to communicate them to me. Perhaps in my situation I had no right to expect that she should do so. It matters little now. I was sorry for her 
I was indeed heartily sorry for her all the same. The next day was fine and sunny. Sir Percival came up after breakfast to tell us that the chaise would be at the door at a quarter to twelve, the train to London stopping at our station at twenty minutes after. He informed Lady Glyde that he was obliged to go out, but added that he hoped to be back before she left. If any unforeseen accident delayed him, I was to accompany her to the station, and to take special care that she was in time for the train. Sir Percival communicated these directions very hastily, walking here and there about the room all the time. Her ladyship looked attentively after him wherever he went. He never once looked at her in return. She only spoke when he had done, and then she stopped him as he approached the door by holding out her hand. I shall see you no more, she said in a very marked manner. This is our parting, our parting it may be for ever. Will you try to forgive me, Percival, as heartily as I forgive you? His face turned of an awful whiteness all over, and great beads of perspiration broke out on his bald forehead. "'I shall come back,' he said, and made for the door, as hastily as if his wife's farewell words had frightened him out of the room. I had never liked Sir Percival, but the manner in which he left Lady Glyde made me feel ashamed of having eaten his bread and lived in his service. I thought of saying a few comforting and Christian words to the poor lady, but there was something in her face, as she looked after her husband when the door closed on him, that made me alter my mind and keep silent. At the time named, the chaise drew up at the gates. Her ladyship was right. Sir Percival never came back. I waited for him till the last moment, and waited in vain. No positive responsibility lay on my shoulders, and yet I did not feel easy in my mind. It is of your own free will, I said, as the chaise drove through the lodge gates, that your ladyship goes to London. I will go anywhere, she answered to end the dreadful suspense that I am suffering at this moment. She had made me feel almost as anxious and as uncertain about Miss Halcombe as she felt herself. I presumed to ask her to write me a line, if all went well in London. She answered, most willingly, Mrs. Mitchelson. We all have our crosses to bear, my lady, I said, seeing her silent and thoughtful after she had promised to write. She made no reply. She seemed to be too much wrapped up in her own thoughts to attend to me. I fear your ladyship rested badly last night, I remarked, after waiting a little. Yes, she said. I was terribly disturbed by dream. Indeed, my lady, I thought she was going to tell me her dreams, but no, when she spoke next, it was only to ask a question. You posted the letter to Mrs. Vesey with your own hands? Yes, my lady. Did Sir Percival say yesterday that Count Fosco was to meet me at the terminus in London? He did, my lady. She sighed heavily when I answered that last question and said no more. We arrived at the station with hardly two minutes to spare. The gardener who had driven us managed about the luggage while I took the ticket. The whistle of the train was sounding when I joined her ladyship on the platform. She looked very strangely and pressed her hand over her heart as if some sudden pain or fright had overcome her at that moment. I wish you were going with me, she said, catching eagerly at my arm when I gave her the ticket. If there had been time, if I had felt the day before as I felt then, 
I would have made my arrangements to accompany her, even though the doing so had obliged me to give Sir Percival warning on the spot. As it was, her wishes, expressed at the last moment only, were expressed too late for me to comply with them. She seemed to understand this herself before I could explain it, and did not repeat her desire to have me for a travelling companion. The train drew up at the platform. She gave the gardener a present for his children, and took my hand in her simple hearty manner before she got into the carriage. "'You have been very kind to me and to my sister,' she said. "'Kind when we were both friendless. I shall remember you gratefully as long as I live to remember any one. Good-bye, and God bless you.' She spoke those words with a tone and a look which brought the tears into my eyes. She spoke them as if she was bidding me farewell for ever. "'Good-bye, my lady,' I said, putting her into the carriage and trying to cheer her. "'Good-bye for the present only. Good-bye with my best and kindest wishes for happier times.' She shook her head and shuddered as she settled herself in the carriage. The guard closed the door. "'Do you believe in dreams?' she whispered to me at the window. "'My dreams last night were dreams I have never had before. The terror of them is hanging over me still.' The whistle sounded before I could answer, and the train moved. Her pale, quiet face looked at me for the last time, looked sorrowfully and solemnly from the window. She waved her hand, and I saw her no more. Towards five o'clock, on the afternoon of that same day, having a little time to myself, in the midst of the household duties which now pressed upon me, I sat down alone in my own room, to try and compose my mind with the volume of my husband's sermons. For the first time in my life I found my attention wandering over those pious and cheering words. Concluding that Lady Glyde's departure must have disturbed me far more seriously than I had myself supposed, I put the book aside, and went out to take a turn in the garden. Sir Percival had not yet returned, to my knowledge, so I could feel no hesitation about showing myself in the grounds. On turning the corner of the house, and gaining a view of the garden, I was startled by seeing a stranger walking in it. The stranger was a woman. She was lounging along the path with her back to me, and was gathering the flowers. As I approached, she heard me and turned round. My blood curdled in my veins. The strange woman in the garden was Mrs. Rupel. I could neither move nor speak. She came up to me as composedly as ever, with her flowers in her hand. "'What is the matter, ma'am?' she said quietly. "'You, here!' I gasped out, not gone to London, not gone to Cumberland. Mrs. Rubell smelt at her flowers with a smile of malicious pity. Certainly not, she said. I have never left Blackwater Park. I summoned breath enough and courage enough for another question. Where is Miss Halcombe? Mrs. Rubell fairly laughed at me this time and replied in these words, "'Miss Halcombe, ma'am, has not left the Blackwater Park either.' When I heard that astounding answer, all my thoughts were startled back on the instant to my parting with Lady Glyde. I can hardly say I reproached myself, but at that moment I think I would have given many a year's hard savings to have known four hours earlier what I knew now. Mrs. Rupel waited, quietly arranging her nosegay, as if she expected me to say something. I could say nothing. I thought of Lady Glyde's worn-out energies and weakly health, and I trembled for the time when the shock of the discovery that I had made would fall on her. For a minute or more 
my fears for the poor lady silenced me at the end of that time mrs rubell looked up sideways from her flowers and said here is sir percival ma'am returned from his ride i saw him as soon as she did he came towards us slashing viciously at the flowers with his riding whip when he was near enough to see my face he stopped struck at his boot with the whip and burst out laughing so harshly and so violently that the birds flew away startled from the tree by which he stood well mrs mitchelson he said you have found it out at last have you i made no reply he turned to mrs rubell when did you show yourself in the garden i showed myself about half an hour ago sir you said i might take my liberty again as soon as lady glyde had gone away to london quite right i don't blame you i only asked the question he waited a moment and then addressed himself once more to me you can't believe it can you he said mockingly here come along and see for yourself he led the way round to the front of the house i followed him and mrs rubell followed me after passing through the iron gates he stopped and pointed with his whip to the disused middle wing of the building there he said look up at the first floor you know the old elizabethan bedrooms miss harkham is snug and safe in one of the best of them at this moment take her in mrs rubell you've got your key take mrs mitchelson in and that her own eye satisfy her that there is no deception this time the tone in which he spoke to me and the minute or two that had passed since we left the garden helped me to recover my spirits a little what i might have done at this critical moment if all my life had been passed in service i cannot say as it was possessing the feelings the principles and the bringing up of a lady i could not hesitate about the right course to pursue my duty to myself and my duty to lady glyde alike forbade me to remain in the employment of a man who had shamefully deceived us both by a series of atrocious falsehoods i must beg permission sir percival to speak a few words to you in private i said having done so i shall be ready to proceed with this person to miss halcombe's room mrs rubell whom i had indicated by a slight turn of my head insolently sniffed at her nosegay and walked away with great deliberation towards the house door well said sir percival sharply what is it now i wish to mention sir that i am desirous of resigning the situation i now hold at blackwater park that was literally how i put it i was resolved that the first words spoken in his presence should be words which expressed my intention to leave his service he eyed me with one of his blackest looks and thrust his hands savagely into the pockets of his riding coat why he said why i should like to know it is not for me sir percival to express an opinion on what has taken place in this house i desire to give no offence i merely wish to say that i do not feel it consistent with my duty to lady glyde and to myself to remain any longer in your service is it consistent with your duty to me to stand there casting suspicion on me to my face he broke out in his most violent manner i see what you're driving at you have taken your own mean underhand view of an innocent deception practised on lady glyde for her own good it was essential to her health that she should have a change of air immediately and you know as well as i do she would never have gone away if she had been told miss halcombe was still left here she has been deceived in her own interests and i don't care who knows it go if you like there are plenty of housekeepers as good as you to be had for the asking 
go when you please, but take care how you spread scandals about me and my affairs when you're out of my service. Tell the truth, and nothing but the truth, or it will be the worse for you. See Miss Halcombe for yourself. See if she hasn't been as well taken care of in one part of the house as in the other. Remember the doctor's own orders that Lady Glyde was to have a change of air at the earliest possible opportunity. Bear all that well in mind, and then say anything against me and my proceedings if you dare. He poured out these words fiercely, all in a breath, walking backwards and forwards, and striking about him in the air with his whip. Nothing that he said or did shook my opinion of the disgraceful series of falsehoods that he had told in my presence the day before, or of the cruel deception by which he had separated Lady Glyde from her sister, and had sent her uselessly to London, when she was half distracted with anxiety on Miss Halcombe's account. I naturally kept these thoughts to myself, and said nothing more to irritate him, but I was not the less resolved to persist in my purpose. A soft answer turneth away wrath, and I suppressed my own feelings accordingly when it was my turn to reply. While I am in your service, Sir Percival, I said, I hope I know my duty well enough not to inquire into your motives. When I am out of your service, I hope I know my own place well enough not to speak of matters which don't concern me. When do you want to go? he asked, interrupting me without ceremony. Don't suppose I am anxious to keep you. Don't suppose I care about your leaving the house. I am perfectly fair and open in this matter from first to last. When do you want to go? I should wish to leave at your earliest convenience, Sir Percival. My convenience has nothing to do with it. I shall be out of the house for good and all to-morrow morning, and I can settle your accounts to-night. If you want to study anybody's convenience, it had better be Miss Halcombe's. Mrs. Rubell's time is up to-day, and she has reasons for wishing to be in London to-night. If you go at once, Miss Halcombe won't have a soul left here to look after her. I hope it is unnecessary for me to say that I was quite incapable of deserting Miss Halcombe in such an emergency as had now befallen Lady Glyde and herself. After first distinctly ascertaining from Sir Percival that Mrs. Rubell was certain to leave at once if I took her place, and after also obtaining permission to arrange for Mr. Dawson's resuming his attendance on his patient, I willingly consented to remain at Blackwater Park until Miss Halcombe no longer required my services. It was settled that I should give Sir Percival's solicitor a week's notice before I left, and that he was to undertake the necessary arrangements for appointing my successor. The matter was discussed in very few words. At its conclusion, Sir Percival abruptly turned on his heel, and left me free to join Mrs. Rubell. That singular foreign person had been sitting composedly on the doorstep all this time, waiting till I could follow her to Miss Halcombe's room. I had hardly walked halfway towards the house, when Sir Percival who had withdrawn in the opposite direction, suddenly stopped and called me back. "'Why are you leaving my service?' he asked. The question was so extraordinary, after what had just passed between us, that I hardly knew what to say in answer to it. "'Mind, I don't know why you are going,' he went on. "'You must give a reason for leaving me, I suppose, when you get another situation.' What reason? The breaking up of the family? Is that it? There can be no positive objection, Sir Percival, to that reason. Very well. That's all I want to know. If people apply for your character, that's your reason, stated by yourself. You go in consequence of the breaking up of the family. He turned away again, before I could say another word, and walked out rapidly into the grounds. 
His manner was as strange as his language. I acknowledge he alarmed me. Even the patience of Mrs. Rubell was getting exhausted when I joined her at the house door. At last, she said, with a shrug of her lean foreign shoulders. She led the way into the inhabited side of the house, ascended the stairs, and opened with her key the door at the end of the passage, which communicated with the old Elizabethan rooms, a door never previously used in my time at Blackwater Park. The rooms themselves I knew well, having entered them myself on various occasions from the other side of the house. Mrs. Rubell stopped at the third door along the old gallery, handed me the key of it, with the key of the door of communication, and told me I should find Miss Holcombe in that room. Before I went in, I thought it desirable to make her understand that her attendance had ceased. Accordingly, I told her in plain words that the charge of the sick lady henceforth devolved entirely on myself. "'I am glad to hear it, ma'am,' said Mrs. Rubell. "'I want to go very much.' "'Do you leave to-day?' I asked, to make sure of her. "'Now that you have taken charge, ma'am, I leave in half an hour's time. Sir Percival has kindly placed at my disposition the gardener and the chaise whenever I want them. I shall want them in half an hour's time to go to the station. I am packed up in anticipation already.' I wish you good day, ma'am. She dropped a brisk curtsy, and walked back along the gallery, humming a little tune, and keeping time to it cheerfully, with the nosegay in her hand. I am sincerely thankful to say, that was the last I saw of Mrs. Rubell. When I went into the room, Miss Holcombe was asleep. I looked at her anxiously, as she lay in the dismal, high, old-fashioned bed. She was certainly not in any respect altered for the worse since I had seen her last. She had not been neglected, I am bound to admit, in any way that I could perceive. The room was dreary and dusty and dark, but the window, looking on a solitary courtyard at the back of the house, was open to let in the fresh air and all that could be done to make the place comfortable had been done. The whole cruelty of Sir Percival's deception had fallen on poor Lady Glyde. The only ill usage which either he or Mrs. Rubell had inflicted on Miss Halcombe consisted, so far as I could see, in the first offence of hiding her away. I stole back, leaving the sick lady still peacefully asleep, to give the gardener instructions about bringing the doctor. I begged the man, after he had taken Mrs. Rubell to the station, to drive round by Mr. Dawson's, and leave a message in my name, asking him to call and see me. I knew he would come on my account, and I knew he would remain when he found Count Fosco had left the house. In due course of time the gardener returned, and said that he had driven round by Mr. Dawson's residence, after leaving Mrs. Rubell at the station. The doctor sent me word that he was poorly in health himself, but that he would call, if possible, the next morning. Having delivered his message, the gardener was about to withdraw, but I stopped him to request that he would come back before dark, and sit up that night in one of the empty bedrooms, so as to be within call, in case I wanted him. He understood, readily enough, my unwillingness to be left alone all night, in the most desolate part of that desolate house, and we arranged that he should come in between eight and nine. He came punctually, and I found cause to be thankful that I had adopted the precaution of calling him in. Before midnight, Sir Percival's strange temper broke out in the most violent and most alarming manner, and if the gardener had not been on the spot to pacify him on the instant, I am afraid to think what might have happened. Almost all the afternoon and evening 
he had been walking about the house and grounds in an unsettled excitable manner having in all probability as i thought taken an excessive quantity of wine at his solitary dinner however that may be i heard his voice calling loudly and angrily in the new wing of the house as i was taking a turn backwards and forwards along the gallery the last thing at night the gardener immediately ran down to him and i closed the door of communication to keep the alarm if possible from reaching miss harcombe's ears it was full half an hour before the gardener came back he declared that his master was quite out of his senses not through the excitement of drink as i had supposed but through a kind of panic or frenzy of mind for which it was impossible to account he had found sir percival walking backwards and forwards by himself in the hall swearing with every appearance of the most violent passion that he would not stop another minute alone in such a dungeon as his own house and that he would take the first stage of his journey immediately in the middle of the night the gardener on approaching him had been hunted out with oaths and threats to get the horse and chaise ready immediately in a quarter of an hour sir percival had joined him in the yard had jumped into the chaise and lashing the horse into a gallop had driven himself away with his face as pale as ashes in the moonlight the gardener had heard him shouting and cursing at the lodge-keeper to get up and open the gate had heard the wheels roll furiously on again in the still night when the gate was unlocked and knew no more the next day or a day or two after i forget which the chaise was brought back from knowlesbury our nearest town by the ostler at the old inn sir percival had stopped there and had afterwards left by the train for what destination the man could not tell I never received any further information, either from himself or from anyone else, of Sir Percival's proceedings, and I am not even aware at this moment whether he is in England or out of it. He and I have not met since he drove away like an escaped criminal from his own house, and it is my fervent hope and prayer that we may never meet again. My own part of this sad family story is now drawing to an end i have been informed that the particulars of miss harcombe's waking and of what passed between us when she found me sitting by her bedside are not material to the purpose which is to be answered by the present narrative it will be sufficient for me to say in this place that she was not herself conscious of the means adopted to remove her from the inhabited to the uninhabited part of the house she was in a deep sleep at the time whether naturally or artificially produced she could not say in my absence at torquay and in the absence of all the resident servants except margaret porcher who was perpetually eating drinking or sleeping when she was not at work the secret transfer of miss halcombe from one part of the house to the other was no doubt easily performed mrs rubell as i discovered for myself in looking about the room had provisions and all other necessaries together with the means of heating water broth and so on without kindling a fire placed at her disposal during the few days of her imprisonment with the sick lady she had declined to answer the questions which miss halcombe naturally put but had not in other respects treated her with unkindness or neglect the disgrace of lending herself to a vile deception is the only disgrace with which i can conscientiously charge mrs rubell I need write no particulars, and I am relieved to know it, of the effect produced on Miss Halcombe by the news of Lady Glyde's departure. 
or by the far more melancholy tidings which reached us only too soon afterwards at blackwater park in both cases i prepared her mind beforehand as gently and as carefully as possible having the doctor's advice to guide me in the last case only through mr dawson's being too unwell to come to the house for some days after i had sent for him it was a sad time a time which it afflicts me to think of or to write of now the precious blessings of religious consolation which i endeavoured to convey were long in reaching miss harcombe's heart but i hope and believe they came home to her at last i never left her till her strength was restored the train which took me away from that miserable house was the train which took her away also we parted very mournfully in london i remained with a relative at islington and she went on to mr fairley's house in cumberland i have only a few lines more to write before i close this painful statement they are dictated by a sense of duty in the first place i wish to record my own personal conviction that no blame whatever in connection with the events which i have now related attaches to count fosco i am informed that a dreadful suspicion has been raised and that some very serious constructions are placed upon his lordship's conduct my persuasion of the count's innocence remains however quite unshaken if he assisted sir percival in sending me to torquay he assisted under a delusion for which as a foreigner and a stranger he was not to blame if he was concerned in bringing mrs rubell to blackwater park it was his misfortune and not his fault when that foreign person was base enough to assist a deception planned and carried out by the master of the house i protest in the interests of morality against blame being gratuitously and wantonly attached to the proceedings of the count in the second place i desire to express my regret at my own inability to remember the precise day on which lady glyde left blackwater park for london i am told that it is of the last importance to ascertain the exact date of that lamentable journey and i have anxiously taxed my memory to recall it the effort has been in vain i can only remember now that it was towards the latter part of july we all know the difficulty after a lapse of time of fixing precisely on a past date unless it has been previously written down that difficulty is greatly increased in my case by the alarming and confusing events which took place about the period of lady glyde's departure i heartily wish i had made a memorandum at the time i heartily wish my memory of the date was as vivid as my memory of that poor lady's face when it looked at me sorrowfully for the last time from the carriage window End of chapter twenty three Chapter twenty four of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The story continued in several narratives. One. The narrative of Hester Pinhorn, cook, in the service of Count Fosco, taken down from her own statement i am sorry to say that i have never learnt to read or write i have been a hard-working woman all my life 
and have kept a good character. I know that it is a sin and wickedness to say the thing which is not, and I will truly beware of doing so on this occasion. All that I know I will tell, and I humbly beg the gentleman who takes this down to put my language right as he goes on, and to make allowances for my being no scholar. In this last summer I happened to be out of place through no fault of my own, and I heard of a situation as plain cook at number five Forest Road, St. John's Wood. I took the place on trial. My master's name was Fosco. My mistress was an English lady. He was count and she was countess. There was a girl to do housemaid's work when I got there. She was not over clean or tidy, but there was no harm in her. I and she were the only servants in the house. Our master and mistress came after we got in, and as soon as they did come, we were told downstairs that company was expected from the country. The company was my mistress's niece, and the back bedroom on the first floor was got ready for her. My mistress mentioned to me that Lady Glyde, that was her name, was in poor health, and that I must be particular in my cooking accordingly. She was to come that day as well as I can remember. But whatever you do, don't trust my memory in the matter. I am sorry to say it's no use asking me about days of the month and such like. Except Sundays, half my time I take no heed of them, being a hard-working woman and no scholar. All I know is Lady Glyde came, and when she did come, a fine fright she gave us all surely. I don't know how Master brought her to the house, being hard at work at the time, but he did bring her in the afternoon, I think, and the housemaid opened the door to them and showed them into the parlour. Before she had been long down in the kitchen again with me, we heard a hurry scurry upstairs, and the parlour bell ringing like mad, and my mistress's voice calling out for help. We both ran up and there we saw the lady laid on the sofa, with her face ghastly white, and her hands fast clenched, and her head drawn down to one side. She had been taken with a sudden fright, my mistress said, and master, he told us she was in a fit of convulsions. I ran out, knowing the neighbourhood a little better than the rest of them, to fetch the nearest doctor's help. The nearest help was at Goodricks and Garth's, who worked together as partners, and had a good name and connection, as I have heard, all round St. John's Wood. Mr. Goodrick was in, and he came back with me directly. It was some time before he could make himself of much use. The poor unfortunate lady fell out of one fit into another, and went on so till she was quite wearied out and as helpless as a newborn babe. We then got her to bed. Mr. Goodrick went away to his house for medicine, and came back again in a quarter of an hour or less. Besides the medicine, he brought a bit of hollow mahogany wood with him, shaped like a kind of trumpet, and after waiting a little while, he put one end over the lady's heart, and the other to his ear, and listened carefully. When he had done, he says to my mistress, who was in the room, This is a very serious case, he says. I recommend you to write to Lady Glyde's friends directly. My mistress says to him, Is it heart disease? And he says, Yes, heart disease of a most dangerous kind. He told her exactly what he thought was the matter, which I was not clever enough to understand. But I know this. He ended by saying that he was afraid neither his help nor any other doctor's help was likely to be of much service. My mistress took this ill news more quietly than my master. He was a big, fat, odd sort of elderly man who kept birds and white mice and spoke to them as if they were so many Christian children. He seemed terribly cut up by what had happened. Ah, poor Lady Glyde, P. 
poor dear lady glyde he says and when stalking about wringing his fat hands more like a play-actor than a gentleman for one question my mistress asked the doctor about the lady's chances of getting round he asked a good fifty at least i declare he quite tormented us all and when he was quiet at last out he went into the bit of back garden picking trumpery little nosegays and asking me to take them upstairs and make the sick room look pretty with them <laughs> as if that did any good i think he must have been at times a little soft in his head but he was not a bad master he had a monstrous civil tongue of his own and a jolly easy coaxing way with him i liked him a deal better than my mistress she was a hard one if ever there was a hard one yet towards night-time the lady roused up a little she had been so wearied out before that by the convulsions that she never stirred hand or foot or spoke a word to anybody she moved in the bed now and stared about her at the room and us in it she must have been a nice-looking lady when well with light hair and blue eyes and all that her rest was troubled at night at least so i heard from my mistress who sat up alone with her i only went in once before going to bed to see if i could be of any use and then she was talking to herself in a confused rambling manner she seemed to want sadly to speak to somebody who was absent from her somewhere i couldn't catch the name the first time and the second time master knocked at the door with his regular mouthful of questions and another of his trumpery nosegays when i went in early the next morning the lady was clean worn out again and lay in a kind of faint sleep mr goodrick brought his partner mr garth with him to advise they said she must not be disturbed out of her rest on any account they asked my mistress many questions at the other end of the room about what the lady's health had been in past times and who had attended her and whether she had ever suffered much and long together under distress of mind i remember my mistress said yes to that last question and mr goodrick looked at mr garth and shook his head and mr garth looked at mr goodrick and shook his head they seemed to think that the distress might have something to do with the mischief at the lady's heart she was but a frail thing to look at poor creature very little strength at any time i should say very little strength later on the same morning when she woke the lady took a sudden turn and got seemingly a great deal better i was not let in again to see her no more was the housemaid for the reason that she was not to be disturbed by strangers what i heard of her being better was through my master he was in wonderful good spirits about the change and looked in at the kitchen window from the garden with his great big curly brimmed white hat on to go out good mrs cook says he lady glyde is better my mind is more easy than it was and i am going out to stretch my big legs with a sunny little summer walk shall i order for you shall i mark it for you mrs cook what are you making there a nice tart for dinner oh much crust if you please much crisp crust my dear that melts and crumbles delicious in the mouth <laughs> that was his way he was past sixty and fond of pastry <laughs> just think of that the doctor came again in the forenoon and saw for himself that lady glyde had woke up better he forbid us to talk to her or to let her talk to us in case she was that way disposed saying she must be kept quiet before all things and encouraged to sleep as much as possible she did not seem to want to talk whenever i saw her except overnight when i couldn't make out what she was saying she seemed too much worn down mr goodrick was not nearly in such good spirits about her as master he said nothing when he came downstairs, except that he would call again at five o'clock. 
about that time, which was before Master came home again, the bell rang hard from the bedroom, and my mistress ran out into the landing and called to me to go for Mr. Goodrick and tell him the lady had fainted. I got on my bonnet and shawl when, as good luck would have it, the doctor himself came to the house for his promised visit. I let him in and went upstairs along with him. Lady Glyde was just as usual, says my mistress to him at the door. She was awake and looking about her in a strange forlorn manner when I heard her give a sort of half cry and she fainted in a moment. The doctor went up to the bed and stooped down over the sick lady. He looked very serious all on a sudden at the sight of her and put his hand on her heart. My mistress stared hard in Mr. Goodrick's face. Not dead, says she, whispering, and turning all of a tremble from head to foot. Yes, says the doctor, very quiet and grave. Dead. I was afraid it would happen suddenly when I examined her heart yesterday. My mistress stepped back from the bedside while he was speaking and trembled and trembled again. Dead, she whispers to herself. Dead so suddenly. Dead so soon. What will the Count say? Mr. Goodrick advised her to go downstairs and quiet herself a little. You have been sitting up all night, says he and your nerves are shaken. This person, says he, meaning me, this person will stay in the room till I can send for the necessary assistance. My mistress did as he told her. I must prepare the count, she says. I must carefully prepare the count. And so she left us, shaking from head to foot, and went out. Your master is a foreigner, says Mr. Goodrick, when my mistress had left us. Does he understand about registering the death? I can't rightly tell, sir, says I, but I should think not. The doctor considered a minute, and then says he, I don't usually do such things, says he, but it may save the family trouble in this case if I register the death myself. I shall pass the district office in half an hour's time, and I can easily look in. Mention, if you please, that I will do so. Yes, sir says I, with thanks, I'm sure, for your kindness in thinking of it. You don't mind staying here till I can send you the proper person, says he. No, sir, says I, I'll stay with the poor lady till then. I suppose nothing more could be done, sir, than was done, says I. No, says he, nothing. She must have suffered sadly before ever I saw her. The case was hopeless when I was called in. Ah, oh, dear me, we all come to it sooner or later, don't we, sir, says I. He gave no answer to that. He didn't seem to care about talking. He said, good day, and went out. I stopped by the bedside from that time, till the time when Mr. Goodrick sent the person in, as he had promised. She was by name Jane Gould. I considered her to be a respectable-looking woman. She made no remark except to say that she understood what was wanted of her, and that she had winded a many of them in her time. How Master bore the news when he first heard it is more than I can tell, not having been present. When I did see him, he looked awfully overcome by it, to be sure. He sat quiet in a corner, with his fat hands hanging over his thick knees, and his head down, and his eye looking at nothing. He seemed not so much sorry as scared and dazed like by what had happened. My mistress managed all that was to be done about the funeral. It must have cost a sight of money, the coffin in particular being most beautiful. The dead lady's husband was away, as we heard, in foreign parts. But my mistress, being her aunt, settled it with her friends in the country, Cumberland, I think, that she should be buried there, in the same grave, along with her mother. Everything was done handsomely, in respect of the funeral, I say again, and Master went down to attend the burying in the country himself. He looked grand in his deep mourning, with his big solemn face and his slow walk and his broad hat-band. <laughs> that he did. In conclusion, I have to say, 
in answer to questions put to me. 1. That neither I nor my fellow-servant ever saw my master give Lady Clyde any medicine himself. 2. That he was never, to my knowledge and belief, left alone in the room with Lady Clyde. 3. That I am not able to say what caused the sudden fright which my mistress informed me had seized the lady on her first coming into the house. The cause was never explained, either to me or to my fellow-servant. The above statement has been read over in my presence. I have nothing to add to it or to take away from it. I say on my oath as a Christian woman, this is the truth. Signed, Hester Pinholm, her mark. Two. The Narrative of the Doctor To the Registrar of the Sub-District, in which the undermentioned death took place, I hereby certify that I attended Lady Glyde, aged twenty-one last birthday, that I last saw her on Thursday, the 25th July, 1850, that she died on the same day at number 5 Forest Road, St. John's Wood, and that the cause of her death was aneurysm. Duration of disease not known. Signed, Alfred Goodrick. Prop title, MRCS in LSA. Address, 12 Croydon Gardens, St. John's Wood. 3. The Narrative of Jane Gould. I was the person sent in by Mr. Goodrick to do what was right and needful by the remains of a lady who had died at the house named in the certificate which precedes this. I found the body in charge of the servant, Hester Pinhorn. I remained with it, and prepared it at the proper time for the grave. It was laid in the coffin in my presence, and I afterwards saw the coffin screwed down, previous to its removal. When that had been done, and not before, I received what was due to me, and left the house. I refer persons who may wish to investigate my character to Mr. Goodrick. He will bear witness that I can be trusted to tell the truth. Signed, Jane Gould. 4. The Narrative of the Tombstone Sacred to the memory of Laura Lady Glyde, wife of Sir Percival Glyde Bart of Blackwater Park, Hampshire, and daughter of the late Philip Fairley S. of Limeridge House in this parish. Born March 27, 1829. Married December 22, 1849. Died July 25, 1850. 5. The Narrative of Walter Hartwright Early in the summer of 1850, I and my surviving companions left the wilds and forests of Central America for home. Arrived at the coast, we took ship there for England. The vessel was wrecked in the Gulf of Mexico. I was among the few saved from the sea. It was my third escape from peril of death. Death by disease, death by the Indians, death by drowning. All three had approached me, all three had passed me by. The survivors of the wreck were rescued by an American vessel bound for Liverpool. The ship reached her port on the thirteenth day of October, 1850. We landed late in the afternoon, and I arrived in London the same night. These pages are not the record of my wanderings and my dangers away from home. The motives which led me from my country and my friends to a new world of adventure and peril are known. From that self-imposed exile I came back, as I had hoped, prayed, believed I should come back, a changed man, in the waters of a new life, I had tempered my nature afresh. In the stern school of extremity and danger, my will had learnt to be strong, my heart to be resolute, my mind to rely on itself. I had gone out to fly from my own future. I came back to face it as a man should. To face it with that inevitable suppression of myself, which I knew it would demand from me. I had parted with the worst bitterness of the past, but not with my heart's remembrance of the sorrow and the tenderness of that 
memorable time. I had not ceased to feel the one irreparable disappointment of my life. I had only learnt to bear it. Laura Fairley was in all my thoughts when the ship bore me away, and I looked my last at England. Laura Fairley was in all my thoughts when the ship brought me back, and the morning light showed the friendly shore in view. My pen traces the old letters as my heart goes back to the old love. I write of her as Laura Fairley still. It is hard to think of her, it is hard to speak of her by her husband's name. There are no more words of explanation to add on my appearance for the second time in these pages. This narrative, if I have the strength and the courage to write it, may now go on. My first anxieties and first hopes when the morning came, centred in my mother and my sister, I felt the necessity of preparing them for the joy and surprise of my return, after an absence during which it had been impossible for them to receive any tidings of me for months past. Early in the morning I sent a letter to the Hampstead cottage, and followed it myself in an hour's time. When the first meeting was over, when our quiet and composure of other days began gradually to return to us, I saw something in my mother's face which told me that a secret oppression lay heavy on her heart. There was more than love, there was sorrow in the anxious eyes that looked on me so tenderly, there was pity in the kind hand that slowly and fondly strengthened its hold on mine. We had no concealments from each other. She knew how the hope of my life had been wrecked. She knew why I had left her. It was on my lips to ask, as composedly as I could, if any letter had come for me from Miss Halcombe, if there was any news of her sister that I might hear. But when I looked on my mother's face, I lost courage to put the question even in that guarded form. I could only say, doubtingly and restrainedly, you have something to tell me. My sister, who had been sitting opposite to us, rose suddenly without a word of explanation, rose and left the room. My mother moved closer to me on the sofa, and put her arms round my neck. Those fond arms trembled, the tears flowed fast over the faithful loving face. Walter, she whispered, my own darling, my heart is heavy for you. Oh, my son, my son, try to remember that I am still left. My head sank on her bosom. She had said all in saying those words. It was the morning of the third day since my return, the morning of the 16th of October. I had remained with them at the cottage. I had tried hard not to embitter the happiness of my return to them, as it was embittered to me. I had done all man could to rise after the shock, and accept my life resignedly, to let my great sorrow come in tenderness to my heart, and not in despair. It was useless and hopeless. No tears soothed my aching eyes. No relief came to me from my sister's sympathy or my mother's love. On that third morning I opened my heart to them. At last the words passed my lips, which I had longed to speak on the day when my mother told me of her death. Let me go away alone for a little while, I said. I shall bear it better when I have looked once more at the place where I first saw her, when I have knelt and prayed by the grave where they have laid her to rest. I departed on my journey, my journey to the grave of Laura Fairley. It was a quiet autumn afternoon when I stopped at the solitary station and set forth alone on foot by the well-remembered road. The waning sun was shining faintly through thin white clouds. The air was warm and still. The peacefulness of the lonely country was overshadowed and saddened by the influence of the falling year. I reached the moor. I stood again on the brow of the hill. I looked on along the path. 
and there were the familiar garden trees in the distance the clear sweeping semicircle of the drive the high white walls of limeridge house the chances and changes the wanderings and dangers of months and months past all shrank and shrivelled to nothing in my mind it was like yesterday since my feet had last trodden the fragrant heathy ground i thought i should see her coming to meet me with a little straw hat shading her face her simple dress fluttering in the air and her well-filled sketch-book ready in her hand o oh, dirt thou hast thy sting o oh, grave thou hast thy victory i turned aside and there below me in the glen was the lonesome grey church the porch where i had waited for the coming of the woman in white the hills encircling the quiet burial ground the brook bubbling cold over its stony bed there was the marble cross fair and white at the head of the tomb the tomb that now rose over mother and daughter alike i approached the grave i crossed once more the low stone stile and bared my head as i touched the sacred ground sacred to gentleness and goodness sacred to reverence and grief i stopped before the pedestal from which the cross rose on one side of it on the side nearest to me the newly cut inscription met my eyes the hard clear cruel black letters which told the story of her life and death i tried to read them i did read as far as the name sacred to the memory of laura the kind blue eyes dim with tears, the fair head drooping wearily, the innocent parting words which implored me to leave her, oh, for a happier last memory of her than this, the memory I took away with me, the memory I bring back with me to her grave. A second time I tried to read the inscription. I saw at the end the date of her death, and above it, above it there were lines on the marble there was a name among them which disturbed my thoughts of her i went round to the other side of the grave where there was nothing to read nothing of earthly vileness to force its way between her spirit and mine i knelt down by the tomb i laid my hands i laid my head on the broad white stone and closed my weary eyes on the earth around on the light above i let her come back to me oh my love my love my heart may speak to you now it is yesterday again since we parted yesterday since your dear hand lay in mine yesterday since my eyes looked the last on you my love my love time had flowed on and silence had fallen like thick night over its course the first sound that came after the heavenly peace rustled faintly like a passing breath of air over the grass of the burial ground i heard it nearing me slowly until it came changed to my ear came like footsteps moving onward then stopped i looked up the sunset was near at hand the clouds had parted the slanting light fell mellow over the hills the last of the day was cold and clear and still in the quiet valley of the dead beyond me in the burial ground standing together in the cold clearness of the lower light i saw two women they were looking towards the tomb looking towards me two they came a little on and stopped again their veils were down and hid their faces from me when they stopped one of them raised her veil in the still evening light i saw the face of marion halcombe changed changed as if years had passed over it the eyes large and wild 
and looking at me with a strange terror in them the face worn and wasted piteously pain and fear and grief written on her as with a brand i took one step towards her from the grave she never moved she never spoke the veiled woman with her cried out faintly i stopped the springs of my life fell low and the shuddering of an unutterable dread crept over me from head to foot the woman with the veiled face moved away from her companion and came towards me slowly left by herself standing by herself marion halcombe spoke it was the voice that i remembered the voice not changed like the frightened eyes and the wasted face my dream my dream i heard her say those words softly in the awful silence she sank on her knees and raised her clasped hands to heaven father strengthen him father help him in his hour of need the woman came on slowly and silently came on i looked at her at her and at none other from that moment the voice that was praying for me faltered and sank low then rose on a sudden and called affrightedly called despairingly to me to come away but the veiled woman had possession of me body and soul she stopped on one side of the grave we stood face to face with the tombstone between us she was close to the inscription on the side of the pedestal her gown touched the black letters the voice came nearer and rose and rose more passionately still hide your face don't look at her oh for god's sake spare him the woman lifted her veil sacred to the memory of laura lady glyde laura lady glyde was standing by the inscription and was looking at me over the grave the second epoch of the story closes here end of chapter 24Chapter twenty five of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Third Epoch. The Story Continued by Walter Hartwright. One. I open a new page. I advance my narrative by one week. The history of the interval which I thus passed over must remain unrecorded. My heart turns faint, my mind sinks in darkness and confusion when I think of it. This must not be, if I, who write, and to guide as I ought, you who read. This must not be, if the clue that leads through the windings of the story is to remain from end to end untangled in my hands a life suddenly changed its whole purpose created afresh its hopes and fears its struggles its interests and its sacrifices all turned at once and for ever into a new direction this is the prospect which now opens before me like the burst of view from a mountain's top i left my narrative in the quiet shadow of limeridge church I resume it one week later, in the stir and turmoil of a London street. The street is in a populous and a poor neighbourhood. The ground floor of one of the houses in it is occupied by a small newsvendor shop, and the first floor and the second are let as furnished lodgings of the humblest kind. I have taken those two floors in an assumed name on the upper floor i live with a room to work in a room to sleep in on the lower floor under the same assumed name two women live who are described as my sisters i get my bread by drawing and engraving on wood for the cheap periodicals 
my sisters are supposed to help me by taking in a little needlework our poor place of abode our humble calling our assumed relationship and our assumed name are all used alike as a means of hiding us in the house forest of london we are numbered no longer with the people whose lives are open and known i am an obscure unnoticed man without patron or friend to help me marion halcom is nothing now but my eldest sister who provides for our household wants by the toil of her own hands we too in the estimation of others are at once the dupes and the agents of a daring imposture we are supposed to be the accomplices of mad anne catherick who claims the name the place and the living personality of dead lady glyde that is our situation that is the changed aspect in which we three must appear henceforth in this narrative for many and many a page to come in the eye of reason and of law in the estimation of relatives and friends according to every received formality of civilized society laura lady glyde lay buried with her mother in limeridge churchyard torn in her own lifetime from the list of the living the daughter of philip fairley and the wife of percival glyde might still exist for her sister might still exist for me but to all the world besides she was dead dead to her uncle who had renounced her dead to the servants of the house who had failed to recognize her dead to the persons in authority who had transmitted her fortune to her husband and her aunt dead to my mother and my sister who believed me to be the dupe of an adventuress and the victim of a fraud socially morally legally dead and yet alive alive in poverty and in hiding alive with the poor drawing-master to fight her battle and to win the way back for her to her place in the world of living beings did no suspicion excited by my own knowledge of anne catherick's resemblance to her cross my mind when her face was first revealed to me not the shadow of a suspicion from the moment when she lifted her veil by the side of the inscription which recorded her death before the sun of that day had set before the last glimpse of the home which was closed against her had passed from our view the farewell words i spoke when we parted at limeridge house had been recalled by both of us repeated by me recognized by her if ever the time comes when the devotion of my whole heart and soul and strength will give you a moment's happiness or spare you a moment's sorrow will you try to remember the poor drawing-master who has taught you she who now remembered so little of the trouble and terror of a later time remembered those words and laid her poor head innocently and trustingly on the bosom of the man who had spoken them in that moment when she called me by my name when she said they have tried to make me forget everything walter but i remember marion and i remember you in that moment i who had long since given her my love gave her my life and thanked god that it was mine to bestow on her yes the time had come from thousands on thousands of miles away through forest and wilderness where companions stronger than i had fallen by my side through peril of death thrice renewed and thrice escaped the hand that leads men on the dark road to the future had led me to meet that time forlorn and disowned sorely tried and sadly changed her beauty faded her mind clouded robbed of her station in the world of her place among living creatures the devotion i had promised the devotion of my whole heart and soul and strength 
might be laid blamelessly now at those dear feet in the right of her calamity in the right of her friendlessness she was mine at last mine to support to protect to cherish to restore mine to love and honour as father and brother both mine to vindicate through all risks and all sacrifices through the hopeless struggle against rank and power through the long fight with armed deceit and fortified success through the waste of my reputation through the loss of my friends through the hazard of my life two my position is defined my motives are acknowledged the story of marion and the story of laura must come next i shall relate both narratives not in the words often interrupted often inevitably confused of the speakers themselves but in the words of the brief plain studiously simple abstract which i committed to writing for my own guidance and for the guidance of my legal adviser so the tangled web will be most speedily and most intelligibly unrolled the story of marion begins where the narrative of the housekeeper at blackwater park left off on lady glyde's departure from her husband's house the fact of that departure and the necessary statement of the circumstances under which it had taken place were communicated to miss halcombe by the housekeeper it was not till some days afterwards how many days exactly mrs mitchelson in the absence of any written memorandum on the subject could not undertake to say that a letter arrived from madame fosco announcing lady glyde's sudden death in count fosco's house the letter avoided mentioning dates and left it to mrs mitchelson's discretion to break the news at once to miss halcombe or to defer doing so until that lady's health should be more firmly established having consulted mr dawson who had been himself delayed by ill health in resuming his attendance at blackwater park mrs mitchelson by the doctor's advice and in the doctor's presence communicated the news either on the day when the letter was received or on the day after it is not necessary to dwell here upon the effect which the intelligence of lady glyde's sudden death produced on her sister it is only useful to the present purpose to say that she was not able to travel for more than three weeks afterwards at the end of that time she proceeded to london accompanied by the housekeeper they parted there mrs mitchelson previously informing miss halcombe of her address in case they might wish to communicate at a future period on parting with the housekeeper miss halcombe went at once to the office of messrs gilmore and curl to consult with the latter gentleman in mr gilmore's absence she mentioned to mr curl what she had thought it desirable to conceal from every one else mrs mitchelson included her suspicion of the circumstances under which Lady Glyde was said to have met her death. Mr. Coe, who had previously given friendly proof of his anxiety to serve Miss Halcombe, at once undertook to make such inquiries as the delicate and dangerous nature of the investigation proposed to him would permit. To exhaust this part of the subject before going farther, it may be mentioned that Count Fosco offered every facility to mr curl on that gentleman stating that he was sent by miss halcombe to collect such particulars as had not yet reached her of lady glyde's decease mr curl was placed in communication with the medical man mr goodrick and with the two servants in the absence of any means of ascertaining the exact date of lady glyde's departure from blackwater park the result of the doctor's and the servant's evidence, and of the volunteered statements of Count Fosco and his wife, was conclusive to the mind of Mr. Curl. He could only assume that the intensity of Miss Halcombe's suffering under the loss of her sister had misled her judgment 
in a most deplorable manner, and he wrote her word that the shocking suspicion to which she had alluded in his presence was, in his opinion, destitute of the smallest fragment of foundation in truth. Thus the investigation by Mr. Gilmore's partner began and ended. Meanwhile, Miss Harcombe had returned to Limeridge House, and had there collected all the additional information which she was able to obtain. Mr. Fairley had received his first intimation of his niece's death from his sister, Madame Fosco. This letter also, not containing any exact reference to dates. He had sanctioned his sister's proposal that the deceased lady should be laid in her mother's grave in Limeridge churchyard. Count Fosco had accompanied the remains to Cumberland, and had attended the funeral at Limeridge, which took place on the 30th of July. It was followed as a mark of respect by all the inhabitants of the village and the neighbourhood. On the next day the inscription, originally drawn out, it was said, by the aunt of the deceased lady, and submitted for approval to her brother, Mr. Fairley, was engraved on one side of the monument over the tomb. On the day of the funeral, and for one day after it, Count Fosco had been received as a guest at Limeridge House, but no interview had taken place between Mr. Fairley and himself by the former gentleman's desire. They had communicated by writing, and through this medium Count Fosco had made Mr. Fairley acquainted with the details of his niece's last illness and death. The letter presenting this information added no new facts to the facts already known, but one very remarkable paragraph was contained in the postscript. It referred to Anne Catherick. The substance of the paragraph in question was as follows. It first informed Mr. Fairley that Anne Catherick, of whom he might hear full particulars from Miss Halcombe when she reached Limeridge, had been traced and recovered in the neighbourhood of Blackwater Park, and had been for the second time placed under the charge of the medical man from whose custody she had once escaped. This was the first part of the postscript. The second part warned Mr. Fairley that Anne Catherick's mental malady had been aggravated by her long freedom from control, and that the insane hatred and distrust of Sir Percival Glyde, which had been one of her most marked delusions in former times, still existed under a newly acquired form. The unfortunate woman's last idea in connection with Sir Percival, was the idea of annoying and distressing him, and of elevating herself, as she supposed, in the estimation of the patients and nurses, by assuming the character of his deceased wife, the scheme of this personation having evidently occurred to her after a stolen interview which she had succeeded in obtaining with Lady Glyde, and at which she had observed the extraordinary accidental likeness between the deceased lady and herself. It was to the last degree improbable that she would succeed a second time in escaping from the asylum, but it was just possible she might find some means of annoying the late Lady Glyde's relatives with letters, and, in that case, Mr. Fairley was warned beforehand how to receive them. The postscript expressed in these terms was shown to Miss Halcombe when she arrived at Limeridge. There were also placed in her possession the clothes Lady Glyde had worn, and the other effects she had brought with her to her aunt's house. They had been carefully collected and sent to Cumberland by Madame Fosco. Such was the posture of affairs when Miss Halcombe reached Limeridge in the early part of September. Shortly afterwards, she was confined to her room by a relapse, her weakened physical energies giving way under the severe mental affliction from which she was now suffering. On getting stronger again in a month's time, 
her suspicion of the circumstances described as attending her sister's death still remained unshaken she had heard nothing in the interim of sir percival glide but letters had reached her from madame fosco making the most affectionate inquiries on the part of her husband and herself instead of answering these letters miss halcombe caused the house in st john's wood and the proceedings of its inmates to be privately watched nothing doubtful was discovered the same result attended the next investigations which were secretly instituted on the subject of mrs rubell she had arrived in london about six months before with her husband they had come from lyons and they had taken a house in the neighbourhood of leicester square to be fitted up as a boarding-house for foreigners who were expected to visit england in large numbers to see the exhibition of eighteen fifty one nothing was known against husband or wife in the neighbourhood they were quiet people and they had paid their way honestly up to the present time the final inquiries related to sir percival glyde he was settled in paris and living there quietly in a small circle of english and french friends foiled at all points but still not able to rest miss harcombe next determined to visit the asylum in which she then supposed anne catherick to be for the second time confined she had felt a strong curiosity about the woman in former days and she was now doubly interested first in ascertaining whether the report of anne catherick's attempted personation of lady glyde was true and secondly if it proved to be true in discovering for herself what the poor creature's real motives were for attempting the deceit although count fosco's letter to mr fairly did not mention the address of the asylum that important omission cast no difficulties in miss halcombe's way when mr hartwright had met anne catherick at limeridge she had informed him of the locality in which the house was situated and miss halcombe had noted down the direction in her diary with all the other particulars of the interview exactly as she had heard them from mr hartwright's own lips accordingly she looked back at the entry and extracted the address furnished herself with the count's letter to mr fairley as a species of credential which might be useful to her and started by herself for the asylum on the eleventh of october she passed the night of the eleventh in london it had been her intention to sleep at the house inhabited by lady glyde's old governess but mrs vase's agitation at the sight of her lost pupil's nearest and dearest friend was so distressing that miss halcombe considerately refrained from remaining in her presence and removed to a respectable boarding-house in the neighbourhood recommended by mrs vase's married sister the next day she proceeded to the asylum which was situated not far from london on the northern side of the metropolis she was immediately admitted to see the proprietor at first he appeared to be decidedly unwilling to let her communicate with his patient but on her showing him the postscript to count fosco's letter on her reminding him that she was the miss halcombe there referred to that she was a near relative of the deceased lady glyde and that she was therefore naturally interested for family reasons in observing for herself the extent of anne catherick's delusion in relation to her late sister the tone and manner of the owner of the asylum altered and he withdrew his objections he probably felt that a continued refusal under these circumstances would not only be an act of discourtesy in itself but would also imply that the proceedings in his establishment were not of a nature to bear investigation by respectable strangers miss halcombe's own impression was that the owner of the asylum had not been received into the confidence of sir percival and the count his consenting at all to let her visit his patient 
seemed to afford one proof of this, and his readiness in making admissions which could scarcely have escaped the lips of an accomplice certainly appeared to furnish another. For example, in the course of the introductory conversation which took place, he informed Miss Harkham that Anne Catherick had been brought back to him with the necessary order and certificates by Count Fosco on the 27th of July, the Count also producing a letter of explanations and instructions signed by Sir Percival Glyde. On receiving his inmate again, the proprietor of the asylum acknowledged that he had observed some curious personal changes in her. Such changes, no doubt, were not without precedent in his experience of persons mentally afflicted. Insane people were often at one time, outwardly as well as inwardly, unlike what they were at another. The change from better to worse, or from worse to better, in the madness having a necessary tendency to produce alterations of appearance externally. He allowed for these, and he allowed also for the modification in the form of Anne Catherick's delusion, which was reflected, no doubt, in her manner and expression. But he was still perplexed at times by certain differences between his patient before she had escaped and his patient since she had been brought back. Those differences were too minute to be described. He could not say, of course, that she was absolutely altered in height or shape or complexion, or in the colour of her hair and eyes, or in the general form of her face. The change was something that he felt, more than something that he saw. In short, the case had been a puzzle from the first, and one more perplexity was added to it now. It cannot be said that this conversation led to the result of even partially preparing Miss Halcombe's mind for what was to come, but it produced nevertheless a very serious effect upon her. She was so completely unnerved by it that some little time elapsed before she could summon composure enough to follow the proprietor of the asylum to that part of the house in which the inmates were confined. On inquiry, it turned out that the supposed Anne Catherick was then taking exercise in the grounds attached to the establishment. One of the nurses volunteered to conduct Miss Halcombe to the place, the proprietor of the asylum remaining in the house for a few minutes to attend to a case which required his services, and then engaging to join his visitor in the grounds. The nurse led Miss Halcombe to a distant part of the property, which was prettily laid out, and after looking about her a little, turned into a turf walk, shaded by a shrubbery on either side. About halfway down this walk, two women were slowly approaching. The nurse pointed to them and said, "'There is Anne Catherick, ma'am, with the attendant who waits on her. The attendant will answer any questions you wish to put.' With those words, the nurse left her to return to the duties of the house. Miss Halcombe advanced on her side, and the women advanced on theirs. When they were within a dozen paces of each other, one of the women stopped for an instant, looked eagerly at the strange lady, shook off the nurse's grasp on her, and the next moment rushed into Miss Halcombe's arms. In that moment, Miss Halcombe recognised her sister, recognised the dead alive. Fortunately for the success of the measures taken subsequently, no one was present at that moment but the nurse. She was a young woman, and she was so startled that she was at first quite incapable of interfering. When she was able to do so, her whole services were required by Miss Halcombe, who had for the moment sunk altogether in the effort to keep her own senses under the shock of the discovery. After waiting a few minutes in the fresh air and the cool shade, her natural energy and courage helped her a little, and she became sufficiently mistress of herself to feel the necessity of recalling her presence of mind for her unfortunate sister's sake. She obtained permission to speak alone with the patient, on condition that they both remained well within the nurse's view. There was no time for questions 
there was only time for Miss Halcombe to impress on the unhappy lady the necessity of controlling herself, and to assure her of immediate help and rescue if she did so. The prospect of escaping from the asylum by obedience to her sister's directions was sufficient to quiet Lady Glyde, and to make her understand what was required of her. Miss Halcombe next returned to the nurse, placed all the gold she then had in her pocket, three sovereigns, in the nurse's hands, and asked when and where she could speak to her alone. The woman was at first surprised and distrustful, but on Miss Halcombe's declaring that she only wanted to put some questions which she was too much agitated to ask at that moment, and that she had no intention of misleading the nurse into any dereliction of duty, the woman took the money, and proposed three o'clock on the next day as the time for the interview. She might then step out for half an hour, after the patients had dined, and she would meet the lady in a retired place, outside the high north wall, which screened the grounds of the house. Miss Halcombe had only time to assent, and to whisper to her sister that she should hear from her on the next day, when the proprietor of the asylum joined them. He noticed his visitor's agitation, which Miss Halcombe accounted for, by saying that her interview with Anne Catterick had a little startled her at first. She took her leave as soon after as possible, that is to say, as soon as she could summon courage to force herself from the presence of her unfortunate sister. A very little reflection, when the capacity to reflect returned, convinced her that any attempt to identify Lady Glyde and to rescue her by legal means would, even if successful, involve a delay that might be fatal to her sister's intellects, which was shaken already by the horror of the situation to which she had been consigned. By the time Miss Halcombe had got back to London, she had determined to effect Lady Glyde's escape privately, by means of the nurse. She went at once to her stockbroker, and sold out of the funds all the little property she possessed, amounting to rather less than seven hundred pounds. Determined, if necessary, to pay the price of her sister's liberty with every farthing she had in the world, she repaired the next day, having the whole sum about her in banknotes, to her appointment outside the asylum wall. The nurse was there. Miss Halcombe approached the subject cautiously by many preliminary questions. She discovered, among other particulars, that the nurse who had in former times attended on the true Anne Catherick had been held responsible, although she was not to blame for it, for the patient's escape, and had lost her place in consequence. The same penalty, it was added, would attach to the person then speaking to her, if the supposed Anne Catherick was missing a second time, and, moreover, the nurse in this case had an especial interest in keeping her place. She was engaged to be married, and she and her future husband were waiting till they could save together between two and three hundred pounds to start in business. The nurse's wages were good, and she might succeed by strict economy in contributing her small share towards the sum required in two years' time. On this hint, Miss Halcombe spoke. She declared that the supposed Anne Catherick was nearly related to her, that she had been placed in the asylum under a fatal mistake, and that the nurse would be doing a good and a Christian action in being the means of restoring them to one another. Before there was time to start a single objection, Miss Halcombe took four banknotes of a hundred pounds each from her pocket-book, and offered them to the woman as a compensation for the risk she was to run, and for the loss of her place. The nurse hesitated, through sheer incredulity and surprise. Miss Halcombe pressed the point on her firmly. "'You will be doing a good action,' she repeated. "'You will be helping the most injured and unhappy woman alive. There is your marriage portion for a reward. Bring her safely to me here, and I will put these four banknotes into your hand before I claim her. Will you give me a letter saying those words, which I can show to my sweetheart when he asks how I got the money? 
inquired the woman. I will bring the letter with me, ready written and signed, answered Miss Harkham. Then I'll risk it, said the nurse. When? Tomorrow. It was hastily agreed between them that Miss Halcom should return early the next morning, and wait out of sight among the trees, always, however, keeping near the quiet spot of ground under the north wall. The nurse could fix no time for her appearance, caution requiring that she should wait and be guided by circumstances. On that understanding they separated. Miss Halcom was at her place with the promised letter and the promised banknotes before ten the next morning. She waited more than an hour and a half. At the end of that time the nurse came quickly round the corner of the wall, holding Lady Glyde by the arm. The moment they met Miss Halcom put the banknotes and the letter into her hand, and the sisters were united again. The nurse had dressed Lady Glyde with excellent forethought in a bonnet, veil, and shawl of her own. Miss Halcom only detained her to suggest a means of turning the pursuit in a false direction when the escape was discovered at the asylum. She was to go back to the house to mention in the hearing of the other nurses that Anne Catherick had been inquiring latterly about the distance from London to Hampshire, to wait till the last moment before discovery was inevitable, and then to give the alarm that Anne was missing. The supposed inquiries about Hampshire, when communicated to the owner of the asylum, would lead him to imagine that his patient had returned to Blackwater Park, under the influence of the delusion which made her persist in asserting herself to be Lady Glyde, and the first pursuit would, in all probability, be turned in that direction. The nurse consented to follow these suggestions, the more readily as they offered her the means of securing herself against any worse consequences than the loss of her place, by remaining in the asylum, and so maintaining the appearance of innocence at least. She at once returned to the house, and Miss Halcombe lost no time in taking her sister back with her to London. They caught the afternoon train to Carlisle the same afternoon, and arrived at Limeridge without accident or difficulty of any kind that night. During the latter part of their journey they were alone in the carriage, and Miss Halcombe was able to collect such remembrances of the past as her sister's confused and weakened memory was able to recall. The terrible story of the conspiracy so obtained was presented in fragments sadly incoherent in themselves and widely detached from each other. Imperfect as the revelation was, it must nevertheless be recorded here, before this explanatory narrative closes with the events of the next day at Limeridge House. Lady Glyde's recollection of the events which followed her departure from Blackwater Park began with her arrival at the London terminus of the South Western Railway. She had omitted to make a memorandum beforehand of the day on which she took the journey. All hope of fixing that important date by any evidence of hers or of Mrs. Mitchelson's must be given up for lost. On the arrival of the train at the platform, Lady Glyde found Count Fosco waiting for her. He was at the carriage door as soon as the porter could open it. The train was unusually crowded, and there was great confusion in getting the luggage. Some person, whom Count Fosco brought with him, procured the luggage which belonged to Lady Glyde. It was marked with her name. She drove away alone with the Count, in a vehicle which she did not particularly notice at the time. Her first question, on leaving the terminus, referred to Miss Halcombe. The Count informed her that Miss Halcombe had not yet gone to Cumberland, after consideration having caused him to doubt the prudence of her taking so long a journey without some day's previous rest. Lady Glyde next inquired whether her sister was then staying in the Count's house. Her recollection of the answer was confused, 
her only distinct impression in relation to it being that the count declared he was then taking her to see miss halcombe lady glyde's experience of london was so limited that she could not tell at the time through what streets they were driving but they never left the streets and they never passed any gardens or trees when the carriage stopped it stopped in a small street behind a square a square in which there were shops and public buildings and many people from these recollections of which lady glyde was certain it seems quite clear that count fosco did not take her to his own residence in the suburb of st john's wood they entered the house and went upstairs to a back room either on the first or second floor the luggage was carefully brought in a female servant opened the door and a man with a dark beard apparently a foreigner met them in the hall and with great politeness showed them the way upstairs in answer to lady glyde's inquiries the count assured her that miss halcombe was in the house and that she should be immediately informed of her sister's arrival he and the foreigner then went away and left her by herself in the room it was poorly furnished as a sitting-room and it looked out on the backs of houses the place was remarkably quiet no footsteps went up or down the stairs she only heard in the room beneath her a dull rumbling sound of men's voices talking before she had been long left alone the count returned to explain that miss halcombe was then taking rest and could not be disturbed for a little while he was accompanied into the room by a gentleman an englishman whom he begged to present as a friend of his after this singular introduction in the course of which no names to the best of lady glyde's recollection had been mentioned she was left alone with the stranger he was perfectly civil but he startled and confused her by some odd questions about herself and by looking at her while he asked them in a strange manner after remaining a short time he went out and a minute or two afterwards a second stranger also an englishman came in this person introduced himself as another friend of count fosco's and he in his turn looked at her very oddly and asked some curious questions never as well as she could remember addressing her by name and going out again after a little while like the first man by this time she was so frightened about herself and so uneasy about her sister that she had thoughts of venturing downstairs again and claiming the protection and assistance of the only woman she had seen in the house the servant who answered the door just as she had risen from her chair the count came back into the room the moment he appeared she asked anxiously how long the meeting between her sister and herself was to be still delayed at first he returned an evasive answer but on being pressed he acknowledged with great apparent reluctance that Miss Halcombe was by no means so well as he had hitherto represented her to be. His tone and manner in making this reply so alarmed Lady Glyde, or rather so painfully increased the uneasiness which she had felt in the company of the two strangers, that a sudden faintness overcame her, and she was obliged to ask for a glass of water. The Count called from the door for water, and for a bottle of smelling salts both were brought in by the foreign-looking man with the beard the water when lady glyde attempted to drink it had so strange a taste that it increased her faintness and she hastily took the bottle of salts from count fosco and smelt at it her head became giddy on the instant the count caught the bottle as it dropped out of her hand and the last impression of which she was conscious was that he held it to her nostrils again from this point her recollections were found to be confused fragmentary and difficult to reconcile with any reasonable probability her own impression 
was that she recovered her senses later in the evening, that she then left the house, that she went, as she had previously arranged to go at Blackwater Park, to Mrs. Vase's, that she drank tea there, and that she passed the night under Mrs. Vase's roof. She was totally unable to say how, or when, or in what company she left the house to which Count Fosco had brought her, but she persisted in asserting that she had been to Mrs. Vase's, and, still more extraordinary, that she had been helped to undress and get to bed by Mrs. Rubell. She could not remember what the conversation was at Mrs. Vase's, or whom she saw there besides that lady, or why Mrs. Rubell should have been present in the house to help her. Her recollection of what happened to her the next morning was still more vague and unreliable. She had some dim idea of driving out, at what hour she could not say, with Count Fosco, and with Mrs. Rubell again, for a female attendant. But when and why she left Mrs. Vasey she could not tell. Neither did she know what direction the carriage drove him, or where it set her down, or whether the Count and Mrs. Rubell did or did not remain with her all the time she was out. At this point in her sad story there was a total blank. She had no impressions of the faintest kind to communicate, no idea whether one day or more than one day had passed, until she came to herself suddenly in a strange place, surrounded by women who were all unknown to her. This was the asylum. Here she first heard herself called by Anne Catherick's name, and here as a last remarkable circumstance in the story of the conspiracy, her own eyes informed her that she had Anne Catherick's clothes on. The nurse, on the first night in the asylum, had shown her the marks on each article of her underclothing as it was taken off, and had said, not at all irritably or unkindly, "'Look at your own name on your own clothes.' and don't worry us all any more about being Lady Glyde. She's dead and buried, and you're alive and hearty. Do look at your clothes now. There it is, in good marking ink, and there you will find it on all your old things, which we have kept in the house, and Catherick as plain as print. And there it was, when Miss Halcom examined the linen her sister wore on the night of their arrival at Limeridge House. These were the only recollections all of them uncertain, and some of them contradictory, which could be extracted from Lady Glyde by careful questioning on the journey to Cumberland. Miss Halcombe abstained from pressing her with any inquiries relating to events in the asylum, her mind being but too evidently unfit to bear the trial of reverting to them. It was known, by the voluntary admission of the owner of the madhouse, that she was received there on the 27th of July, from that date until the 15th of October, the day of her rescue, she had been under restraint, her identity with Anne Catherick systematically asserted, and her sanity from first to last practically denied. Faculties less delicately balanced, constitutions less tenderly organized, must have suffered under such an ordeal as this. No man could have gone through it and come out of it unchanged. Arriving at Limeridge, late on the evening of the 15th, Miss Halcombe wisely resolved not to attempt the assertion of Lady Glyde's identity until the next day. The first thing in the morning she went to Mr. Fairley's room, and using all possible cautions and preparations beforehand, at last told him in so many words what had happened. As soon as his first astonishment and alarm had subsided, he angrily declared that Miss Halcombe had allowed herself to be duped by Anne Catherick. He referred her to Count Fosco's letter, and to what she had herself told him of the personal resemblance between Anne and his deceased niece, and he positively declined to admit to his presence, even for one minute only, a mad woman whom it was an insult and an outrage to have brought into his house at all. Miss Halcombe left the room, waited till the first heat of her indignation had passed away, 
decided on reflection that Mr. Fairley should see his niece in the interests of common humanity before he closed his doors on her as a stranger, and thereupon, without a word of previous warning, took Lady Glyde with her to his room. The servant was posted at the door to prevent their entrance, but Miss Halcombe insisted on passing him, and made her way into Mr. Fairley's presence, leading her sister by the hand. The scene that followed, though it only lasted for a few minutes, was too painful to be described. Miss Halcombe herself shrank from referring to it. Let it be enough to say that Mr. Fairley declared in the most positive terms that he did not recognise the woman who had been brought into his room, that he saw nothing in her face and manner to make him doubt for a moment that his niece they buried in Limeridge churchyard, and that he would call on the law to protect him if before the day was over she was not removed from the house. Taking the very worst view of Mr. Fairley's selfishness, indolence, and habitual want of feeling, it was manifestly impossible to suppose that he was capable of such infamy as secretly recognising and openly disowning his brother's child. Miss Halcombe, humanely and sensibly, allowed all due force to the influence of prejudice and alarm in preventing him from fairly exercising his perceptions, and accounted for what had happened in that way. But when she next put the servants to the test, and found that they too were in every case uncertain, to say the least of it, whether the lady presented to them was their young mistress or Anne Catherick, of whose resemblance to her they had all heard, the sad conclusion was inevitable that the change produced in Lady Glyde's face and manner by her imprisonment in the asylum was far more serious than Miss Halcombe had at first supposed. The vile deception which had asserted her death defied exposure even in the house where she was born and among the people with whom she had lived. In a less critical situation, the effort need not have been given up as hopeless even yet. For example, the maid, Fanny, who happened to be then absent from Limeridge, was expected back in two days, and there would be a chance of gaining her recognition to start with, seeing that she had been in much more constant communication with her mistress, and had been much more heartily attached to her than the other servants. Again, Lady Glyde might have been privately kept in the house or in the village, to wait until her health was a little recovered, and her mind was a little steadied again. When her memory could be once more trusted to serve her, she would naturally refer to persons and events in the past with a certainty and a familiarity which no impostor could simulate, and so the fact of her identity, which her own appearance had failed to establish, might subsequently be proved with time to help her by the surer test of her own words but the circumstances under which she had regained her freedom rendered all recourse to such means as these simply impracticable. The pursuit from the asylum, diverted to Hampshire for the time only, would infallibly next take the direction of Cumberland. The persons appointed to seek the fugitive might arrive at Limeridge House at a few hours' notice, and in Mr. Fairley's present temper of mind they might count on the immediate exertion of his local influence and authority to assist them. The commonest consideration for Lady Glyde's safety forced on Miss Harkham the necessity of resigning the struggle to do her justice, and of removing her at once from the place of all others that was now most dangerous to her, the neighbourhood of her own home. An immediate return to London was the first and wisest measure of security which suggested itself. In the great city, all traces of them might be most speedily and most surely effaced. There were no preparations to make, no farewell words of kindness to exchange with any one. On the afternoon of that memorable day of the 16th, Miss Halcombe roused her sister to a last exertion of courage, and without a living soul to wish them well at parting, the two took their way into the world alone and turned their backs for ever on Limeridge House. 
They had passed the hill above the churchyard, when Lady Clyde insisted on turning back to look her last at her mother's grave. Miss Halcombe tried to shake her resolution, but in this one instance tried in vain. She was immovable. Her dim eyes lit with a sudden fire, and flashed through the veil that hung over them. Her wasted fingers, strengthened moment by moment, round the friendly arm by which they had held so listlessly till this time. I believe in my soul that the hand of God was pointing their way back to them, and that the most innocent and the most afflicted of his creatures was chosen in that dread moment to see it. They retraced their steps to the burial ground, and by that act sealed the future of our three lives. End of chapter 25chapter 26 of the woman in white by wilkie collins this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison 3 this was the story of the past the story so far as we knew it then two obvious conclusions presented themselves to my mind after hearing it in the first place i saw darkly what the nature of the conspiracy had been, how chances had been watched, and how circumstances had been handled to ensure impunity to a daring and an intricate crime. While all details were still a mystery to me, the vile manner in which the personal resemblance between the woman in white and Lady Glyde had been turned to account was clear beyond a doubt. It was plain that Anne Catherick had been introduced into Count Fosco's house as Lady Glyde. It was plain that Lady Glyde had taken the dead woman's place in the asylum, the substitution having been so managed as to make innocent people, the doctor and the two servants certainly, and the owner of the madhouse in all probability, accomplices in the crime. The second conclusion came as the necessary consequence of the first. We three had no mercy to expect from Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde. The success of the conspiracy had brought with it a clear gain to those two men of thirty thousand pounds, twenty thousand to one, ten thousand to the other through his wife. They had that interest, as well as other interests, in ensuring their impunity from exposure, and they would leave no stone unturned, no sacrifice unattempted, no treachery untried, to discover the place in which their victim was concealed, and to part her from the only friend she had in the world, Marion Halcombe and myself. The sense of this serious peril a peril which every day and every hour might bring nearer and nearer to us, was the one influence that guided me in fixing the place of our retreat. I chose it in the far east of London, where there were fewest idle people to lounge and look about them in the streets. I chose it in a poor and a populous neighbourhood, because the harder the struggle for existence among the men and women about us, the less the risk of their having the time or taking the pains to notice chance strangers who came among them. These were the great advantages I looked to, but our locality was a gain to us also, in another and a hardly less important respect. We could live cheaply by the daily work of my hands, and could save every farthing we possessed to forward the purpose the righteous purpose of redressing an infamous wrong, which from first to last I now kept steadily in view. In a week's time, Marion Halcombe and I had settled how the course of our new lives should be directed. 
there were no other lodgers in the house, and we had the means of going in and out without passing through the shop. I arranged, for the present at least, that neither Marion nor Laura should stir outside the door without my being with them, and that in my absence from home they should let no one into their rooms on any pretense whatever. This rule established, I went to a friend whom I had known in former days, a wood engraver in large practice, to seek for employment, telling him at the same time that I had reasons for wishing to remain unknown. He at once concluded that I was in debt, expressed his regret in the usual forms, and then promised to do what he could to assist me. I left his false impression undisturbed, and accepted the work he had to give. He knew that he could trust my experience and my industry. I had what he wanted, steadiness and facility, and though my earnings were but small, they sufficed for our necessities. As soon as we could feel certain of this, Marion Halcombe and I put together what we possessed. She had between two and three hundred pounds left of her own property, and I had nearly as much remaining from the purchase money obtained by the sale of my drawing-master's practice before I left England. Together we made up between us more than four hundred pounds. I deposited this little fortune in a bank to be kept for the expense of those secret inquiries and investigations which I was determined to set on foot, and to carry on by myself, if I could find no one to help me. We calculated our weekly expenditure to the last farthing, and we never touched our little fund, except in Laura's interests, and for Laura's sake. The housework which, if we had dared trust a stranger near us, would have been done by a servant, was taken on the first day, taken as her own right, by Marion Halcombe. "'What a woman's hands are fit for,' she said. "'Early and late, these hands of mine shall do.' They trembled, as she held them out. The wasted arms told their sad story of the past, as she turned up the sleeves of the poor plain dress that she wore for safety's sake but the unquenchable spirit of the woman burnt bright in her even yet. I saw the big tears rise thick in her eyes, and fall slowly over her cheeks as she looked at me. She dashed them away with a touch of her old energy, and smiled with a faint reflection of her old good spirits. "'Don't doubt my courage, Walter,' she pleaded. "'It's my weakness that cries not me. The housework shall conquer it if I can't and she kept her word. The victory was won, when we met in the evening, and she sat down to rest. Her large, steady black eyes looked at me with a flash of their bright firmness of bygone days. I am not quite broken down yet, she said. I am worth trusting with my share of the work. Before I could answer, she added in a whisper, and worth trusting with my share in the risk and the danger, too. Remember that if the time comes. I did remember it when the time came. As early as the end of October, the daily course of our lives had assumed its subtle direction, and we three were as completely isolated in our place of concealment as if the house we lived in had been a desert island and the great network of streets, and the thousands of our fellow-creatures all round us, the waters of an illimitable sea. I could now reckon on some leisure time for considering what my future plan of action should be, and how I might arm myself most securely at the outset for the coming struggle with Sir Percival and the Count. I gave up all hope of appealing to my recognition of Laura, or to Marian's recognition of her, in proof of her identity. If we had loved her less dearly, if the instinct implanted in us by that love had not been far more certain than any exercise of reasoning, far keener than any process of observation, 
even we might have hesitated on first seeing her. The outward changes, wrought by the suffering and the terror of the past, had fearfully, almost hopelessly strengthened the fatal resemblance between Anne Catherick and herself. In my narrative of events at the time of my residence in Limeridge House, I have recorded, from my own observation of the two, how the likeness, striking as it was, when viewed generally, failed in many important points of similarity when tested in detail. In those former days, if they had both been seen together side by side, no person could for a moment have mistaken them one for the other, as has happened often in the instances of twins. I could not say this now. The sorrow and suffering which I had once blamed myself for associating even by a passing thought with the future of Laura Fairley had set their profaning marks on the youth and beauty of her face, and the fatal resemblance which I had once seen and shuddered at seeing in idea only was now a real and living resemblance which asserted itself before my own eyes. Strangers, acquaintances, friends even who could not look at her as we looked if she had been shown to them in the first days of her rescue from the asylum might have doubted if she were the laura fairly they had once seen and doubted without blame the one remaining chance which i had at first thought might be trusted to serve us the chance of appealing to her recollection of persons and events with which no impostor could be familiar was proved by the sad test of our later experience, to be hopeless. Every little caution that Marian and I practised towards her, every little remedy we tried to strengthen and steady slowly the weakened, shaken faculties, was a fresh protest in itself against the risk of turning her mind back on the troubled and the terrible past. The only events of former days which we ventured on encouraging her to recall with the little trivial domestic events of that happy time at Limeridge, when I first went there and taught her to draw. The day when I roused those remembrances by showing her the sketch of the summer-house which she had given me on the morning of our farewell, and which had never been separated from me since, was the birthday of our first hope. Tenderly and gradually, the memory of the old walks and drives dawned upon her, and the poor weary pining eyes looked at Marian and at me with a new interest, with a faltering thoughtfulness in them, which from that moment we cherished and kept alive. I bought her a little box of colours, and a sketch-book like the old sketch-book, which I had seen in her hands on the morning that we first met once again oh me once again at spare hours saved from my work in the dull london light in the poor london room i sat by her side to guide the faltering touch to help the feeble hand day by day i raised and raised the new interest till its place in the blank of her existence was at last assured till she could think of her drawing and talk of it, and patiently practise it by herself, with some faint reflection of the innocent pleasure in my encouragement, the growing enjoyment in her own progress, which belonged to the lost life and the lost happiness of past days. We helped her mind slowly by this simple means. We took her out between us to walk on fine days, in a quiet old city square near at hand, where there was nothing to confuse or alarm her. We spared a few pounds from the fund at the banker's to get her wine and the delicate strengthening food that she required. We amused her in the evenings with children's games at cards, with scrapbooks full of prints, which I borrowed from the engraver who employed me. By these and other trifling attentions like them, we composed her and steadied her, and hoped all things, 
as cheerfully as we could from time and care and love that never neglected and never despaired of her. But to take her mercilessly from seclusion and repose, to confront her with strangers or with acquaintances who were little better than strangers, to rouse the painful impressions of our past life which we had so carefully hushed to rest, this even in her own interests we dared not do. Whatever sacrifices it cost, whatever long, weary, heart-breaking delays it involved, the wrong that had been inflicted on her, if mortal means could grapple it, must be redressed without her knowledge and without her help. This resolution settled, it was next necessary to decide how the first risk should be ventured, and what the first proceeding should be. After consulting with Marian, I resolved to begin by gathering together as many facts as could be collected, then to ask the advice of Mr. Curl, whom we knew we could trust, and to ascertain from him, in the first instance, if the legal remedy lay fairly within our reach. I owed it to Laura's interests, not to stake her whole future on my own unaided exertions, so long as there was the faintest prospect of strengthening our position by obtaining reliable assistance of any kind. The first source of information to which I applied was the journal kept at Blackwater Park by Marian Harkham. There were passages in this diary relating to myself which she thought it best that I should not see. Accordingly, she read to me from the manuscript and I took the notes I wanted as she went on. We could only find time to pursue this occupation by sitting up late at night. Three nights were devoted to the purpose, and were enough to put me in possession of all that Marian could tell. My next proceeding was to gain as much additional evidence as I could procure from other people without exciting suspicion. I went myself to Mrs. Vesey to ascertain if Laura's impression of having slept there was correct or not. In this case, from consideration for Mrs. Vesey's age and infirmity, and in all subsequent cases of the same kind from considerations of caution, I kept our real position a secret, and was always careful to speak of Laura as the late. Lady Glyde. Mrs. Vesey's answer to my inquiries only confirmed the apprehensions which I had previously felt. Laura had certainly written to say she would pass the night under the roof of her old friend, but she had never been near the house. Her mind in this instance, and, as I feared, in other instances besides, confusedly presented to her something which she had only intended to do in the false light of something which she had really done the unconscious contradiction of herself was easy to account for in this way but it was likely to lead to serious results it was a stumble on the threshold at starting it was a flaw in the evidence which told fatally against us when I next asked for the letter which Laura had written to Mrs. Vesey from Blackwater Park, it was given to me without the envelope, which had been thrown into the waste-paper basket, and long since destroyed. In the letter itself no date was mentioned, not even the day of the week. It only contained these lines. Dearest Mrs. Vesey, I am in sad distress and anxiety, and I may come to your house to-morrow night, and ask for a bed, I can't tell you what is the matter in this letter. I write it in such fear of being found out that I can fix my mind on nothing. Pray be at home to see me. I will give you a thousand kisses and tell you everything. Your affectionate Laura. What help was there in those lines? None. On returning from Mrs. Vase's, I instructed Marian to write, observing the same caution which I practised myself, to Mrs. Mitchelson. She was to express, if she pleased, some general suspicion of Count Fosco's conduct, and she was to ask the housekeeper to supply us with a plain statement of events, 
in the interests of truth. While we were waiting for the answer, which reached us in a week's time, I went to the doctor in St. John's Wood, introducing myself as sent by Miss Halcombe to collect, if possible, more particulars of her sister's last illness than Mr. Curl had found the time to procure. By Mr. Goodrick's assistance, I obtained a copy of the certificate of death, and an interview with the woman, Jane Gould, who had been employed to prepare the body for the grave. Through this person, I also discovered a means of communicating with the servant, Hester Pinholm. She had recently left her place, in consequence of a disagreement with her mistress, and she was lodging with some people in the neighbourhood, whom Mrs. Gould knew. In the manner here indicated, I obtained the narratives of the housekeeper, of the doctor, of Jane Gould, and of Hester Pinholm, exactly as they are presented in these pages. Furnished with such additional evidence as these documents afforded, I considered myself to be sufficiently prepared for a consultation with Mr. Curl, and Marian wrote accordingly to mention my name to him, and to specify the day and hour at which I requested to see him on private business. There was time enough in the morning for me to take Laura out for her walk as usual, and to see her quietly settled at her drawing afterwards. She looked up at me with a new anxiety in her face as I rose to leave the room, and her fingers began to toy doubtfully in the old way with the brushes and pencils on the table. You are not tired of me yet, she said. You are not going away because you are tired of me. I will try to do better. I will try to get well. Are you as fond of me, Walter, as you used to be? Now I am so pale and thin, and so slow in learning to draw. She spoke as a child might have spoken. She showed me her thoughts as a child might have shown them. I waited a few minutes longer, waited to tell her that she was dearer to me now than she had ever been in the past times. Try to get well again, I said, encouraging the new hope in the future which I saw dawning in her mind. Try to get well again for Marian's sake and for mine. Yes, she said to herself, returning to her drawing. I must try, because they are both so fond of me. She suddenly looked up again. Don't be gone long. I can't get on with my drawing, Walter, when you are not here to help me. I shall soon be back, my darling, soon be back to see how you are getting on. My voice faltered a little in spite of me. I forced myself from the room. It was no time then for parting with the self-control which might yet serve me in my need before the day was out. As I opened the door, I beckoned to Marion to follow me to the stairs. It was necessary to prepare her for a result, which I felt might sooner or later follow my showing myself openly in the streets. I shall in all probability be back in a few hours, I said, and you will take care, as usual, to let no one inside the doors in my absence. But if anything happens, what can happen? She interposed quickly. Tell me plainly, Walter, if there is any danger, and I shall know how to meet it. The only danger, I replied, is that Sir Percival Glyde may have been recalled to London by the news of Laura's escape. You are aware that he had me watched before I left England, and that he probably knows me by sight, although I don't know him. She laid her hand on my shoulder, and looked at me in anxious silence. I saw she understood the serious risk that threatened us. It is not likely, I said, that I shall be seen in London again so soon, either by Sir Percival himself, or by the persons in his employ. But it is barely possible that an accident may happen. In that case, you will not be alarmed if I fail to return to-night, and you will satisfy any inquiry of Laura's with the best excuse that you can make for me, if I find the least reason to suspect that I am watched, I will take good care that no spy follows me back to this house. Don't doubt my return, Marian, however it may be delayed, and fear nothing. 
Nothing, she answered firmly. You shall not regret, Walter, that you have only a woman to help you. She paused and detained me for a moment longer. Take care, she said, pressing my hand anxiously. Take care. I left her and set forth to pave the way for discovery, the dark and doubtful way which began at the lawyer's door. Four. No circumstance of the slightest importance happened on my way to the offices of Messrs. Gilmore and Curl in Chancery Lane. While my card was being taken in to Mr. Curl, a consideration occurred to me which I deeply regretted not having thought of before. The information derived from Marion's diary made it a matter of certainty that Count Fosco had opened her first letter from Blackwater Park to Mr. Curl, and had, by means of his wife, intercepted the second. He was therefore well aware of the address of the office, and he would naturally infer that if Marion wanted advice and assistance after Laura's escape from the asylum, she would apply once more to the experience of Mr. Curl. In this case, the office in Chancery Lane was the very first place which he and Sir Percival would cause to be watched, and if the same persons were chosen for the purpose who had been employed to follow me before my departure from England, the fact of my return would in all probability be ascertained on that very day. I had thought, generally, of the chances of my being recognised in the streets, but the special risk connected with the office had never occurred to me until the present moment. It was too late now to repair this unfortunate error in judgment, too late to wish that I had made arrangements for meeting the lawyer in some place privately appointed beforehand. I could only resolve to be cautious on leaving Chancery Lane, and not to go straight home again under any circumstances whatever. After waiting a few minutes, I was shown into Mr. Curl's private room. He was a pale, thin, quiet, self-possessed man, with a very attentive eye, a very low voice, and a very undemonstrative manner, not, as I judged, ready with his sympathy where strangers were concerned, and not at all easy to disturb in his professional composure. A better man for my purpose could hardly have been found, if he committed himself to a decision at all, and if the decision was favourable, the strength of our case was as good as proved from that moment. "'Before I enter on the business which brings me here,' I said, "'I ought to warn you, Mr. Curl, that the shortest statement I can make of it may occupy some little time.' "'My time is at Miss Holcombe's disposal,' he replied. "'Where any interests of hers are concerned, I represent my partner personally as well as professionally. It was his request that I should do so when he ceased to take an active part in business. May I inquire whether Mr. Gilmore is in England? He is not. He is living with his relatives in Germany. His health has improved, but the period of his return is still uncertain. While we were exchanging these few preliminary words, he had been searching among the papers before him, and he now produced from them a sealed letter. I thought he was about to hand the letter to me, but apparently changing his mind, he placed it by itself on the table, settled himself in his chair, and silently waited to hear what I had to say. Without wasting a moment in prefatory words of any sort, I entered on my narrative, and put him in full possession of the events which have already been related in these pages. Lawyer as he was, to the very marrow of his bones, I startled him out of his professional composure. Expressions of incredulity and surprise, which he could not repress, interrupted me several times before I had done. I persevered, however, to the end, and as soon as I reached it, boldly asked the one important question— what is your opinion, Mr. Curl? He was too cautious to commit himself to an answer without taking time to recover his self-possession first. 
Before I give my opinion, he said, I must beg permission to clear the ground by a few questions. He put the questions, sharp, suspicious, unbelieving questions, which clearly showed me, as they proceeded, that he thought I was the victim of a delusion, and that he might even have doubted, but for my introduction to him by Miss Halcombe, whether I was not attempting the perpetration of a cunningly designed fraud. "'Do you believe that I have spoken the truth, Mr. Curl? I asked, when he had done examining me. "'So far as your own convictions are concerned, I am certain you have spoken the truth,' he replied. "'I have the highest esteem for Miss Halcombe, and I have, therefore, every reason to respect a gentleman whose mediation she trusts in a matter of this kind. I will even go farther, if you like, and admit for courtesy's sake, and for argument's sake, that the identity of Lady Glyde as a living person is a proved fact to Miss Halcombe and yourself. But you come to me for a legal opinion. As a lawyer, and as a lawyer only, it is my duty to tell you, Mr. Hartwright, that you have not the shadow of a case. You put it strongly, Mr. Curl. I will try to put it plainly as well. The evidence of Lady Glyde's death is, on the face of it, clear and satisfactory. There is her aunt's testimony to prove that she came to Count Fosco's house, that she fell ill, and that she died. There is the testimony of the medical certificate to prove the death, and to show that it took place under natural circumstances. There is the fact of the funeral at Limeridge, and there is the assertion of the inscription on the tomb. That is the case you want to overthrow. What evidence have you to support the declaration on your side that the person who died and was buried was not Lady Glyde? Let us run through the main points of your statement and see what they are worth. Miss Halcombe goes to a certain private asylum and there sees a certain female patient. It is known that a woman named Anne Catherick and bearing an extraordinary personal resemblance to Lady Glyde, escaped from the asylum. It is known that the person received there last July was received as Anne Catherick brought back. It is known that the gentleman who brought her back warned Mr. Fairley that it was part of her insanity to be bent on personating his dead niece, and it is known that she did repeatedly declare herself in the asylum when no one believed her, to be Lady Glyde. These are all facts. What have you to set against them? Miss Halcombe's recognition of the woman, which recognition after events invalidate or contradict? Does Miss Halcombe assert her supposed sister's identity to the owner of the asylum, and take legal means for rescuing her? No. She secretly bribes a nurse to let her escape. When the patient has been released in this doubtful manner, and is taken to Mr. Fairley, does he recognise her? Is he staggered for one instant in his belief of his niece's death? No. Do the servants recognise her? No. Is she kept in the neighbourhood to assert her own identity and to stand the test of further proceedings? No. She is privately taken to London. In the meantime, you have recognised her also, but you are not a relative. You are not even an old friend of the family. The servants contradict you, and Mr. Fairley contradicts Miss Halcombe, and the supposed Lady Glyde contradicts herself. She declares she passed the night in London at a certain house. Your own evidence shows that she has never been near that house, and your own admission is that her condition of mind prevents you from producing her anywhere to submit to investigation and to speak for herself. I pass over minor points of evidence on both sides to save time, and I ask you, if this case were to go now into a court of law, to go before a jury bound to take facts as they reasonably appear where are your proofs i was obliged to wait and collect myself before i could answer him it was the first time the story of laura and the story of marion 
had been presented to me from a stranger's point of view. The first time the terrible obstacles that lay across our path had been made to show themselves in their true character. There can be no doubt, I said, that the facts, as you have stated them, appear to tell against us, but, but you think those facts can be explained away, interposed Mr. Curl. Let me tell you the result of my experience on that point. When an English jury has to choose between a plain fact on the surface and a long explanation under the surface, it always takes the fact in preference to the explanation. For example, a lady glide. I call the lady you represent by that name for argument's sake, declares she has slept at a certain house, and it is proved that she has not slept at that house. You explain this circumstance by entering into the state of her mind, and deducing from it a metaphysical conclusion. I don't say the conclusion is wrong. I only say that the jury will take the fact of her contradicting herself in preference to any reason for the contradiction that you can offer. But is it not possible, I urged, by dint of patience and exertion, to discover additional evidence? Miss Halcombe and I have a few hundred pounds. He looked at me with a half-suppressed pity and shook his head. Consider the subject, Mr. Hartwright, from your own point of view, he said. If you are right about Sir Percival Glyde and Canfosco, which I don't admit mind, every imaginable difficulty will be thrown in the way of your getting fresh evidence. Every obstacle of litigation would be raised. Every point in the case would be systematically contested. And by the time we had spent our thousands instead of our hundreds, the final result would in all probability be against us. Questions of identity where instances of personal resemblance are concerned, are in themselves the hardest of all questions to settle, the hardest even when they are free from the complications which beset this case we are now discussing. I really see no prospect of throwing any light whatever on this extraordinary affair. Even if the person buried in Limeridge churchyard be not Lady Glyde, she was, in life, on your own showing, so like her that we should gain nothing if we applied for the necessary authority to have the body exhumed. In short, there is no case, Mr. Hartwright, there is really no case. I was determined to believe that there was a case, and in that determination shifted my ground, and appealed to him once more. Are there not other proofs that we might produce, besides the proof of identity, I asked? Not as you are situated, he replied. The simplest and surest of all proofs, the proof by comparison of dates, is, as I understand, altogether out of your reach. If you could show a discrepancy between the date of the doctor's certificate and the date of Lady Glyde's journey to London, the matter would wear a totally different aspect, and I should be the first to say, well, let us go on. That date may yet be recovered, Mr. Curl. On the day when it is recovered, Mr. Hartwright, you will have a case. If you have any prospect at this moment of getting at it, tell me, and we shall see if I can advise you. I considered. The housekeeper could not help us. Laura could not help us. Marion could not help us. In all probability, the only persons in existence who knew the date were Sir Percival and the Count. I can think of no means of ascertaining the date at present, I said, because I can think of no persons who are sure to know it, but Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde. Mr. Curl's calmly attentive face relaxed, for the first time, into a smile. With your opinion of the conduct of those two gentlemen, he said, you don't expect help in that quarter, I presume. If they have combined to gain large sums of money by a conspiracy, they are not likely to confess it, at any rate. They may be forced to confess it, Mr. Cobb. By whom? By me. We both rose. He looked me attentively in the face, with more appearance of interest than he had shown yet. I could see that I had perplexed him a little. You are very determined, he said, 
you have no doubt a personal motive for proceeding into which it is not my business to inquire if a case can be produced in the future i can only say my best assistance is at your service at the same time i must warn you as the money question always enters into the law question that i see little hope even if you ultimately established the fact of lady glyde's being alive of recovering her fortune the foreigner would probably leave the country before proceedings were commenced and sir percival's embarrassments are numerous enough and pressing enough to transfer almost any sum of money he may possess from himself to his creditors you are of course aware i stopped him at that point let me beg that we may not discuss lady clyde's affairs i said i have never known anything about them in former times and i know nothing of them now except that our fortune is lost you are right in assuming that i have personal motives for stirring in this matter i wish those motives to be always as disinterested as they are at the present moment he tried to interpose and explain i was a little heated i suppose by feeling that he had doubted me and i went on bluntly without waiting to hear him there shall be no money motive i said no idea of personal advantage in the service i mean to render to lady glyde she has been cast out as a stranger from the house in which she was born a lie which records her death has been written on her mother's tomb and there are two men alive and unpunished who are responsible for it that house shall open again to receive her in the presence of every soul who followed the false funeral to the grave that lie shall be publicly erased from the tombstone by the authority of the head of the family and those two men shall answer for their crime to me though the justice that sits in tribunals is powerless to pursue them i have given my life to that purpose and alone as i stand if god spares me i will accomplish it he drew back towards his table and said nothing his face showed plainly that he thought my delusion had got the better of my reason and that he considered it totally useless to give me any more advice we each keep our opinion mr curl i said and we must wait till the events of the future decide between us in the meantime i am much obliged to you for the attention you have given to my statement you have shown me that the legal remedy lies in every sense of the word beyond our means we cannot produce the law proof and we are not rich enough to pay the law expenses it is something gained to know that i bowed and walked to the door he called me back and gave me the letter which i had seen in place on the table by itself at the beginning of our interview this came by post a few days ago he said perhaps you will not mind delivering it pray tell miss holcombe at the same time that i sincerely regret being thus far unable to help her except by advice which will not be more welcome i am afraid to her than to you i looked at the letter while he was speaking it was addressed to miss holcombe care of messrs gilmore and curl chancery lane the handwriting was quite unknown to me on leaving the room i asked one last question do you happen to know i said if sir percival glyde is still in paris he has returned to london replied mr curl at least i heard so from his solicitor whom i met yesterday after that answer i went out on leaving the office the first precaution to be observed was to abstain from attracting attention by stopping to look about me i walked towards one of the quietest of the large squares on the north of holborn then suddenly stopped and turned round at a place where a long stretch of pavement was left behind me there were two men at the corner of the square who had stopped also and who were standing talking together after a moment's reflection i turned back so as to pass them one moved as i came near and turned the corner leading from the square into the street the other remained stationary i looked at him as i passed and instantly recognized one of the men who had watched me before i left england if i had been free to follow my own instincts i should probably have begun by speaking to the man and have ended by knocking him down but i was bound to consider consequences 
if I once place myself publicly in the wrong, I put the weapons at once into Sir Percival's hands. There was no choice but to oppose cunning by cunning. I turned into the street, down which the second man had disappeared, and passed him, waiting in the doorway. He was a stranger to me, and I was glad to make sure of his personal appearance, in case of future annoyance. Having done this, I again walked northward, till I reached the new road. There I turned aside to the west, having the men behind me all the time, and waited at a point where I knew myself to be at some distance from a cab stand, until a fast two-wheel cab empty should happen to pass me. One passed in a few minutes. I jumped in, and told the man to drive rapidly towards Hyde Park. There was no second fast cab for the spies behind me. I saw them dart across to the other side of the road, to follow me by running, until a cab or a cab stand came in their way. But I had the start of them, and when I stopped the driver and got out, they were nowhere in sight. I crossed Hyde Park, and made sure on the open ground that I was free. When I at last turned my steps homewards, it was not till many hours later, not till after dark. I found Marion waiting for me alone in the little sitting-room. She had persuaded Laura to go to rest, after first promising to show me her drawing the moment I came in. The poor little dim faint sketch, so trifling in itself, so touching in its associations, was propped up carefully on the table with two books, and was placed where the faint light of the one candle we allowed ourselves might fall on it to the best advantage. I sat down to look at the drawing, and to tell Marion in whispers what had happened. The partition which divided us from the next room was so thin that we could almost hear Laura's breathing, and we might have disturbed her if we had spoken aloud. Marion preserved her composure while I described my interview with Mr. Curl, but her face became troubled when I spoke next of the men who had followed me from the lawyer's office, and when I told her of the discovery of Sir Percival's return. "'Bad news, Walter,' she said. "'The worst news you could bring. "'Have you nothing more to tell me?' "'I have something to give you,' I replied, "'handing her the note which Mr. Curl had confided to my care. "'She looked at the address, and recognised the handwriting instantly. "'You know your correspondent?' I said. "'Too well,' she answered. "'My correspondent is Count Fosca. "'With that reply, she opened the note. Her face flushed deeply while she read it. Her eyes brightened with anger as she handed it to me to read in my turn. The note contained these lines. Impelled by honourable admiration, honourable to myself, honourable to you, I write, magnificent Marion, in the interests of your tranquillity, to say two consoling words. Fear nothing. Exercise your fine natural sense, and remain in retirement. Dear and admirable woman, invite no dangerous publicity. Resignation is sublime, adopt it. The modest repose of home is eternally fresh, enjoy it. The storms of life pass harmless over the valley of seclusion. Dwell, dear lady, in the valley. Do this, and I authorize you to fear nothing. No new calamity shall lacerate your sensibilities, sensibilities precious to me as my own. You shall not be molested. The fair companion of your retreat shall not be pursued. She has found a new asylum in your heart. Priceless asylum, I envy her, and leave her there. A one last word of affectionate warning, of paternal caution, and I turn myself away from the charm of addressing you. I close these fervent lines. Advance no farther than you have gone already. Compromise no serious interests threaten nobody. Do not, I implore you, force me into action, me, the man of action, when it is the cherished object of my ambition to be passive, to restrict the vast reach of my energies and my combinations for your sake. If you have rash friends, moderate their deplorable ardour. If Mr. Hartwright returns to England, hold no communication with him. 
I walk on a path of my own, and possible follows at my heels. On the day when Mr. Hartwright crosses that path, he is a lost man. The only signature to these lines was the initial letter F, surrounded by a circle of intricate flourishes. I threw the letter on the table, with all the contempt that I felt for it. He is trying to frighten you, a sure sign that he has frightened himself, I said. She was too genuine a woman to treat the letter as I treated it. The insolent familiarity of the language was too much for her self-control. As she looked at me across the table, her hands clenched themselves in her lap, and the old quick fiery temper flamed out again brightly in her cheeks and her eyes. Walter, she said, if ever those two men are at your mercy, and if you are obliged to spare one of them, don't let it be the Count. I will keep this letter, Marion, to help my memory when the time comes. She looked at me attentively as I put the letter away in my pocket-book. When the time comes, she repeated, can you speak of the future as if you are certain of it? Certain? after what you have heard in Mr. Curl's office, after what has happened to you to-day? I don't count the time from to-day, Marian. All I have done to-day is to ask another man to act for me. I count from to-morrow. Why from to-morrow? Because to-morrow I mean to act for myself. How? I shall go to Blackwater by the first train, and return, I hope, at night. To Blackwater? Yes, I have had time to think since I left Mr. Curl. His opinion on one point confirms my own. We must persist to the last in hunting down the date of Laura's journey, the one weak point in the conspiracy, and probably the one chance of proving that she is a living woman, centre in the discovery of that date. You mean, said Marian, the discovery that Laura did not leave Blackwater Park till after the date of her death on the doctor's certificate? Certainly. What makes you think? It might have been after. Laura can tell us nothing of the time she was in London. But the owner of the asylum told you that she was received there on the 27th of July. I doubt Count Fosco's ability to keep her in London, and to keep her insensible to all that was passing around her more than one night. In that case, she must have started on the 26th, and must have come to London one day after the date of her own death on the doctor's certificate. If we can prove that date, we prove our case against Sir Percival and the Count. Yes, yes, I see. But how is the proof to be obtained? Mrs. Mitchelson's narrative has suggested to me two ways of trying to obtain it. One of them is to question the doctor, Mr. Dawson, who must know when he resumed his attendance at Blackwater Park after Laura left the house. The other is to make inquiries at the inn to which Sir Percival drove away by himself at night. We know that his departure followed Laura's after the lapse of a few hours, and we may get at the date in that way. The attempt is at least worth making, and to-morrow I am determined it shall be made. And suppose it fails. I look at the worst now, Walter, but I will look at the best if disappointments come to try us. Suppose no one can help you at Blackwater. There are two men who can help me, and shall help me in London. Sir Percival and the Count. Innocent people may well forget the date, but they are guilty and they know it. If I fail everywhere else, I mean to force a confession out of one or both of them on my own terms. All the woman flushed up in Marian's face as I spoke. Begin with the Count, she whispered eagerly. For my sake, begin with the Count. We must begin, for Laura's sake, where there is the best chance of success, I replied. The colour faded from her face again, and she shook her head sadly. Yes, she said, you are right. It was mean and miserable of me to say that. I try to be patient, Walter, and succeed better now than I did in happier times. But I have a little of my old temper still left, and it will get the better of me when I think of the Gant. His turn will come, I said. But remember, there is no weak place in his life that we know of yet. I waited a little to let her recover her self-possession, and then spoke the decisive words. Mariam, there is a weak place we both know of in Sir Percival's life. You mean the secret? Yes, the secret. It is our only sure hold on him. 
I can force him from his position of security, I can drag him and his villainy into the face of day by no other means. Whatever the Count may have done, Sir Percival has consented to the conspiracy against Laura from another motive besides the motive of gain. You heard him tell the Count that he believed his wife knew enough to ruin him. You heard him say that he was a lost man if the secret of Anne Catherick was known. Yes, yes, I did. Well, Marion, when her other resources have failed us, I mean to know the secret. My old superstition clings to me even yet. I say again, the woman in white is a living influence in our three lives. The end is appointed, the end is drawing us on, and Anne Catherick dead in her grave points the way to it still. End of chapter 26